So hey guys welcome back to my channel today we are gonna see what if Harry never let Dudley get his letter. This is part 1. So let's begin Harry squinted as his eyes adjusted to the morning light upon exiting his cupboard. He wrinkled his nose. There was a terrible smell coming from the kitchen. The odor was coming from a large metal tub on top of the stove. Looking in, Harry saw large gray rags floating in the boiling water. What's that? He asked his aunt. Aunt Petunia nearly snarled at him like she always did when he spoke. Your new school uniforms. Looking at the tub again. Why are you cooking it? Don't be stupid, she snapped. I'm dyeing some of Dudley's clothes, and they'll look like everyone else's when I'm done. Harry didn't even bother to argue with her. They were way too big and would look wrong after being dyed. He hoped the others at Stonewall High would go easy on him for looking like he was wearing elephant skin. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came into the kitchen with wrinkled noses from the smell. Uncle Vernon sat at the table and began reading the newspaper while Dudley started swinging around his smelting stick, which he never set down since getting it. Before anyone said anything, they all heard the front door's mail slot click and the sound of paper hitting the carpet. Get the mail, Dudley, Vernon said, not looking up from his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the mail, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Dodging the stick Harry hurried into the hall where he saw a small stack of envelopes. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, a bill that Harry ignored, and, a letter for Harry. Harry looked over the letter with a rapidly beating heart. It was a thick yellow parchment with emerald ink. Harry blinked. No one, ever, in his entire life, had ever written him. Who would? He had no friends no other relatives, and the local library didn't send him mail. Mr. H. Potter the cupboard under the stairs for Privet Drive. Little whinging Surrey it was thick, likely holding a packet of information. No stamp or return information. On the back was a wax stamp with a coat of arms divided into fourths, an eagle, a lion, a badger and a snake all surrounding a letter H. Hurry up, boy. Harry turned around and went to walk back into the kitchen to give his uncle the mail. But before he did, he put the letter in his pocket. After breakfast, Dudley left with Uncle Vernon to do some shopping for supplies for smeltings and to have father-son bonding as Uncle Vernon put it. Harry was pleased to see them leave without speaking to him. Aunt Petunia, may I go to the library? Asked Harry trying to keep the trembling from his voice. Aunt Petunia's lip curled again, be back before night and not a second earlier. Most got a curfew, not Harry. For the first time in his life, Harry was glad that his relatives didn't want him around. Walking out of the house, Harry turned to look to see if Aunt Petunia was watching him, not being able to see her Harry opened his letter. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry Headmaster, Albus Dumbledore. Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Sork, CHF, Warlock. Supreme Mugwump, International Confed, of Wizards. Dear Mr. Potter, we are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment. Term begins on the 1st of September. We await your owl by no later than the 31st of July. Yours sincerely, Minerva McGonagall, Deputy Headmistress. A wizard, he was a wizard. He finally had some answers as to why such strange things happened to him. His hair growing in a single night and never longer his teacher's hair turning purple and that time he teleported to the roof of his school. Wait. They awaited his owl. Harry looked around the street for an owl, feeling foolish for thinking that there would be an owl on Privet Drive. Until he saw one sitting on the roof of the house across the street. It was small and brown, and it was staring at him as if it knew that he was going to need it. Feeling confident that the owl was for him, Harry lifted his arm and held it level as a makeshift perch. Clearly, the owl was smart as it swooped down and landed on Harry's arm and looked at him curiously. You'll take my letter to Hogwarts? The owl hooted, and Harry smiled at the small thing. He liked the owl. Then he realized that there was another couple pieces of paper in the envelope and lifted his arm, so the owl could sit on his shoulder as he looked through the packet. This one was a list of supplies he would need, uniform. First year students will require. Three sets of work robes, black. One plain pointed hat, black, for day wear one pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar. One winter cloak, black with silver fastenings, please note that all pupils clothes should carry name tags. 
Course books all students should have a copy of each of the following. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1, by Miranda Goshawk. A History of Magic by Bethilda Bagshot Magical Theory, by Adelbert Waffling A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration, by Emetic Switch 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, by Felida Spore Magical Drafts and Potions by Arsenius Jigger, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt's Commander, The Dark Forces, A Guide to Self-Protection by Quentin Trimble, Other Equipment 1 Wand 1 Cauldron, Pewter, Standard Size 2, one set of glass or crystal files one telescope one set of brass scales students may also bring if they desire an owl or a cat or a toad if a student has a familiar of a different species they are required to owl the headmistress for permission before bringing it parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks harry sighed at the long list of things that weren't sold at the local shops he would have remembered seeing wands for sale when shopping with his relatives the first thing Harry planned to do was to send his letter saying that he was attending Hogwarts. Luckily Harry had been sent to the corner store the other day by Aunt Petunia and still had the leftover money, so he made his way to the corner store to get some paper. Today was a slow day at the corner store as only one lady was behind the register flipping through a magazine. Excuse me, Harry said getting the lady's attention. Yes, young man. She looked to be twenty, and likely wished to be anywhere else. May I have a piece of paper and a pencil? Harry didn't want to spend all his money buying a packet of pens and paper to send one message. The lady rolled her eyes and gave him a blank piece of paper and a small pencil that had no eraser. Thank you, said Harry before rushing out of the store to where the owl was waiting. Harry wondered how to word a letter. He was going to write it to the headmaster but thought better of it. Based on all the titles, he was likely too busy to worry about a first year's question. Dear Minerva McGonagall, my name is Harry Potter, and I will be pleased to attend Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in September. I have only a question, where can I buy my supplies and their costs, as my relatives don't know, and I haven't any money. Yours sincerely, Harry Potter It was the first time he'd written a letter, he hoped that he didn't make a fool of himself. Rolling up the paper into a tight roll he gave it to the small owl. Please hurry, I'd like to get my things today, urged Harry. Instead of waiting for his letter in his cupboard at number 4, Harry went to the substation where he could find a map of London. He had enough money for one ticket and was going to have to find a way of returning once he left. It had been a bit longer than three hours when he heard the hoot of an owl. Folding up the map, Harry walked around the corner and held his arm up once again for the owl to stand on. Thanks, he told the small bird who hooted happily. This was a smaller letter and was in the same type of envelope with his name written on the front in a different handwriting style. Dear Mr. Potter thank you for your quick reply. For your school supplies, Diagon Alley is the hub for all magical items in England, located on Charing Cross Road, London. There will be a pub called the Leaky Cauldron. Muggles are magically made to ignore the pub so asking for direction will be tricky. For funds, Mr. Potter I suggest going to Gringotts and asking for information regarding your account. Tell them your name and they will take it from there. Looking forward to seeing you this term, Minerva McGonagall. Harry breathed a sigh of relief that the hub of magical trade was so close and bought his ticket to make his way to London. Many people gave him curious looks, Harry thought it might look odd for an 11 year old traveling to London on his own, but he didn't mind. The train arrived at his stop quickly and Harry made his way up to the street where he could find this leaky cauldron. Luckily, Charing Cross was close, so he didn't have to walk for long. The pub did stand out from its neighboring shops as it looked run down and built out of rather old wood with a creaky sign over the door depicting a boiling cauldron. Knowing that this was the right place, Harry walked in. The biggest difference of note was the lack of electricity in the pub as candlelight and lanterns were the primary source of light. There were several fireplaces also giving off light while people in robes mingled about drinking and laughing. An old man behind the bar laughed before noticing a stunned Harry looking around the pub. First year, he called out. Harry looked up at the man in surprise getting a small chuckle out of the barman. The man noticed his forehead, and his eyes widened in shock, but Harry brushed his hair in front of it quickly. Yes sir, I was told that Diagon Alley was where I could buy my supplies. The man walked from behind the desk and waved at Harry to follow. Several people eyed him curiously 
but he just rushed closer to the barkeep to avoid too much attention. Here we are, said the barkeep while standing in front of a brick wall. I haven't learned to walk through walls yet, sir. The barkeep laughed before taking out a long thin piece of wood that Harry assumed was a wand. Watch close. The barkeep tapped the wall in specific places. The bricks began to move to create an archway that gave way to Diagon Alley. A very busy street with slanted buildings and crooked streets with hundreds of wizards and witches on their daily business going in and out of shops with wrapped packages. Harry guessed that the wizarding world didn't much care for bags. Off ya go lad, the barkeep that Harry had forgotten was standing there said. Thank you again, sir. Harry walked forward and pushed his way down the street looking for a building named Gringotts. The deputy headmistress said that they would help him with his money problem. Not far from the entrance was a tall marble building with columns that were slightly crooked. Harry wondered if wizards had levelers. It was starting to bother him that nothing was neat and tidy, since he was forced to clean his relatives' home so often. Before he walked in Harry saw that on the front was a warning. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take, but do not earn, must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours. Thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Gulping, Harry walked through the large doors. The inside was a lot larger than what the building looked like on the outside. A very long entryway with tall desks lining the sides that were likely there to funnel in people or to have only one exit. Based on the warning, he assumed the latter. While the bank seemed nice the creatures behind the desks were strange. They were small, wrinkly and looked like they swallowed something sour. Harry walked up to the center desk and waited for the creature to notice him. The creature looked down at Harry and set down its writing feather. How can I help you? It sneered at Harry. Thankfully Harry was well used to being talked to like that, so he didn't give the creature a reaction. Standing straighter, my name is Harry Potter and Ah Mr. Potter followed by another sneer, please follow me. The creature hopped down and walked toward one of the doors with Harry following behind. They went down another hallway with several more creatures working diligently and, curiously, several normal people in uniforms walking the halls. In there Mr. Potter. The creature pointed to the door and ushered him inside. Inside was a nice office with weapons hanging on the walls and artifacts on the shelves. Candles lit the room and behind a very ornate desk was a well-dressed creature. It was wearing a fancy suit that looked to be made of the finest silk that Uncle Vernon could only dream of buying. Take a seat Mr. Potter it told him. I must say, most wizards of your standing usually visit with the bank every year rather than every decade, it sneered. Harry's face reflected his confusion, I wasn't aware I was a wizard until this very morning, I was only told to visit the bank to get some money to buy my school supplies. The creature grunted, but seemed to understand, or at the very least, not care enough to argue further. Very well, the creature took out a stack of paper. Mr. Potter, your current financial accounts are doing very well. You father's investments have paid off nicely. Currently the Potter vault houses 745,609 galleons and several thousand sickles and nuts. The Evans family vault. Your mother if I'm not mistaken was made into your trust and houses 5,000 galleons that will be renewed every 31st of July. Harry didn't know what a galleon was, nor sickles or nuts, but a thousand of anything was a lot so he was sure that he wasn't going to go broke any time soon. Galleon, sickles and nuts? Can you explain to me their value? The creature glared at his paper for a moment then took a breath. For muggles. Seeing the look on Harry's face it elaborated, non-magicals. 10 pounds sterling is worth 1 galleon. 1 galleon is worth 17 sickles. 1 sickle is worth 29 nuts. So, I'm sure you'll realize that your family is quite well off. Now I'm sure you want your key, so you can get your affairs in order. Harry nodded, and the creature took out another sheet of paper. All that is required is a drop of blood on the back of this blank key, and it will match to your vaults. The creature handed him a silver key with no ridges and nothing to distinguish it from any other unfinished key. Accepting the key and needle, Harry pricked his finger and let a drop fall onto the back of the key. Right before his eyes, the key started to change from the plain silver to a small but ornate golden key that had a P on handle. Now that everything is in order, I expect you to check with your accounts at the very least once a year. I will, 
sir, nodded Harry before standing up to leave. Thank you for all the help, uh. Sharp Tooth, goblin banker and manager of all ancient and noble families. Introduced the goblin finally telling Harry what they were. Walking out of the room Harry nearly bumped into an old woman in a very strange outfit. A handbag and a hat that looked to have a vulture on top of it. Harry apologized and walked back to the main hallway. He passed more goblins and several other wizards and witches that worked for the bank. Walking back to the main entryway Harry stood a bit more confidently in front of the centermost desk and the same goblin sneered down at him. All in order wizard? Making sure to stand straight and look the goblin in the eye, yes sir, I would like to open my vault. Harry raised his key and the goblin nodded. Through those doors, we're very busy today so you may have to share or wait. The goblin jabbed its figure toward the door directly behind it. Luckily, he didn't have to wait long for one of the carts, however there was another family getting in with him and they seemed to have a tour guide. The family was clearly like his relatives, muggles, and they wore nice clothes and were looking around curiously. The girl that seemed to be his age excitedly asked question after question that their guide happily answered. Harry wondered why the goblin with the family was so squeaky and nice compared to the others in the bank. Professor, is it true that there are vaults guarded by a dragon? Asked the girl while her parents behind her looked on interestedly. The small goblin chuckled, yes, it is Ms. Granger. All the high security vaults are at the very bottom. The lower the vault, the more security. Harry sat down and before anyone could say anything the goblin at the very back with its small wrinkly hands on the controls spoke up in a growling voice. I want to see keys and hear names. The girl raised a silver key to the small creature while Harry raised his own. Hermione Granger for the Granger vault, she announced with her chin raised. Harry Potter for Potter Trust vault, he said lowly still getting used to attention. The cart started to move but Harry noticed that the small cheerful goblin was looking at him with wide and excited eyes. This made the other family curious, and the girl looked to be bursting with more questions. Harry shifted uncomfortably for a moment and put the key back in his pocket. Um, can I help you, sir? He asked uncertainly. That snapped the cheerful goblin out of his daze making him chuckle happily and clap a few times. Oh no dear boy, I'm shocked is all, he said delightedly. It's so good to finally meet you Mr. Potter. He reached over and shook his hand. Harry reciprocated, quite confused. The curious girl couldn't hold it in any longer and finally voiced the question that Harry was likely thinking. How do you know Professor Flitwick? She asked Harry making him turn to her. I don't, I only learned I was a wizard today. I've been living with my muggle relatives, explained Harry to the girl making her even more confused. Seeing that they were stuck in the cart together Harry decided to introduce himself to the family. I'm Harry Potter. He raised his hand to the girl who took it happily. Hermione Granger, I'm a muggle born myself. Her parents behind her introduced themselves as Rose and Hugo, dentists and fully muggle. Where is your professor escort? I thought all muggle born were escorted by professors to introduce them to the magical world. She aimed the question toward the professor who looked at Harry with a tilt of his head. You only learned of your heritage today? He said to himself, Your aunt and uncle are very much aware of the magical world. They didn't tell you? He asked Harry. The professor turned to Hermione to answer her question, We do, Ms. Granger, but Mr. Potter here isn't a muggle born, he is a half blood if I'm not mistaken. Half blood? asked Harry. You really don't know, whispered the professor. Well, Mr. Potter, your father was a pure blood of the Potter family, a very old and prestigious family. Your mother Lily, who was my absolute favorite student, was a muggle born like Ms. Granger here. I am very excited to have you in my class Mr. Potter. Your parents were head boy and girl in their time and your mother was one of the most brilliant witches I've taught. The professor was happy and squeaky again. Harry smiled at the mention of his parents, finally hearing something about them in positive light rather than the scathing taunts of his aunt and uncle. Head boy and girl? Harry asked after a moment. Hermione spoke up seeing a chance to answer a question, that's an accolade awarded to the top male and female students right before their final year. It means they were both very accomplished. She turned to the professor expectantly. The goblin professor chuckled, quite right, adding to that we measure the students over their six years rather than just their sixth, so it is the two very best students. There was a lull in the conversation that covered accolades and school standings. Granger Vault, 
Number 257. The goblin in the back said, and the Granger family all filed out to go to their vault to see what all the pounds they gave the teller converted into. Harry and the professor watched them, and Harry felt a pang of jealousy seeing such a close family experience knowing that he'd never get one. I take it you don't know about that either? asked the professor while gesturing to his forehead. Harry touched his scar, with everything he's learned today he doubted that it was because of a drunken car crash, he shook his head in a negative. There was a war, and the man behind it you know who. I don't know who, interrupted Harry with a frown. Sorry, you know who is what we call him his name is not spoken, had a blood war over not wanting muggle-born witches and wizards to be allowed into the magical world and killed anyone in his way to purge the world of them. Explained the professor getting a frown from Harry. Mr. Potter, the professor spoke up. Ten years ago, you know who personally went to the home of his next targets. Now when he decided to kill someone, they died, especially if he personally went. He was one of the most dangerous dark lords of all time. I can expect you can guess who his targets were. My parents. The professor nodded sadly, what you likely don't know is that after he killed your parents, he turned his wand toward you. Harry didn't have any words to describe the shock he felt so he stayed silent. But when he casted the curse to kill you, something happened. No one knows what, but you didn't die, and then an explosion happened. You know who wasn't heard from again. Many think he's dead or just too weak to carry on. But that's why everyone knows your name. No one, ever, has survived the killing curse. Except you, Mr. Potter. You're the boy who lived, as I'm sure you'll hear people call you. Harry leaned back in his chair and took in some air slowly. How was he supposed to respond to that? Never, in all his life, did he expect people to care about or even notice him, much less actually be famous. Did that mean that wherever he went people were going to stare at him, at his scar? Harry already didn't like the idea of that. Not to mention the renewed grief of losing parents that weren't deadbeat drunks that actually loved him, he assumed they loved him since he was learning that everything the Dursleys told him were lies. I'm truly sorry for your loss. The small professor said noticing the grief in his eyes. I really enjoyed teaching your parents, I'm sure they would be proud that you're doing all this on your own. May I ask where your relatives are? Harry winced slightly, they and I don't get along really, so, I thought it would be better to do this on my own. Not to mention that he doubted his aunt and uncle would actually let the freak go to his freak school. Something flashed behind the professor's eyes that Harry felt was irritation but somehow knew that it was directed at his aunt Petunia. Harry looked away from the professor with a shake of his head, not sure what that was. They sat quietly while the Grangers spoke with the goblin on values of the different coins and exchange rates. Harry noticed that there was a small pile of gold coins that he assumed were galleons on the floor of the vault with silver and bronze coins stacked next to them. He assumed that those were sickles and nuts. After a few minutes the Grangers came back to the cart, Hermione sat next to him with a smile which Harry responded with a nod. The cart shot off faster this time and was noticeably diving more often as they went deeper and deeper. Harry remembered about how the larger the vault the deeper and more secure it was, knowing how much he had he was sure that he was going to be a bit further. Harry wondered what he would buy first. He needed to get several books, robes and a cauldron, among other things. He would need to buy something to store everything first. Looking down at himself Harry decided that he would need some new clothes, only problem would be his relative's reaction to his new appearance. Deciding to worry about such a thing later, Harry noticed that the cart was slowing down. Potter Trust Vault, number 687. The goblin in the back said as it hopped onto the ground with Harry following. They arrived at a large circular door with a keyhole in the middle. Harry handed his key to the goblin who unlocked the door revealing the piles of gold galleons that were nearly as tall as Harry. Thanking the fact that Dudley's clothes were so big as it would allow him to stuff the pockets full of gold, Harry began gathering coins to put in his pockets. The goblin snorted at Harry before handing him a bag that was a little larger than Harry's hand. Fill that with as much gold as you want, it's enchanted with an expansion charm. Harry thanked the goblin and put fifty galleons in the coin case then put the case in his pocket before running back over to the cart. The goblin put the cart back into gear and they were on their way back up the tracks to the surface. Professor Flitwick turned over to Harry, are you going to be alright shopping on your own, Harry? Harry nodded, I just need to know where I can get something to store all my supplies, from there I will be alright, he assured hoping to be left alone to explore on his own. 
Hermione looked put out, but a hand on her shoulder from her mother kept her from talking. If you're certain, I suggest following us to get a trunk. That was where I was going to take the Grangers here first anyway, as the easiest way to shop is getting a trunk to hold it all first, the professor said with a smile. Harry nodded with a small smile and noticed that Hermione looked more excited now that he was coming along. He guessed that it would be nice to have some company to start out. Once they reached the stopping point the Grangers, Professor, and Harry all got out and made their way out of Gringotts. Now as I said before we will be getting Ms. Granger and Mr. Potter their trunks. This is a Hogwarts as students' primary luggage during their time at school. The professor lead the group out of the bank further down the alley to a shop that had trunks in the windows and a family looking at them through the window. Inside the professor led them to the owner. It was an older man with wire glasses and an old suit that looked to have been made nearly a century ago. He perked up slightly at the group and walked around the counter toward them. Afternoon, I expect the standard, he proposed to the Grangers who nodded and were pointed toward the front. The man saw that Harry hadn't moved, something else in mind? Harry had never splurged, since he had next to nothing growing up, so now that he had money, he was going to get something nice. I want a good one that will last a long time, that has plenty of storage. The man smiled and lead him further back into the shop, he was pointed to a large trunk that was primarily dark brown and gold trimmings holding everything together. Next to it were several more with different primary colors but all had gold trimmings. This is my top of the line set. They are lined with dragon leather to hold up under even the worst of circumstances and are attuned to only open for one owner. There are several compartments, one for a wardrobe, one for equipment, and another for books that can store up to 50 books. They are priced at 30 galleons, which is a lot, but it lasts generations. Harry smiled and ran his hands over the brown and gold trunk. The security feature stood out the most as he would need to keep his things safe from Dudley as well as his aunt and uncle. I'll take it. Harry told the man while counting out thirty galleons. The shopkeeper grinned and pulled the brown and gold trunk out from the display and set it upright. I'll need your initials, HP Harry said finally done counting out the coins. Harry looked up in time to see the front of the trunk grow two gold letters. A large H and P he ran his hands over the letters happily, it was nice to have something, nice. It was a pleasure doing business with you Mr. Potter. Harry looked up surprised. Not many with those initials, I also peeked at your scar when you walked in, he said with a smile. Harry smiled and thanked the man then walked back over to the Grangers. Hermione was happily running her hand over her new trunk while talking with Professor Flitwick. Harry, are you ready to go? An excited Hermione asked. Harry looked at the group and nodded, I'm ready but I think I'll do the rest on my own. I want to get some clothes and just look around the alley for a bit. I have the whole day to kill before I have to go home. Hermione frowned, you can come with us if you want to. We don't mind. She looked up at her parents who nodded along with her and gave Harry a smile. He wanted to have company, if he were honest with himself, but he didn't want to have to wait around for them nor did he want to only go to places that the professor took them. I think I want to go at my own pace, he hoped he didn't sound ungrateful for the offer. Have a good day. Hermione smiled but Harry could tell she was a bit sad at his refusal while the older Grangers gave him understanding looks. Professor Flitwick shook his head, being independent is a good trait, but if you need help come find me. I will, sir, he said thankfully. I'll see you in September, Professor. Hermione, Mr. and Mrs. Granger, he nodded. They gave him their best wishes, and he walked down the alley with his new trunk rolling behind him. The first thing he wanted to do was buy clothes his own size. Looking down at his oversized clothes he felt foolish and was glad that the Grangers didn't ask him about it. That wasn't something he wanted to talk about. A tailor shop by the name of Timothy's Tailor Shop caught his eye. It was a run-down crooked building that looked like all the other shops in Diagon Alley. Less people were out in front of the shop than the others around it. Walking inside, trunk clunking behind him, Harry was greeted by a young woman waving a wand around to organize clothes in neat stacks. Oh. Hello. Welcome to Timothy's tailor shop. She greeted him in a peppy attitude that got a smile from him. Hello. He responded in kind. I need a new wardrobe. Harry said simply as he pointed down to his oversized clothes making her nod. I can tell. What are you in the market for? Every day, formal, or school? 
she asked while a tape measure floated around him taking his measurements and a floating feather wrote everything down on a floating notebook. Harry thought for a moment before taking out his school list. I need dragon hide gloves, work robes, and everyday clothes, like slacks and shirts and a new jacket. Also, shoes. Harry said as he looked at his falling apart trainers that looked to be as old as him. The girl only perked up more as he told her how much he planned to buy. Excellent. Well, I will help pick you out the latest styles. Don't worry, I'm a muggle born so I know what's in season. Harry was dragged towards the back and a stood in front of several mirrors as she hurried around the shop. Looking at his new outfit Harry felt some satisfaction. Perfectly sized, high quality and just as nice if not nicer than anything Dudley had, especially his boots. Not oversized and looked like dress boots that he'd seen his uncle wear to look formal, but not too formal. His trunk had all his Hogwarts clothes that the list specified, and now he would need the actual supplies. The apothecary looked like the right choice. Inside were several smells that Harry found neither pleasant nor unpleasant. The man who looked to work here was helping another man, so he decided to look at cauldrons. They had the standard pewter, silver, and gold, all different sizes and shapes. He ran his hands over the golden cauldron and considered buying it. He would certainly stand out if he showed up with the best cauldron in the shop. You are years from needing a cauldron of that caliber. A man's drawl came from behind him. Harry could feel someone watching him, turning around he saw it was the man that was speaking to the shopkeep, who was now looking at him. He was a tall man dressed completely in black and had an intense gaze that Harry looked away from. He felt a slight tingle in his head when meeting the man's eyes. Oh, I didn't realize that the cauldron's metal affected the potions. Harry told the man who seemed to anger at his words and even more when he noticed Harry's scar. Well, Mr. Potter, I expect nothing more or less than the standard pewter when you come to my class. I would also recommend that you educate yourself before school, lest you come off as an arrogant dunderhead. The man sneered but Harry ignored the hostility, he was used to it. I will professor, I'm Harry Potter by the way. He knew that the man knew who he was, but he didn't know this professor's name. The man looked at him for a moment before blinking very slowly and taking in a slow breath. Severus Snape, I will be your potions professor and I am the head of Slytherin House. He introduced himself in the same low drawl. The professor looked ready to leave, but Harry had another question. Is there a difference in files? The list gives two options, but I don't know which I should buy. A reasonable question for a professor, but Snape seemed to fight back a curse after hearing it. Another breath. Another long blink. Glass files are for those on a budget. However, crystal has a higher quality and is less likely to contaminate ingredients. If that is all Potter. Professor Snape didn't wait for Harry to respond before he, billowed, out of the shop. Harry wondered what he did to upset the man but just accepted it as what it was. Potter luck. I will gather the Hogwarts package young man. Pewter cauldron, scales and I'm assuming crystal files and the standard ingredients? Harry nodded and followed the man to the counter where he wrapped all his items. Grabbing his trunk Harry placed his hand in the center and waited for the sound of a click to signal it was unlocked. Opening it up he opened the equipment compartment and set all his new purchases inside neatly. That will be two galleons and two sickles. Harry opened his coin case and fished out the required payment. Thank you, sir. The man waved him off and walked off to a different part of the shop that Harry couldn't see. Now he needed his telescope, wand and books. Walking down the alley with a slightly heavier trunk rolling behind him Harry watched as all the wizards and witches haggled over prices. One lady was appalled that something cost five galleons and demanded it be lower to one at the most. Maybe it was his new found wealth, but Harry didn't really see the point in arguing over something like that. He would need to find out the standard wage of a job to know just where he stood on the wealth level and how much he should care about prices. Down the way Harry spotted the Grangers and Flitwick exiting a bookstore with the ever-curious girl walking with a skip as she followed the professor to a store called Madame Malkin's Robes for all occasions. Already having enough clothes Harry went toward the bookstore, Flourish and Blots. Immediately inside, he was approached by one of the workers. It was a teenage boy that couldn't be more than three years older than him. Hogwarts? Which year? I'm guessing first, the teen asked looking at him. First year, nodded Harry. Also, I want to look into some extra material. Just hold your questions, the girl earlier was, eager. 
the teen said while picking up a pre-made stack under a sign that read, First Year, Hogwarts. Harry looked over more books in the store, and he picked up Hogwarts, a history, and one on adventures and need to know spells for a journeyman. The second was a bit aged and was quite thick, but Harry wanted to know about what kind of adventures wizards went on. The teen put all his books on the counter and added them up. Standard first year, Hogwarts, a history, and Adrian's adventure guide. That will be three galleons even. How much was the first year bundle? Asked Harry still wondering about his money standing. One galleon and twelve sickles, Hogwarts, a history, brought it up to two galleons and Adrian's adventure guide was a galleon. A bit pricey for a single book but it's a rare one. Harry handed him three gold coins and put the books in his bookcase compartment and smiled at the neat stack. They weren't all out of whack like the crooked disorganized shelves of the bookstore. Thank you. Harry told the guy one more time. A wave and the teen ran off to another customer to help them. Harry rolled his slightly heavier trunk to a place he could find a telescope. A happy Harry and a full trunk made their way to his final destination. Ollivander's wand shop, which he heard was the best wand maker in Europe. Based on the signs saying that they have been in business for over a thousand years, he believed it. Inside he was met with another shop with crooked shelves and items all strung up at odd angles. Harry was really starting to wonder if that was the right way to do things rather than the muggle way of straight angles and order. Ah, Mr. Potter. I was wondering when I would see you coming into my shop. You're a spitting image of your father with your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday that they were here getting their first wands. A man Harry assumed was Ollivander said as he stood from his chair. He had wild gray hair and piercing silver eyes. You mother's wand was made of willow and unicorn hair. Swishy and rather excellent for charm work. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany and dragon heartstring wand that was perfect for transfiguration. Well, I say favored, but it is really the wand that chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. The man with his unblinking silver eyes got closer and gently parted Harry's hair to reveal his scar, making sure to never touch Harry's head. His eye dimmed at the scar. And that's where it happened. I'm sorry to say I sold that wand, he said sadly. You, thirteen and a half inches, powerful, very powerful. Had I known what it would do, the man trailed off. A flying measuring tape came over the man's shoulder. Your wand hand, he said gesturing for Harry to extend it. Before Harry could raise his arm, the door swung open and a boy Harry's age, strutted into the shop like he owned the place with his parents following behind him. They all had blonde hair, though the mother's hair was mostly black with long blonde streaks, and they held themselves with a superior air about them. The boy was Harry's age and had fine clothes, and his blonde hair was combed back perfectly. The man had long blonde hair that fell around his head framing his face and went past his shoulder blades. The man was wearing a suit and had a walking stick with a snake's head for a handle. The woman was the friendliest looking member of the family but wasn't smiling. She too, had nice clothes and had her hand on the boy's shoulder. Draco, we mustn't interrupt other people, she said with a slight glare to the boy who looked away from her. I shouldn't have to tell you such things, she said lowly but Harry still heard it. The boy glanced at him, he was likely embarrassed by his mother, who didn't even look at Harry. It was the man that looked at him. Actually, the man more stared at him. Harry felt uneasy under the intense look and felt his head tingle slightly like someone was looking through him. As soon as the sensation started, it stopped, and the man seemed to look at him with more interest which made him look at Harry's forehead. The man stepped forward and extended his gloved hand. Mr. Potter, it is a pleasure to meet you. Lucius Malfoy. His voice was deep, but it was low and intense. Harry extended his hand and ignored the intakes of breath from the mother and boy behind the man, Harry Potter. The women stepped forward next, Narcissa Malfoy, and our son Draco. Harry shook their hands and had his attention brought back to Mr. Ollivander who cleared his throat. Lucius Malfoy, Elm and Dragon Heartstring, perfect for dueling I believe. Narcissa Malfoy, Cherry and Unicorn Hair and Enchanting Wand I recall. I assume they are still working to your satisfaction. The Malfoys nodded without a word. Mr. Potter, your wand arm please. Harry raised his right hand and the floating tape measure snapped into action, measuring every bit of his body even his nostrils. Ollivander waited a moment and picked up a small piece of parchment that had his measurements on it before burning it. I will gather some potential wands. 
he vanished behind all the shelves and started to gather boxes. Are you here by yourself Potter? The boy, Draco, asked. Harry nodded, I like shopping at my own pace and choosing my things for myself. He also didn't have anyone that would want to shop with him, not family anyway. Draco snapped his head back to his mother who met his gaze with one of her own making Draco mutter to himself. I wanted to do my shopping by myself, but mother insisted she and father come, he said annoyed. Harry thought it was nice that his family wanted to come with him, he wished his did. Here we are, Ollivander said, setting down a stack of wand boxes a dozen high. Twelve inches, you and dragon heartstring. Ollivander extended the wand to Harry. Harry picked it up and gave it a test wave, causing the lamp next to Ollivander on the desk to shatter. Ollivander snatched the wand from him, no, definitely not. Not to worry it is never the first couple, he assured before handing him another wand. Nine inches, willow and phoenix feather, another no. Cherry and dragon heartstring ten and one quarter inches. Nope. After what seemed to be twenty wands later and a more and more excited Ollivander after each failure the man rushed off to the back. Draco spoke up again. I hope mine doesn't take this long, he said half accusing Harry of holding him up. Lucius placed his hand on Draco's shoulder, it will take as long as it takes. The wand that shows Mr. Potter is in the shop, it is up to Mr. Ollivander to find it. The curiosity in Mr. Malfoy's voice was clear. From there the Malfoys spoke with each other in the corner of the shop to leave Harry to his shopping. Ollivander came back with a serious face and only one box and stared into Harry's eyes with the unblinking silver that unsettled Harry. An unusual combination, holly and phoenix feather. It was a whisper, but everyone heard him speak. The grave tone getting the attention of the Malfoys. As soon as Harry held the wand, a warmth spread through his body that made him feel content. At the same time a golden light shone from the tip making Draco perk up knowing that Harry found his wand and Mr. and Mrs. Malfoy look on curiously. Harry just looked on in wonder at the feeling of magic spreading through his body. Ollivander was still serious, curious, very curious. Harry looked at him for a moment before finding his voice, I'm sorry, sir, but what's curious? Ollivander took the wand from him gently and looked it over. I remember every wand I've ever sold, every single one. It just so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather resides within this wand, gave another. Just one, he said, even more seriously making Harry gulp and the Malfoys even more interested. It is curious that you were destined for this wand, when its brother, he looked up at Harry, gave you that scar. Harry's eyes shot wide open, and he could hear the gasps from two of the three Malfoys. However, he could feel the same tingle in his brain from before likely meaning that Mr. Malfoy was glaring into the back of his head. Harry accepted the wand back from Ollivander and slid it into his jacket pocket that was made specifically for a wand. Finding his voice, well, thank you Mr. Ollivander, how much, he asked hoping to leave as soon as possible. Harry wanted out of the shop and away from the staring Malfoys, Draco seemed even more interested in Harry since he got his wand. Ollivander tossed the empty box behind him, seven galleons, all Ollivander wands are seven galleons no more no less. Harry fished out seven coins, handed them over, and quickly left the shop, not making eye contact with any of the Malfoys. He didn't want to answer questions or talk about his wand or scar. Back in the alley, Harry took a deep breath, he hoped that having a similar wand to you know who wasn't a bad thing. He made his way back to the leaky cauldron with his full trunk and brushed past anyone that was in his way. The clock in front of the animal shop said it was almost two o'clock meaning he had four hours until he could be back at his relative's home. The train ride was a little over an hour so that meant he had time to kill. Waving to the barkeep from this morning Harry took a seat at a table in the back near the fireplace. We meet again. A familiar drawl caught Harry's attention. Professor Snape looked at Harry from the dark corner drinking some kind of wine. Harry could feel a tingle, but this time it was barely noticeable, so he turned away and shook his head. Harry barely caught Snape's minuscule widening of his eyes. Are your aunt and uncle coming to get you? Harry could tell that Snape didn't really care by his tone. Harry shook his head, I'm waiting until I can take a train back, so I don't get home early. Instead of waiting for Snape to speak again Harry opened his trunk and got his new Hogwarts, a history book. It seemed like the best book to start with since he had no idea about Hogwarts. 
They sat in silence as Harry read through his book committing as much as he could to memory while Snape was enjoying the silence. After a while Harry took out his wand and another book, Standard Book of Spells. He wanted to try his hand at a spell. First one was the wand lighting charm, Lumos. Harry read the page and memorized the movement and incantation. It was the easiest spell to learn from what he could tell. A slight flick in the word, Lumos. Harry's holly and phoenix wand had a bright orb of light at the tip making Harry grin widely. He did it, he did magic. Knox, muttered Harry and the light died out, and he set his wand back down on the table. An impressive display. Snape made his presence known once again, I should tell you that you are not allowed to do magic outside of school. The ministry takes such rules very seriously. Snape stood from his chair and Harry frowned at his wand. He was hoping for something that could make the Dursleys leave him alone for the summer until he left for school. Another tingle in his head told him that he was being stared at. Professor Snape turned away from him and was about to walk away, but a cunning individual would realize that Muggles would have no way of knowing that. The professor billowed away without another word and Harry grinned back down at his wand. He could work with that. At six o'clock, Harry and his heavy truck rolled up the driveway to number four Privet Drive. Harry put his wand back in his jacket pocket with a grin on his face. He was very excited for what was about to come next. Opening the door and walking down the hallway he heard his uncle growl, the boy is back. I am back uncle, you're right, Harry said coming into the kitchen more confidently than he had ever done before. All three of the Dursleys looked at him in shock, looking between his confident posture or his new fine clothes or large trunk rolling behind him. His aunt seemed to recognize his trunk and recoiled in shock. Harry assumed that she remembered his mother buying a similar one years ago. Where did you get all that? yelled Dudley rushing over to ruin his clothes, but his mother grabbed him before he could. Uncle Vernon stood from the couch and walked over to him but made sure to stay at a distance, he was likely afraid of him now. When? his uncle asked resigned. Harry stood confidently, all his money and supplies were locked in his trunk, so he wasn't worried about his things being stolen and he had his wand and intimidation on his side. With all that in mind he answered. This morning in the mail I got my letter. I put it in my pocket and went to London on my own. How did you pay? screamed Dudley. Mummy and Daddy would never give you money. His aunt and uncle looked like they wanted to know themselves. My mom and dad made sure I was taken care of, whispered Harry, since they weren't drunks or losers, it felt good to stand up to them. I know you didn't tell me, Harry yelled at his aunt but didn't let her speak when she went to. From what I can tell, I'm stuck with you people, but you don't have to worry about me staying here out of choice. The second I have another place to go I will leave. That seemed to excite his uncle who actually cracked a smile. Right you a boy, the sooner you leave the better. I won't have any freaks in my home a second longer than necessary. Harry turned to his cupboard which was open and to Harry's shock was empty. What happened to my cupboard? You were getting too big for it and if I want to have company, I don't want to explain why you lived in our cupboard. We prepared Dudley's second bedroom. Vernon said making sure to point out that it was because of other people asking questions rather than Harry's needs. Dudley seemed upset by that, but Harry didn't care, he was on a roll already. Because normal people don't shove their nephews into the cupboard or treat them like scum. It was the first time Harry actually got angry and expressed himself. It felt great to see the wince from his aunt. I don't know what I ever did to any of you but if you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Harry pulled out his wand and muttered the Lumos spell under his breath for effect, making them huddle together terrified. It may have looked like he was about to fire a spell, but he was really only turning on a magical flashlight. If this wasn't a serious situation, Harry would have laughed. I want normal amounts of food, and I want to be left alone until I leave for school. Harry looked his aunt and uncle in the eye and made sure to point his wand at both of them. He got two shaky nods while Dudley was hiding behind his father with his eyes closed. Seeing that everything worked out, Harry ended his spell and brought his things up to his new bedroom. Dudley's second bedroom was the smallest room in the house, but it was much bigger than Harry's cupboard. It had a full-sized twin bed, a small desk and a wardrobe. Harry thought it was perfect. He closed the door behind him and made sure to lock it before sitting on his bed and laughing. This was the best day of his life. Diagon Alley, 31, July 1991. Harry set down his tea with a sigh. Today was his birthday, 
his eleventh birthday, and despite being alone in the leaky cauldron, he felt more at home than he ever did with his relatives. The past few weeks with the Dursleys were tense to say the least. He'd caught Dudley trying to break into his trunk several times. Sometimes with his smelting stick he'd whack the handle over and over until he was a huffing mess, and then he would promptly run off to whine to Aunt Petunia. The dragon leather was really paying off, nothing short of a powerful, magical curse would hurt it. Anything else Harry? asked Tom, the barkeep. Harry had learned his name on his second visit to the pub. The meal is on the house, seeing as it's your birthday, he said when Harry declined more food. Harry thanked him and left a galleon on the table as a tip. He didn't know most wizard customs, but he wanted Tom to know how much he'd appreciated his kindness and discretion. After that first day in the alley, Tom never said his name too loud, so he wouldn't get swarmed by the other patrons. Harry had already gotten swarmed once. During a trip to Gringotts to refill his coin case, he was spotted by a wizard who shouted his name. It was fortunate that the goblins broke it all up. No one wanted to deal with an angry goblin horde, so all the wizards and witches dispersed. Harry set down his book, Magical Theory, it was one of the first year books, he'd been reading through all of them in his spare time so he would not come off as an arrogant dunderhead as Snape put it. From what Magical Theory had explained, there were several avenues to casting magic successfully. The more experienced a wizard or witch was the less they needed to use. First was the incantation, then wand movement, concentration and eye contact, then finally intent. Harry had read in Adrian's adventure guide that Adrian had casted a lightning spell to shatter the shield spell of a dark wizard by only pointing his wand. Harry assumed that Adrian only used intent and concentration in that confrontation. After he wrote the story of that battle, Adrian saw fit to put the description of the spell, Fulman, in the book. It was an elemental charm that summoned lightning and fired it from the tip of the caster's wand. Harry was excited to try it, but after looking through his course books he was sure that it was a little out of his range of abilities. In charms the majority of the year would be spent on basic charms and levitation, with animation charms being taught towards the end of the year. Harry had already used the wand lighting charm so he figured that charms was a very useful branch of magic. Transfiguration caught Harry's eye. It was a large branch of magic that was highly complex and difficult to learn, much less master. One could conjure, vanish, transform, and switch things. Harry could already see the many applications of such a branch of magic. Other subjects looked interesting, but Harry thought that he would like to experience them in class before he judged, Defense against the dark arts seemed to have a bit of every subject in it and potions was a necessity to learn in Harry's mind. There were far too many things one could do with potions to not learn the subject in its entirety. Not all of Harry's time had been spent happily. Harry glared down at his notebook and quill. He'd been spending the past weeks learning to write with a quill and practicing his calligraphy. Using a pen or pencil Harry was pleased to see very elegant cursive flawlessly being weaved with each stoke of his pen. However, with a quill, Harry had finally gotten to the point where his writing was legible. Thankfully, he had another month before school. Harry refused to have such terrible handwriting. It would be his first impression when he didn't meet someone in person, and if he had learned anything from Uncle Vernon, it was that first impressions were everything. After all, Harry hated Aunt Marge since the first instant he'd met her. Diagon Alley, 21 August 1991 it was another typical day in the alley for Harry. He had explored more of Diagon Alley and had glanced in but never walked down Nocturne Alley. He often just watched people as they went about their day. Today Harry thought it was time that he got an animal companion. The list said either an owl, toad, or cat. Or if the student had a familiar, to owl the deputy headmistress for permission. Harry figured it would take some special occurrence to have a familiar of his own so he just thought to look around the animal shop in the alley. It had everything one could ask for, owls of all different breeds, many kinds of cats both of magical and mundane species, toads, and an assortment of other animals that the owner had either found or was given in an exchange. Harry didn't much care for a toad as he didn't see the point of one, so he threw that idea out. Harry was terrified of what would happen should Dudley find out he had a cat. It would likely end up dead so Harry reluctantly turned away from them. That left an owl or a familiar from the options in the school letter. Harry's eye was brought to the owls. They seemed useful and Harry would like a companion that could fend for itself. 
especially if you were to bring a pet home to the Dursleys. What's this? asked a girl to Harry's left while pointing at a large egg. The girl was slightly younger than Harry and had blonde hair and blue eyes. Next to her was a girl Harry's age and a woman, likely their mother, who looked like an older version of both girls. They were wearing expensive clothes but lacked the pure blood superiority that Harry had seen in the Malfoys. That Astoria, the woman said walking over, is an egg, likely from an owl, she said tilting her head as she looked at it, it was slightly larger than normal eggs. Daphne, have you found something? the women asked the older girl. The girl, Daphne, nodded. I have mum. She raised a black kitten with blue eyes that was pawing at her arm. Good, then we can meet your father at Florence's. She led the girls away from the owl section. Harry watched them go before looking around at all the owls. Before he could walk up to any of them, he felt a weight on his shoulder and looked up to see a white owl looking at him with far more intelligence than he expected from one. I take it you like me, girl? He asked, hoping that it was, in fact, a she. He was treated to a light nip on his ear from the owl. Harry rubbed a finger over the owl's feathers gently. She hooted happily, and Harry let a grin overtake his face. She appeared to have taken a liking to him. She's beautiful. Harry turned around to see the girl his age from earlier, Daphne. She was looking at his owl while petting her cat. Harry reached up to stroke her feathers, yeah, I think I'll call her Hedwig. He got a nip on the ear, I guess you like the name then, she hooted, and Harry smiled again. Hedwig is the guardian of orphans, if I recall correctly, explained Harry to Daphne, from what I remember from Muggle school at least. Harry's views on the world were changed since he received his letter. It wasn't his world and the magical one. He now realized that he was a wizard who lived in the Muggle world. He was pleased to be able to voice his disassociation toward Muggles. The more distance between him and the Dursleys the better. Even if he was generalizing a bit. I like the name. Daphne tentatively raised a finger to Hedwig who allowed her to brush her feathers lightly. Daphne Greengrass. She raised a hand to him. Harry took it and gave a shake, Harry Potter. Seeing that her eyes shot to his forehead he turned away. Yes, it's there, he muttered. Nice meeting you. Harry walked away quickly, ignoring the muttered curse from the girl behind him. He knew that he was being unfair. His scar was legend after all, even adults stared at it. So, it was natural that a girl his age who likely grew up hearing about him would stare. But Harry wasn't in the mood to play zoo animal. The owner of the shop saw Hedwig and walked over. She's a rare breed of snow owl. A fine choice. She'll run you six galleons. For an extra two I'll give you a cage and treats. Harry fished out the payment and picked up a cage. Thank you, sir. Back on the alley street. Harry made his way back to the leaky cauldron. He had some time to kill, so he went back to reading Adrian's adventure guide. It was the only book he hadn't read completely. He was reluctant to put Hedwig in her cage but was forced to buy the rules of the tavern. Tom brought over some food, and Harry relaxed in his corner with his book. After reading about the lightning spell, Harry was really interested in what else was in this treasure trove of knowledge. A journey to North America by Adrian in his youth, told of the time the adventurer met a thunderbird and witnessed its powers of storm calling. It led to his creation of tempestas, a conjuration spell that created black storm clouds that led to a strong downpour then finished with a powerful thunderbolt. It was a deadly spell under the best of circumstances and widespread cataclysm at worst. Adrian then followed up the description with a warning of the control required, stating that if one isn't capable of solely intent conjuration, then to not attempt it. It was a NEWT level feat that Harry ambitiously hoped to be able to accomplish in a couple years. For now, Harry was going to focus on being able to do the very basics of transfiguration flawlessly before he considered trying it. In a free for all with a troll and a noondu, Adrian employed a particularly nasty curse, Conchurpi. The description said that it was only effective against dark creatures and could affect the spell resistant hides of most dark creatures, making it a necessity for all adventurers or lone travelers. This spell, luckily, was one of the more straightforward spells in the guide. It was a slight curve then jab wand movement followed by the incantation with the intent to defeat one's foe. From the book, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Anundu was a XXXXX beast, not only because of its hostility but its lethality, and they were nearly as hard to put down as a dragon. Harry memorized everything about the spell. 
Anything that could harm beasts that magically resisted most spells was something that he would need to remember. King's Cross Station, 1. September 1991 Today's the day thought Harry as he pulled his full trunk behind him. Hedwig had already taken to the sky earlier in the morning to find her breakfast and would meet up with him on the train. Harry knew that owls were intelligent, especially magically raised owls, but Harry felt that his Hedwig was a cut above the rest, capable of understanding him perfectly. He promised her some treats and to leave the compartment window open so that she could come to him during his journey. Harry pulled out the final piece of paper that was given to him in his Hogwarts letter. The train ticket. Neatly printed at the top of the ticket was the platform noted as nine and three quarters. If it weren't for reading Hogwarts, a history, he was sure that he would have never found out that he had to run through a brick wall. As he got closer to the platform, he saw several other wizards and witches all pulling their own trunks. At least now he knew for sure that he was going in the right direction. Muggles. Harry heard a woman yell from behind him. She was a redhead and was quite plump and was wearing handmade clothes. She was leading a group of redheads behind her and to her left was a man that was slightly plump himself and had red hair as well. Several boys ranging from several years older to Harry's age followed their parents to the wall. Next to the women Harry noticed that there was a young girl that was crying silently, he guessed she was upset that she didn't get to leave with her brothers. Every year this place is always packed with them. This way, platform nine and three quarters, she kept calling out loudly. Harry looked around worriedly. He was under the impression that the Statue of Secrecy meant that one shouldn't yell such strange things around muggles. Seeing that no one, magical or otherwise, was correcting her Harry shrugged it off. If she got into trouble that was her own business, he turned around and ran through the platform. On the other side he was greeted to the sight of the magnificent Hogwarts Express. It was a large red steam engine with the Hogwarts coat of arms on the front, just as it was in his letter. Walking forward Harry noticed that the Malfoy family was saying their goodbyes and close by was the Greengrass family that Harry met in the animal shop was doing the same. Unfortunately, Harry heard his name being called and looked up to see the youngest Malfoy wave him over. Cursing in his head, Harry walked over with his heavy trunk rolling behind him. Potter. Draco called him over getting looks from a lot of the other families around them. Harry noticed this and glared at Draco as he rushed over to him. Don't yell my name, growled Harry. I don't feel like being on display right now. Call me Harry in public. It's less recognizable and common. Harry had learned of his absurd levels of fame in his research into himself in his time in the alley. Despite not being in the magical world until he received his letter, the magical world certainly hadn't forgotten Harry. In 1981 and 1982, there was an influx in babies named Harry or some slight variation. So, if he was to be addressed in public, he'd rather it be Harry than Potter. After all, there was only one Potter. Lucius gave his son a tap with his walking stick. He is right Draco. A good wizard knows when to be discreet. Sorry, Draco muttered unapologetically. Harry didn't particularly care nor wish to continue the conversation, so he gave him a fake smile and left them to continue toward the train. A slight wave from Daphne made the smile a bit less fake but he continued forward and climbed aboard the train. Finding a compartment to himself, Harry lifted his trunk and put it in the overhead compartment. Harry took out his personal journal and Adrian's guide and continued to read in silence while noting anything he thought useful. It was becoming a habit for Harry to make notes in a personal notebook on interesting spells and notes on any subject he deemed noteworthy. He did that with all the course books that he'd read. He included the different types of dark beasts and spells that could be used against them or useful potions and potential alterations. Harry had made many trips to flourish and blots since coming to the magical world to increase his personal library and to gain a basic understanding of all magical subjects. He wasn't an expert in anything yet, but Snape's words kept appearing in his head. He wasn't going to come off as a dunderhead if he could help it. He already had a name that was known by most of the world, so he was going to make sure that he didn't sully it. Ancient runes stood out as a fascinating subject, but he would need a runic dictionary, and if he were honest, a teacher. They were far too complex with thousands of different potential combinations for self-study without a teacher for the basics. He knew that he was going to take that subject when it was offered. Like potions, Harry felt like it would be too useful of a subject to not take it. Harry felt the train lurch, and they started to leave the station, before he could forget, Harry opened his compartment window so that Hedwig could enter when she found the train. 
Time flew by without Harry noticing as he kept reading and writing in his journal. A sudden knock on the compartment door brought him from his thoughts. It was a boy in his first year like Harry but was a bit skinnier and a bit taller than Harry. He had dark hair and eyes and looked a bit skittish. Can I sit in here? Draco and his two friends were acting a bit childish in my compartment, he said quietly as he waited for Harry to give him permission. Harry looked him over one more time before gesturing for the seat across from him. Theodore not, he said. Harry took the raised hand and shook it tightly. Another thing he learned from his uncle was that one could learn a lot about a person from a handshake. Theodore was a shy person but had a strength about him that Harry recognized from the steady tightness of his grip. Harry Potter. He was pleased to see Theodore's only reaction was a slight widening of his eyes. I heard Malfoy say you were on the train, but I wasn't sure he was telling the truth. Theodore looked pleased to be speaking with him and his posture was becoming less and less timid. Harry rolled his eyes. Malfoy nearly caused me to be swarmed on the platform earlier by calling out my name like some fan, he grunted, getting a snort from Theodore who looked appalled at himself for the lack of decorum. Harry chuckled at that. Relax, I'm guessing that you're a pureblood. At Theodore's nod he continued, I won't tell anyone of your brief lapse in social decorum. Harry turned up his nose while speaking and managed to get another laugh from Knott. My grandmother raised me, she was very, Theodore winced, likely looking for a word, strict when it came to manners and appearances. Apparently, she was very disappointed by my father. Harry looked Theodore over once more, he was returning to his shy demeanor and was starting to slouch again. I take it your father wasn't a popular man? asked Harry, if he was assuming correctly. A pureblood like Theodore could only have an unpopular father if he was a follower of a certain man or married a muggle-born. Theodore growled and shook his head, he was a dark man. He snarled, he nearly killed my mother when she was unable to have another child. It was only thanks to my grandmother that my mother and I escaped him, he would have done anything for the Dark Lord. Harry took in a breath. He needed to tread carefully. Theodore could be an ally or a foe depending on how he worded his next sentence but Harry already had an idea on Theodore's feelings toward his father. I don't think you'll be like him, assured Harry smoothly. You seem to be nice and not as uptight as the Malfoys. Not grinned and Harry smirked. Yeah, I plan to return the not name to glory, he promised with a hint of something behind his eyes. I think you can do it, stated Harry. All you need to do is stand out as an upstanding person and people will associate the not name with you rather than him. Not relaxed again and had a small smile on his face. Thanks Harry. Harry nodded pleased with himself, he had made an ally of sorts before even entering the castle and a powerful one at that. Despite his general ignorance to most things in the magical world which he had been trying to rectify he had learned of most of the powerful families in Britain. The Not family was up there. They were not quite as wealthy as the Malfoys but certainly wealthy enough, and they had a seat on the Wizengamot. The Potters had sat on the Wizengamot in the past but gave up their seat during Grindelwald's war to focus on fighting. Harry would need to have a lot of political clout and be over the age of 30 to be considered for a seat which meant it was too far off to start thinking politics, however, having a friend who was the next head of a powerful family wasn't something he would push away. That was also why he kept things cordial with the Malfoys. They were very wealthy and had their hands in many important dealings. From what he learned, Lucius had been a Death Eater, and with enough power and money was able to buy his freedom from Azkaban. Harry's brief interaction with Lucius Malfoy on the platform cast some doubt on his imperious excuse. A man like that didn't seem easily swayed with magic. So, do you like Quidditch? Theodore asked with a grin getting Harry's attention. Harry and Theodore talked a lot over the several hours of the train ride and had changed into their robes once the conductor announced that they were near Hogsmeade where they would get off the train. They mainly discussed Quidditch, and Harry found himself very interested in learning more about the sport and possibly playing it. He always wanted to play football in school, but Dudley made it impossible for others to include him in their games. He wasn't going to let anyone dictate what he could or couldn't do anymore. Harry looked out into the night sky wondering where Hedwig was. She was supposed to come to the train but hadn't showed up. He knew that she could hunt on her own and was highly intelligent, so he wasn't too worried, but if he didn't see her tomorrow, he was going to start to panic. She was his first real friend after all. Harry filed out of the train with Theodore on his heels and several other first years close by. First years, called a very loud and deep voice, 
first years follow me, the voice called again. Finally clearing from the wave of students, Harry's eyes looked up to see the largest man he's ever come across. He was easily ten feet tall and had long bushy hair and a beard nearly as long as Harry was tall. He wore ragged robes likely fashioned to barely fit his large stature. Follow me, he called and started to lead all the first years away. Harry jogged up to the man whose large steps made it difficult to keep up. I'm Harry Potter, sir, nice to meet you. Introduced Harry when he managed to catch up to the giant man who looked down at him surprised. Harry. He boomed getting a wince out of Harry who was too close to the man. Rubius Hagrid, at her service, the keeper of keys and grounds at Hogwarts. Harry could hear the pride in his voice as he spoke, and it made him crack a smile at the man. He was worried that Hagrid would be aggressive like he'd read giants were, but thankfully he wasn't. I haven't seen Ya since Ya were a baby, he said with a large grin as he looked down at Harry. Good ta finally see Ya again. Let's get to the boats. Harry nodded and fell back to where Theodore was walking who gave him a curious look. I had to introduce myself, explained Harry with a shrug. He is without a doubt the largest man I've ever met. I suspect like Professor Flitwick he's got an interesting lineage, Harry said lightly. He's a half-giant, explained Theodore, my grandmother had been on the board of governors for decades, they had to agree to allow Hagrid to be a member of staff after he was expelled, that was close to fifty years ago. Harry looked back at the half-giant appraising L.Y., what could he have done to be expelled? Was it his actions or was it bigotry? He would find out later. Only four to a boat, called Hagrid. Harry hopped in a boat with Theodore right behind him. A girl followed behind them, she was a springy girl with short black hair and a large grin on her face as she looked around. Behind her was a girl that Harry recognized, Daphne Greengrass. Hello. I'm Tracy Davis, the first girl introduced, this is Daphne. Harry reached out and took Tracy's hand and gave a gentle squeeze, Harry Potter. He looked at Daphne and gave her a nod. Tracy beamed and shook Theodore's hand who introduced himself quietly. Harry assumed that Theodore had only gotten comfortable with him rather than all social interactions. Daphne followed suit before turning to Harry, I'm sorry about that day in Diagon Alley I. It's all right, I wasn't fair to you, interrupted Harry. I was still getting used to my fame and wasn't reacting well to people just looking up at my forehead for my scar. Harry raised a hand to her, start over, I'm Harry Potter. Understanding the gesture, she sat up straighter and took his hand, Daphne Greengrass. They gave each other small smiles before Trassus' gasp made them turn. Hogwarts Castle had come into view. It was a massive castle that sat on the edge of a cliff with three gigantic towers that nearly touched the clouds. Wow, whispered Harry while looking up at the moonlit castle. Watch her heads, called Hagrid from the front as they entered the waterway under the castle. Harry and the other students ducked under the stones and were pulled to the indoor docks where they got off the boats and gathered at the bottom of the stairs. Hagrid took them to wait for more instruction. Harry looked back at the small dock entrance to see that a shimmering wall of translucent magic was extending down from the stone creating an invisible gate over the opening. Harry had read in Hogwarts, a history that the school boasted many wards for protection. This was likely what was mentioned. Up the stairs you lot, Hagrid said pointing to the large staircase that looked to be ten people wide. The students climbed up and were greeted at the top by a witch in green robes who was carrying a large roll of parchment. She had a large hat on and was looking at all the students sternly. Her eyes lingered on him for only a moment longer than everyone else, and Harry felt grateful that she wasn't going to make a scene over him. Greetings, she said and instantly everyone quieted down, she had a tone of authority that commanded respect and attention. I am Professor McGonagall, your transfiguration professor and head of Gryffindor House. Through those doors is the Great Hall. The rest of the school is already seated. You will follow me to the front where you will be sorted into your houses. There are Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff and Slytherin. Each is named after one of the four founders and it is an honor to be in any of them. Now if you will follow me. She turned to the large doors that opened automatically and she led the group into the great hall where all the other students were looking at them. On the center left was a house of blue and on the right was a house of red, Ravenclaw and Gryffindor respectfully. Far left was a house of green and far right was a house of yellow, Slytherin and Hufflepuff. 
Above them were thousands of floating candles and several ghosts watching them walk toward the front. Getting to the front of the hall Harry looked up at the high table. In the center chair was the headmaster, Albus Dumbledore. He was an old wizard with long white hair and a very long beard that fell to his belt. He wore very colorful robes that seemed to sparkle in the light as he looked at all the incoming students happily. All the other professors were watching them with various levels of interest. Harry found it amusing that Snape was the least interested of the staff. Harry wondered if the man hated teaching or was just hungry and wanted to get through the ceremony. Professor McGonagall walked up the two steps and stood next to a stool with a large leather hat that perked up once the hall quieted down. A mouth opened on the hat and of all things, it began to sing. Oh you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black, your top hats sleek and tall. For I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat and I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor, where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring, nerve, and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw, if you've a ready mind. Where those of wit and learning, will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin you'll make your real friends. Those cunning folks use any means to achieve their ends. So put me on, don't be afraid, and don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cap. Everyone in the hall burst into applause and Harry himself clapped a few times while thinking about the descriptions for each house. He could see himself in all of them if he were honest. He certainly grew up to be cunning in the Dursley house, having to steal his food and sneak around. He was definitely hardworking, having practiced his writing all summer and always toiling away the Dursley's garden. He was quite studious having read through most of all his books already, and in his opinion, he certainly had nerve. When I call your name, take a seat and place the hat on your head. Once the hat calls out the name of your house, take the hat off, set it on the stool, and join your house. Again, Professor McGonagall had the ability to quiet a room with only slightly loud words. Abbott, Hannah. As each student had their house called out, that house would cheer loudly at their new addition while the rest of the houses clapped lightly. Hermione's name was called, and she eagerly rushed up to the stool. Unlike most before her, there was a long pause. The staff and most of the hall quieted and after a moment a roar of Ravenclaw was heard and the table in blue roared their approval. Harry thought it would have been a travesty if she were sorted anywhere else, she was far too eager to learn for any of the other houses. Malfoy went, and Harry was surprised that he was sent to Slytherin, he didn't take the spoiled boy for a cunning individual. Draco Malfoy seemed like more of a ponce than anything else. Theodore followed him to Slytherin shortly afterwards. Soon after that, it was finally time. Potter, Harry. As Harry expected a hush fell over the hall, and even some of the staff leaned forward interested. Harry took a seat and threw the hat over his head allowing Black to fill his vision. Interesting, very interesting, a voice, the sorting hat Harry assumed, whispered into his head. Quite right, I am the sorting hat and it is my job to read one's thoughts to judge their character and find the house to which they are suited. You, Mr. Potter as you guessed earlier, are quite well suited to all of them. So, I'm going to look a little deeper. Harry clenched his eyes tight and felt a buzz in his head, similar to when Snape and Lucius stared at him. Now he finally had an explanation, they were looking into his mind. Correct you are, Mr. Potter I was enchanted with the mind arts to read students' minds to sort them. No matter. I know just where to put you now. Slytherin. Harry knew that this time it wasn't in his head but a roar from the cap and he could hear a thunderous applause from the House of Green. Taking off the hat he was treated to shocked looks from the Gryffindor table, and the light applause of Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff who were looking at him with curiosity. Setting down the hat, he made his way to the table on the far left and was greeted by many handshakes and a lot of names that he couldn't understand. He managed to push his way to an open spot and sat next to Theodore. Didn't expect you to be in Slytherin. I was guessing Gryffindor. Theodore said and many of the others nodded with him. Harry shrugged, the hat didn't know where to put me, so it went deeper into my head. Guess I'm a Slytherin at heart. Harry was quite pleased to be honest, in his research of each of the house's history, all boasted very famous and talented wizards. 
but Slytherin held one whose name is known throughout the world and spoken of reverently, Merlin. Apparently, Merlin attended the school close to its opening and was sorted into Slytherin House and was likely taught by Salazar Slytherin himself. The dates matched up well enough to assume as much at least. Unfortunately, nowadays Slytherin had more notoriety and there was one infamous wizard associated with Slytherin, Voldemort, and Harry planned to change that. Once the last student, Blaise Zabini, was sorted into Slytherin and seated, Dumbledore stood from his chair. Welcome, he began. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our feast, I'd like to say a few words and here they are. Nitwit, Blubber, Oddment, Tweak. Thank you. Dumbledore took his seat and Harry saw that none of the staff were surprised or concerned by the headmaster's apparent stroke. Why else would he say nonsensical words, after all? That was weird to you all too, right? asked Harry or am I the crazy one? The students near him chuckled a bit and Draco spoke up. My father says that Dumbledore is completely insane and should have retired years ago. Age is likely catching up to him. He's got to be a century and a half at least. Harry didn't care for the clearly biased opinion parroted by Draco, so he looked around to see others shrug and many of the older Slytherins rolling their eyes. They were likely used to the headmaster's eccentricities. He's one of the greatest wizards of all time, said Theodore next to him. My grandmother said that his duel with Grindelwald cracked the very earth under the weight of their power. An older Slytherin girl nodded, that duel is legendary, it got him his order of Merlin first class. Estella Graves she introduced, I'm a fifth-year prefect, at some other part of the table is Jackson Marlowe the other fifth-year prefect. Any questions you have you need only ask. Are first years allowed to try out for Quidditch? asked Tracy hopefully. No first year has made a house Quidditch team in decades, Estella said with a shake of her head. Not being able to bring a good broom makes it nearly impossible to make the team. Such a rubbish rule, growled Malfoy. I'll have to see if my father can petition to have it removed. It would be a travesty if my skills in the air were diminished because of the school's brooms. Harry clicked his tongue, Malfoy sure liked to brag. It likely makes sure that a first year isn't killed. Theodore said quietly, not many 11-year-old students can take a bludger to the head and walk away. Others agreed and Harry himself could see the point in that, he didn't want his head to be smashed open by a flying bowling ball either. Harry looked further down the Slytherin table to see some of the older students whispering and occasionally looking at him. They hid their feelings well, but Harry could tell they weren't sure about him being in their house. Harry made it a point to prove himself to all of them. He didn't want the next seven years to be filled with doubts from his own house after all. After everyone had their fill, Dumbledore stood from his chair again, and this time walked around the head table and stood behind a podium with a golden owl on the front. Now that we're all fed and watered just a few more words. First years should note that the forest on the grounds is forbidden to all students. A few of the older students should do well to remember that, as well. Dumbledore's eye drifted to two grinning redheads at the Gryffindor table. I have also been asked by Mr. Filch, our caretaker, to remind everyone that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of term and all those interested will need to meet with Madame Hooch. Finally, I must warn you all that the third floor corridor on the right hand side is strictly off limits to all those who do not wish to die a very painful death. Harry was one of the very few who chuckled. He's not serious, he asked Estella. Has to be, she said with a frown. He usually gives a reason for restrictions though it must be a real big secret if he didn't even tell the prefects. And now finally, we must sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. Harry saw that all the staff's expressions became wooden and Snape particularly looked to be in physical pain. Dumbledore waved his wand and created a golden ribbon that contorted into the words. Everyone pick your favorite tune, said Dumbledore, off we go. The school bellowed, Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Warty Hogwarts. Teach us something please, whether we be old and bald, or young with scabby knees, our heads could do with filling. With some interesting stuff, for now they're bare and full of air. Dead flies and bits of fluff, so teach us things worth knowing. Bring back what we've forgot, just do your best, we'll do the rest. And learn until our brains all rot. Harry felt he had just witnessed the most incoordinated choir in history.
Everyone finished at different times and the song was pulled to a crawl by the two grinning redheads chanting a slow funeral march tune. After the agonizing pace finished Dumbledore wiped a tear from his eye, although Harry wasn't sure whether from happiness or pain. Ah, music, he said wistfully. Magic beyond comprehension. And now, bedtime, off you trot. Harry and the rest of the hall stood, and he heard several people commenting on the headmaster's sanity once again. He and the other first years followed Estella, who led them to Jackson Marlowe, the other prefect. Tired and full of food they were led down staircases and by talking portraits and through corridors. The prefects took them through several passages shooting off from the main corridors that Harry tried to commit to memory, but he was starting to tire too much to think. Finally, they got to a long stone wall in the dungeons where the prefects stopped. This is the entrance to the Slytherin common room the entrance is protected by a password which changes only once a year unless someone outside of the house learns it. Professor Snape will address the house should it change. This year it is Viper. As Estella said the word, the stone wall slid to the side, and an opening was created with stairs leading down into the common room. The hallway opened into a large room with tables and couches, and at the center of the room was a large fireplace with the Slytherin emblem over it. The roof of the common room had ornate glass windows that allowed the green light of the Black Lake to shine into the room giving the place an emerald glow. Jackson stepped in front of the group of first years, the house is separated into two sections, the boys' dorms are down on the left and the girls' on the right. Each room has room for three students so choose your bunkmates. Theodore nodded to him and Blaise Zabini walked over. I'm Blaise Zabini, he said smoothly, if your room has an opening, I'd like to apply for it. Harry knew this was a different offer than the one Theodore extended him, not friendship but a potential ally. Blaze wasn't shy or unconfident. He wanted to get close to him. Harry knew he'd have to watch him closely to figure him out before opening up to him even a little. Harry Potter and of course you can. Harry said pleasantly, how do you feel about Quidditch? Theodore was a near fanatic and that gave Harry an easy topic to go to if Blaze felt similar. Harry wasn't disappointed by the grin that overcame Blaze's face as he clearly was a fan. Holy head harpies for life, he said dreamily, a team of beautiful women playing my favorite sport. Harry nodded and led the other two to their room. It was like the common room. It had a fireplace and was primarily green. Three beds and a couple chairs close to the fire and a full bathroom. Not bad, Blaze said as he walked over to the bed that had his trunk in front of it. Harry walked over to his bed and began to change out of his robes and into a pair of sweats and a t-shirt. After changing, he got into his bead. He was going to ask the others if they had any snacks in their trunks but instantly feel asleep. He only woke once, at midnight, thinking about what Hedwig was doing and where she was. Harry was the first to wake, he could hear the soft snores of his two new roommates and got up from his bed and went to take a shower and change into his robes. After getting clean and dressed Harry met Theodore and Blaze in the common room who had already gotten dressed and showered the night before. The common room already had a few older students reading over their course books and talking quietly with one another. You two want to have a look around the castle? Asked Harry hoping to get a mental layout of the castle before classes started. Sure. Yes. After leaving the common room Harry found that he was the center of attention of most of the students they came across. They whispered and pointed and came up to him to shake his hand and asked why he was sorted into Slytherin. He decided to go with the safe answer of having a lot of ambition to succeed. It was well received and both Theodore and Blaze nodded with his answer likely thinking the same thing about themselves. Hogwarts itself was tricky place to navigate, there were 142 staircases, wide sweeping ones, thin and rickety ones, some that were inconsistent in their destination and others that vanished. Some of the doors didn't open without asking nicely, or tickled them in the right place, and some doors that weren't doors but walls pretending. Harry found that it was difficult to remember where everything was, because a lot of it moved around as it pleased. The ghosts weren't much help either, the bloody baron would point you in the right direction if you managed to get his attention. While the Ravenclaw ghost would ignore any and all Slytherins if she could help it. Peeves was perhaps the worst entity that Harry had ever met, aggravating and all way too happy to ruin anyone's day. The poltergeist had already made an enemy of Harry when it tried to drop a bucket of water on him seconds after leaving the Slytherin common room. Argus Filch, the caretaker, was a demented individual who worked to take care of a school but hated children and would reminisce about medieval torture methods in front of students. Filch had something against Harry already, 
he had heard the man muttering that a return of a potter being a disaster. Harry assumed the man was more against his father for his time in school rather than being a potential Death Eater. Then was his cat, Mrs. Norris, who, Harry found, was in dire need of a good kick. She would stalk students, try to trip them in the halls and lead Filch to anyone engaging in activities that Filch could punish. Harry and his two roommates made it to the Great Hall where the four heads of houses were handing out timetables to all the students. His reunion with Snape raised a few eyebrows. Ah, Mr. Potter. The sheer loathing in his sentence was felt by the Hufflepuffs on the other side of the hall. I do hope you enjoy your time in Salazar's noble house. Harry felt that Snape was about to keel over if he had to continue speaking with him, so Harry started asking questions about the classes. They're where they are, Snape said when asked about their location. Harry soon found out that Snape was the most stubborn individual he had met in Hogwarts. He was obligated to speak to someone in his own house but had no inclination to assist Harry in any way whatsoever. Harry's first day of class was charms then transfiguration and the day ended with history of magic. A class that the older students warned them about, saying that it was the biggest waste of time the school offered. First day of charms Professor Flitwick gave his introduction. Charms has many uses, he said squeakily, while not having several branches like transfiguration, you won't find a subject that has as many practical uses in everyday life and in combat should the need arise. Charms can range from sorting clothes to forcing creatures such as Dementors to flee from you. Their first day in class they were given the overview of the year and asked if any of them could do any of the spells in either the standard book of spells, grade 1, or any charm that they might happen to know. Few students raised their hand, Harry, Hermione, Daphne and Crab of all people. Harry showed his ability with the levitation charm much to Professor Flitwick's happiness who awarded him five points. Hermione huffed and used a color-changing charm on her quill, she had also been given five points as that was the spell they were going to go over today. Daphne followed sweet with the color-changing charm and Crab's spell, to no one's surprise, failed to work. Theodore and Blaze themselves worked all through class to manage the color-changing charm and taking notes from Professor Flitwick in the book. Harry read his book and made notes both in his private journal and on the sides of the page in case he had to come back over anything. Malfoy was off to the side both happy that a Slytherin, Harry, had been the most impressive in the earlier display and angry that Hermione was so talented. Harry knew that he was likely a bigot, but he didn't expect him to be so blatant about it. If it got out of hand, he would confront Malfoy in the common room but for now he would let the muggle saying about sticks and stones take the lead. Daphne and Tracy were talking with one another as class went by and more times than not, they would include him in their conversation. Harry wasn't sure if they wanted to be his friend or if they just didn't want to be around Malfoy who was on the other side of the class from them. Now I want everyone to read over the next chapter of your books to prepare for our next class. Announced Professor Flitwick at the end. All of you who didn't manage the spell I expect you to be able to cast it at the beginning of next class, dismissed. Harry and the other Slytherins made their way out of the class and started to head toward Transfiguration. Harry. He heard someone call. Harry turned to see that it was Hermione rushing over to speak with him. He told Theodore and Blaze he would meet them in class, and they went ahead. They did linger to look over Hermione as she got closer but then went to catch up with the other Slytherins. Harry would need to see about their feelings toward blood purity, it would be the next thing he worked on when he got back to the common room. Hey Hermione, he greeted. How was the rest of your summer? Hermione smiled, it was fine. I read through all of our course books making sure that I was ready. There was a challenging tint to her tone that made him smirk. Me too. Harry suppressed a grin at her huff. I didn't have much else to do to be honest. I will say that I wasn't surprised that you were sorted into Ravenclaw. Oh yeah, she started. The hat wasn't sure whether to put me in Ravenclaw or Gryffindor. It settled on Ravenclaw when it saw how well I got on with Professor Flitwick when he took my parents and I to Diagon Alley. Harry nodded, same with me, the hat said I would have worked in all of the houses, but decided on Slytherin, I was quite the sneaky child. He whispered with a smirk. A lot of the Ravenclaws were talking about you last night, she told him in a hushed voice. Some of them were thinking that you might be interested in dark magic. Some were even thinking that you already had training in the dark arts. That was something that he expected to happen but actually hearing about it from Hermione managed to make Harry quite irritated. 
What was with Slytherin's reputation that just entering the House of Green made people think that you were a Dark Lord in training? Great, he cursed. That's exactly what I need, if you hear anything else please tell me Hermione. She nodded quickly and looked to have a question in her eye that made Harry groan silently. No, Hermione, I do not have training in the dark arts. He drawled. I don't know what people think Slytherins do in their spare time, but it isn't dark rituals or study sessions on the unforgivables. Hermione blushed. I know that she snapped likely embarrassed that she did, in fact, think that. It's just, well, I was curious about what went on in Slytherin House is all. Of all four it has the worst reputation. Something I'm going to fix, Harry said forcefully, I don't like how people think of Slytherin House, I am proud to be a part of it actually. I'm sure that no one wants to remember but Merlin himself, yes that one, was in Slytherin. Hermione recoiled in shock and Harry felt pleased that he had surely just shattered her view of Slytherin. Harry realized that he was running out of time to get all the way to the Transfiguration classroom. We need to get to class, I'll catch up with you soon Hermione. Bye Harry she said as she rushed off to her own class. Harry turned to start making his way to Transfiguration but nearly ran into Dumbledore who was smiling down at him with sparkling eyes. Harry wondered what spell he was using he was using to do that but shook that thought from his head. I think most forget Slytherin's past. Dumbledore commented lightly, I find that many can't see past the most recent event in history. For most, coming to their own conclusion on difficult matters is far too strenuous. The headmaster looked up from Harry and stepped aside. You wouldn't want to be late for class dear boy, off you trot. Harry laughed at the headmaster and started to hurry toward his class, as he rushed off, he only just managed to hear Dumbledore give Slytherin five points. It seemed that the headmaster was concerned with Slytherin's image himself. Climbing one of the many changing staircases Harry finally came within sight of the Transfiguration classroom and only just got into class at exactly ten o'clock. He was on time by the skin of his teeth. Thankfully Professor McGonagall wasn't in class, so it didn't matter much anyway. Harry took a seat toward the middle of the class next to Pansy Parkinson, a Slytherin first year that he hadn't had many words with yet. She seemed nice enough, but her face had a scowl on it as he took the seat next to her, obviously she didn't find him the ideal person to sit next to. No matter, he wouldn't do it again anyway. Looking around the classroom he spotted a cat sitting on top the professor's desk and wondered if it was McGonagall's pet or familiar. It was strange that she wasn't here, yet it was two minutes past ten already and Harry didn't think that Professor McGonagall was the type of person to be late. She seemed to be quite the stickler for the rules. The classroom doors swung open to reveal Ron Weasley followed by a dark-skinned boy who had burst into the class breathing haggardly as they hurried to their seats. Thank goodness she wasn't here said Ron as they walked to an empty table, I'd hate to see her angry. The boy with him nodded but before they could take their seats the cat sitting atop the table jumped and midair it morphed into Professor McGonagall. Harry's eyebrows hit his hairline at the magical feet, he'd never heard of such a thing. Mr. Weasley, Mr. Thomas, I trust you can find your seats in the appropriate amount of time, she said tersely, lips thin in frustration. Sorry Professor we couldn't find the classroom. Weasley said trying to explain his situation. Then perhaps a map. McGonagall brushed off, clearly not impressed with the excuse. Harry wanted to point out that everyone else in the room found their way here but didn't want Professor McGonagall bearing down on him for speaking out of turn. Now, Professor McGonagall said walking back to the center of the class. She waved her wand toward the empty desk next to her and transfigured it into a flock of doves that flew around the room. Transfiguration is the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn during your time in Hogwarts, she said. Any one of you caught messing around in my class while be asked to leave and not come back, you've been warned. Harry sat up straighter he set his holly and phoenix feather wand on his desk next to his course book and private journal ready to begin. He was disappointed however, when Professor McGonagall handed out matchsticks and had them go over the first chapter of the course book. Everyone in class took notes and practiced the incantation while Harry sighed, he had gone through this in his two months alone during the summer. Picking the matchstick up and looking it over closely, the course book said that understanding the object before transfiguration was key to being able to change it to something else. What are you doing? asked Pansy next to him snappily. We're supposed to take notes not play with the matchstick. Harry flashed her a smile slightly amused at her confusion. I'm getting a better look at the matchstick. 
Harry set the matchstick down and picked his wand up. Half moon counterclockwise then a slight flick followed by incantation with the intent to change the matchstick into a needle. Harry felt his wand hum with magic and the matchstick slowly changed into a small silver needle. So, I could do that, he said with a smirk. Pansy groaned and went back to reading her book. Potter. Draco called from the desk behind him. How did you do that? Harry saw that several people's eyes were on him. I did what the book said, he explained with a shrug. Nothing else did, the spell mostly relies on intent. Their talking got the attention of the rest of the class as well as Professor McGonagall who walked over to see why they weren't working but stopped when she saw the silver needle on Harry's desk. Picking it up she looked it over and gave Harry a small smile that looked foreign on her usually serious and strict face. Very good Mr. Potter, take five points for Slytherin. She showed it to the rest of the class and explained the subtle changes. Mr. Potter, I want you to try changing it back to a matchstick. When you do I want you to try lighting it. If it lights, then you will have successfully changed the needle back to matchstick. Harry took back the needle and set it back on the table, he was aware that Pansy was staring at him as well as Theodore and Blaze from the desk next to him. This was a great opportunity to gain a bit more notoriety within his house, so he focused his efforts. He didn't have as much time to examine the needle but was confident in his ability. Half moon wand movement, slight flick, incantation with intent. The needle slowly changed color, from silver to brown and the metal changed to wood. Harry breathed a sigh of relief at his success, picked up the matchstick then scraped it across the desk igniting the wick. Harry saw Weasley looking at him with frustration and a red face as his wand was pointing at a narrow matchstick. Obviously a failed attempt but Harry thought that it was a good attempt for the first day of class. McGonagall walked over with a smile and picked up the burnt matchstick to show it off to the class. He was aware that some of the Gryffindors were more irritated than impressed with Harry's feet. Another case of house rivalry, a Gryffindor will never be pleased with a Slytherin's success and vice versa. Honestly, Harry didn't care as long as it stayed as a rivalry between students. The second they started saying things like he was a dark wizard louder than low whispers in private then Harry would have a problem. The rest of class was spent giving tips to Theodore and Blaze, the latter of the two was quite talented in transfiguration. Theodore didn't have much natural talent but had the drive necessary to succeed and had managed to change half of his match into a needle, something McGonagall said was good for a first day. After being dismissed by McGonagall the three of them made their way to the Great Hall for lunch, all Hogwarts classes usually ran for two hours meaning that it was noon after being let out by McGonagall, he felt his stomach grumble when thinking about food. I heard from one of the older Slytherins that history of magic is going to be a waste of time. Blaze said as they entered the hall. Harry nodded, I heard that the ghost is more interested in goblin rebellions than overall history, he elaborated, I'm guessing that he had a bad history with goblins. The three of them sat at the table and began eating their lunch, the food wasn't as grand as the feast last night, but it was a great spread. After a couple minutes dozens of owls swooped into the hall and Harry looked up hoping to see Hedwig. A black owl landed in front of Theodore and gave him a letter in the Daily Prophet. Harry was about to pick up the paper when he felt a bird land on his shoulder, Hedwig had come back. He saw that Blaze's eyes were wide open in shock, but Harry ignored him in favor of running his ringers over her feathers. She hopped off of his shoulder and dropped the prophet on the table and caught at him. After landing on the table Harry was able to get a good look at her, she was a bit bigger and she was taking on a silver coloration at the ends of her tail feathers. Her beak was narrower, and head was more angular than the roundness that it was when he last saw her. Ivory Owem, whispered Blaze while staring at Hedwig. She's an Ivory Owem, those are really rare, Hedwig looked toward Blaze and dipped her head. They say that when an ivory owem finds a wizard or witch they bond with they change under the magical energies released by the moon. Theodore looked through his bag then took out Fantastic Beast and where to find them. Harry accepted the book from Theodore and began flipping through pages before finding a bird that looked similar to Hedwig. There wasn't much on the page for the ivory owem, Harry looked up from the page then to Hedwig. The picture showed that the bird was more angular and much larger and less owl-like and more like a bird of prey. Considering that the next full moon was in two days on Wednesday Harry assumed that she would undergo even more changes then. After the changes the resulting beast was on the next page, Lunistia, meaning almost literally moon beast, they were classified by Newt's commander as being a 4x beast, not for hostility but sheer rarity. 
similar to thunderbirds or phoenixes in that they were tied to an element. The Lunastia were tied to the moon and were suspected to have magical abilities but not many have been found so known facts were rare. The last known Lunastia was owned by Newt himself in the 1940s. However, he didn't record anything other than size and requirements for Ivory Aum to undergo their metamorphosis. Harry looked up at the highly intelligent eyes of Hedwig who dipped her head toward him and leaned down and began chomping on some of his crisps. Shaking his head Harry took out his journal and began noting the characteristics and changes between Hedwig when he met her and now. He would do this every day until her metamorphosis. He could be the first person credited with these discoveries. Where did you get her? Harry snapped away from his journal to the curious face of Blaze. From Diagon Alley, he said. The owner of the animal shop said that she was a rare breed of snow owl. Looking at Hedwig once more Harry shook his head. Now that I think about it, it should have been obvious she was a solid white color, and she didn't have any black specks in her feathers. She was also much more intelligent than any normal owl. Wow, Theodore said still looking at Hedwig. She's definitely a beauty. Harry nodded while giving Hedwig another crisp from his lunch. She chomped on it happily, they would have continued to enjoy lunch if Malfoy hadn't picked that time to sit next to them. Potter, he started tersely. What's this I hear about you being friends with a mudblood? He said it low and wasn't quite glaring at him, but Harry could tell that he wasn't pleased, not that Harry really cared what Malfoy felt. But how was it Malfoy knew about Hermione being his friend? It was only the first day of class and Hermione hadn't rode with him on the train nor had they spoken with each other publicly yet, except. Realization hit on Harry like a lightning bolt. Theodore or Blaze, it had to have been one of them. Blaze was the obvious pick, but it was just too quick. Harry was still keeping him at an arm's distance and would immediately suspect him, Blaze would know that since he was still feeling Harry out himself. Harry clearly underestimated Theodore's Slytherin qualities, especially if he didn't get a good read on him on the train. Or was it all a ploy to get close to him? No Theodore's emotions on the train were genuine, Harry had no idea how he knew that, but he could tell when he spoke with him on the train. Taking a note from Snape, Harry took a long blink and a deep breath. He was aware that Hedwig was staring at Malfoy with narrowed eyes, she was clearly aware of his mental stress. If Harry were honest, he hated the way Muggleborns were treated so this could be the first step to mending that since Slytherin was notorious for their feelings regarding blood. Yes, Malfoy. Harry said with a half smile that he hoped looked natural. Hermione Granger, she's a Ravenclaw I met in Diagon Alley. Malfoy looked like he had swallowed an entire lemon. Granger. He tasted the name with a growl. Don't hang around a dirty mudblood, it lowers your esteem as a Slytherin. It's bad enough that you're a half-blood. Is that right? Muttered Harry, some of the surrounding Slytherins were aware of the conversation and were listening. Blood status doesn't matter much when the ability of the wizard or witch is above reproach I think. She is second only to me in class so far, ahead of you and everyone else regardless of the number of magical ancestors she possesses. He smirked at the blush Malfoy now possessed. Harry was also very much aware that this was the first day of class and they hadn't even been to all of them yet, but the point still stood. Also, she told me the opinions of all the Ravenclaws towards me, furthered Harry, he was hoping to make a case that would help their view of Hermione and his own. So, she can help my image within Ravenclaw and give me information should I need it. Whatever, Potter. Snapped Malfoy. Draco clearly didn't have anything to add and rushed off to Crab and Goyle who were waiting at the end of the table standing like statues then following after Malfoy like loyal dogs. Harry found it funny that the only people that Malfoy liked to be around were those that were dumber than him. Granger has magical talent, Blaze said suddenly. A Ravenclaw with practical skill, she's a good witch to know. The dark-skinned wizard said each word deliberately as if he thought each one out before saying them. Harry guessed that he didn't really believe or want to believe everything that he was saying. We'll see, Theodore said tonelessly, it's only the first day of class. Theodore didn't look up to meet Harry's eyes, instead he was looking over the page containing information on a Lunastia bird. Harry reached over and ran his fingers over Hedwig's feathers, she mewled at him before she went to crunch on more of his crisps. Hogwarts 5 September 1991 Harry yawned as he walked around the lake in the morning with Hedwig flying overhead enjoying the morning sun today was a big day, it would be his first potion class and flying lesson. While it would be his first time on a broom, 
Harry felt that he was going to love flying. He had saw some of the older students riding their brooms and wanted to fly with them. Just the thought of being in the air, free as a bird with wind blowing through his hair. The past few days of classes passed just like the first. He had history of magic with the ghost, Professor Binns, who Harry thought had some serious issues with goblins. The first day of class was spent on how often goblins have rebelled in recorded history and that it was bound to happen again. He would sometimes go on a tangent about a specific goblin then tell everyone to disregard the information. History of magic was likely going to be the same as his muggle history class in primary school. Take notes then vomit all the information on the test. Harry didn't care for history of goblin rebellions and quite was disappointed that they were the primary focus. He wanted to learn about famous witches and wizards, dark lords and ladies, and important events that were relevant. Harry doubted that Sharp Tooth was going to revolt as long as gold kept flowing into his pockets. Astronomy was a fun class that Harry enjoyed, the class was held for first years on Wednesday at midnight. He liked looking at constellations and stars through his magical telescope, unlike muggle telescopes that magnified images. Magical telescopes were capable of projecting models that the telescope was pointed at. The professor, Aurora Sinistra, was a young witch who graduated from Hogwarts in 1986 and was the object of many students' affections. She was a pureblood witch with porcelain skin, black hair and blue eyes. While her family wasn't prominent or wealthy many of the Slytherins wanted her. Harry found her to be beautiful but didn't see the appeal yet, he was more interested in being a wizard. Blaze and Theodore were constantly talking about different ways to woo the professor. Harry doubted that the 23-year-old witch would even consider an 11-year-old as a possible romantic interest. Especially one as beautiful as Professor Sinistra, she likely had a list of suitors a couple feet long. Herbology seemed to go hand in hand with potions. The best potion masters were at the very least skilled in herbology so that they can grow and maintain their own ingredients. Professor Sprout was the nicest professor that Harry had. She was always happy to answer questions and was so passionate about her subject that Harry was very happy to learn. His fellow Slytherins didn't much care for herbology though, Malfoy had been complaining for hours after class that he was never going to do work so beneath him again. Nobody bought it, and Harry saw most of the older students roll their eyes and the blonde. It would seem that Slytherins didn't care for those who constantly whine. By far, the most disappointing class was defense against the dark arts. Quirrell, Harry refused to call him professor, was incapable of finishing a sentence without a severe stutter that annoyed Harry so much that he didn't even take notes or listen to him. He read his course book and practiced on his own but as far as Harry was concerned, Quirrell was the guy that liked to talk while he studied. Surprisingly, defense against the dark arts was a subject that brought on house unity in Hogwarts. From the kindest Hufflepuff to the surliest Slytherin would complain about Quirrell together. He, Theodore and Blaze had gotten close to one another since the first day as well. They were friendly with each other, would help one another with homework and work together in class. Harry was still trying to figure out how to address Theodore's apparent dislike of Muggleborns, he would need to see if his friend would change his views since Harry refused to associate with bigots, especially when his mother was a Muggleborn. Not to mention that he hated people like that regardless. Hedwig had further changed under the effects of the full moon a few days ago. While it was a change it wasn't as drastic as he thought it would be. Her wings were longer as was her body, her white feathers were tipped with silver and every night the silver would lengthen and she would grow. Harry thought that it would have been a drastic change on the night of the full moon, but it wasn't, and Hedwig just seemed to act more and more intelligent after every night. Like he did on the first day, Harry recorded all the changes in his journal and planned to be the one to be credited with uncovering the mystery of the elusive Lunistia. Harry sat in front of a large tree and took out his potion ingredient textbook. Magical drafts and potions, the potions that first years were expected to be able to make by the end of the year were simple. A boil cure potion, a sleeping draft and several others that were basic but useful. The textbook description for the boil cure, the first potion in the book, the ingredients and instructions were quite complex and complicated. Make a 3 inch flame, add 3 and a half cups of water to cauldron. Add 6 finely crushed snake fangs, heat mixture to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, wave wand over the cauldron, return after brew has sat for 31 and a half minutes. Drop 4 horned slugs into brew, 6 clockwise stirs with the ladle, take cauldron off flame, 2 more clockwise stirs, add porcupine quills, 2 counterclockwise stirs, 
then finally wave wand again over the brew and the potion will be complete. Harry shook his head, it was a precise art for sure not unlike cooking and Harry had plenty of experience cooking for his relatives. But seeing as this was the easiest potion in the first year text then this was going to be up there with transfiguration in its complexity. He would need to make sure that he was familiar with all of his upcoming potions before class, so he doesn't get caught off guard. Hedwig swooped down and landed next to him quickly, Harry took in her larger size. She was approaching nearly three feet from top to bottom. Her tail feathers were slightly longer and almost completely silver, golden eyes were focused on a small brown owl that was flying toward Harry. The small brown owl landed next to him and Harry could finally appreciate just how different a Lunistia was than an owl and even Hedwig's form as an ivory owl before her change under the effects of the full moon. Hedwig's beak was never that wide nor her head that round, he felt foolish for thinking that she was an owl and confused that the owner of the animal shop in Diagon Alley confused her for an owl. Harry reached over and took the note off of the small brown owl's leg. The owl hooted softly and sped away from the piercing gaze Hedwig had the poor thing under. Dear Harry, I know that you have the Friday afternoons off, so would you like to come by the hut for a cup of tea, around three? Send your answer with that beautiful bird of yours. Hagrid he didn't think that his short conversation with the half-giant after getting off of the train made them friends, but Harry would be happy to meet with him. Although Hagrid did say that he had known him as a baby so maybe he and his parents were close. Seeing nothing wrong with meeting with the man Harry wrote a small note and handed it off with Hedwig who shot into the air with a powerful flap of her wings. Harry took out his wand and used his newest spell, Tempus, it displayed the current time in the air above the tip of his wand. He had about 15 minutes until his potions class started so he started making his way back up to the castle. The Hogwarts dungeon was home to many things, the Slytherin common room, the potions classroom and miles of empty rooms. Listing all of them out made the massive expansion of magically reinforced stone seem empty thought Harry with a snort. Getting to the nearly hidden classroom, Harry was surprised to see that he was the first one to arrive. No Snape or anyone to talk to or sit by. There were three rows of tables each with three stools behind them. Harry went to the very front and took the leftmost seat, it was the closest to what Harry assumed to be Professor Snape's desk. Harry both hated and liked Snape, he respected his abilities as a potions master who achieved the title two years out of Hogwarts. A nearly unheard of feat from what Harry had found in his research, but on the other end of the spectrum, Harry didn't know why the man hated to speak or even be in the same room as Harry and found it irritating and childish. So, with that in mind, if Snape was going to hate him regardless, Harry at least wanted to watch him get upset since he did find some amusement in his head of houses suffering. Harry took out his textbook, journal and equipment from his bag then set them on the table in front of him. Written on the board on the right side of the class already had the cure for Boyle's instructions written out just like the chapter in the textbook he read down by the lake. Looking through his journal Harry checked to see if he had any potion ingredient notes or alternative uses but none of the ingredients used in the Boyle cure were in his notes. He had written about how pixie dust, a common ingredient in different types of energizing potions, was able to increase the potency of the sleeping draft potion if added before the fifth counterclockwise stir after the brew reached the desired temperature. Harry had also noted that the order of some potions instructions could be moved around to help with the brew's effectiveness and potency. Harry liked any subject that personal flair could make better, much like cooking and personal recipes. Harry. Snapping his head up from his journal he saw that Theodore was sitting next to him with a grin. You've been reading that for the past five minutes, he said, which is weird since I'm pretty sure that you're the author. Blaze finished setting up his equipment and let out a hum. He is, input Blaze. I've seen him taking notes in it during all of our classes, but I don't think it's just class notes. My journal has my ideas on anything I find interesting, answered Harry, but I don't have a perfect memory, so I do have to review my own work sometimes. While not perfect or photographic like a girl in his primary school had, Harry's memory had always been excellent. He could remember things from his infancy quite well and was able to completely remember important notes and information if he read it slowly and thoroughly. But even he needed to review every now and then to make sure he remembered everything. Well, you're definitely the top Slytherin first year, commented Theodore. Maybe I should start writing a personal journal of my academic musings. He pretended to push glasses further up his nose getting a chuckle out of Blaze. I want to be the best, so I take my schooling seriously, 
So, don't expect me to act like Weasley, snorted Harry. I doubt the guy could focus on class longer than ten minutes. Shut up Potter, Weasley shouted from the side of the classroom. Harry turned around with a raised eyebrow. Sorry, I didn't even know you were here, said Harry with a slightly tilted head. But try not to pay attention to other people's conversations, it's rude. Theodore and Blaze shook their heads with a small laugh while Draco sneered at Ron hatefully. Harry hoped that Ron didn't associate him with Draco. Harry was only teasing while Draco may genuinely hate the redhead. Harry didn't hate anyone at school yet. Before a red face Ron could scream his retort, the doors burst open and Harry's head of house rushed up to his desk with his black robes billowing behind him. There will be no foolish wand waving or silly incantations in this class. He started suddenly in a near whisper that Harry was sure even the very back of the class could hear. You are here to learn the subtle and exact art of potion making. Most of you won't consider this magic since you can't wave your wand and pass with luck. Potions can bewitch the mind, ensnare the senses, heal the most grievous injures and ailments or cause them. I can teach you to bottle fame, brew glory and even put a stopper in death. That is, if you aren't the usual bunch of dunderheads that I have to normally teach. Snape was glaring around the class and when he finally looked down at Harry his face almost morphed into a sneer, but the man kept a cool expression and turned away. Harry was even more pleased by his seating choice, he didn't know why he found irritating Snape fun, but he did. Maybe it was because the man had an irrational hatred toward Harry for some reason, whatever it was Harry gobbled up Snape's suffering like desert. Potter! snapped Snape. Harry looked up with a raised eyebrow, he hadn't done anything to condone the scolding yet. What is a key ingredient in all potions that cure poisons? Ah, he was doing a sudden pop quiz. The question's answer was in the middle of the textbook and Harry had already read the whole thing. A bazaar, a small stone that is found in the stomach of a goat and is common in all potion supply stores, answered Harry. Snape nodded and turned away from him, Longbottom. Harry heard a squeak from the back of the classroom and nearly fell off of his stool. What kind of Gryffindor squeaked? What is the most common ingredient in all sleeping potions? A similarly difficult question, answer found in chapter 6 of their textbook. Harry could hear low whispers from the back of the class, likely trying to help whoever Longbottom was. I don't kk no, sir. Harry couldn't stop himself and turned around to look at Longbottom wanting to know what a cowardly Gryffindor looked like. Harry was unimpressed, the boy was slightly pudgy and had a slight slouch in his stool he was avoiding eye contact with anyone. Again, what kind of Gryffindor was this boy, weren't the lions known for courage? Quite the paradox. Tut, tut. Responded Snape clearly unimpressed. Davis, same question, Snape seemed to want to compare the Slytherin and Gryffindor first years. Lavender, sir. The normally peppy girl answered respectfully likely cowed in Snape's intimidating presence. The plant lavender has many uses as common and even rare potions that induce sleeping or calming effects. Snape continued to look around the class before his gaze stopped on Weasley. Harry winced in sympathy for the red head, the boy likely hasn't touched his textbook so easy or difficult he probably wouldn't know the answer. Weasley, what is a common side effect of the pepper up potion? Ron shot up straight but relaxed when he heard the question steam coming out of your ears. Harry tilted his head toward the redhead and sent a mental apology to him, Ron wasn't as dumb as he thought. While not as in-depth as Trassus or his answers it was correct nonetheless. Five points to Slytherin. Snape said returning back to his low whisper. Thank Mr. Longbottom's lack of knowledge for losing Gryffindor points. Hearing Snape taunt a student cleared up Harry's picture of him. It would seem that Snape was just a git to anyone not in Slytherin, excluding Harry of course. So, Harry felt better that he wasn't being singled out by the potion's master and was rather being treated like everyone else. On the board are the instructions for the cure for boils brew. You will find them in your book, page 7. I want the potion in a labeled file by the end of the hour. Forty minutes later Harry signed his name on the crystal file containing his potion then took it to Snape's desk and set it in the file stand. Professor Snape looked anywhere other than Harry and he was more amused than annoyed seeing a grown man give him the silent treatment. Ten minutes later Snape thundered across the class after a howl in pain. Longbottom had somehow turned his potion into an acidic sentient liquid. 
This was the easiest potion they were going to make in this class and Longbottom had managed to screw it up bad enough to make something resembling acid that moved on its own, impressive. Foolish boy! Shouted Snape as he vanished the acidic brew with a flick of his wand. I ponder the extent of your incompetence. Weasley! Take him to the hospital wing. Harry spent the rest of class listening to Theodore and Blaze talk about the recent professional Quidditch games and scores. While Harry was interested in the sport, he didn't know enough about it, nor follow any teams so he was just happy to listen. Professor Snape spent the rest of class either berating students who were failing to brew the potions or doing work at his desk. There wasn't any more excitement during class as Snape either lost his preferred target or didn't have anyone failing hard enough to openly taunt. After potions the Slytherins and Gryffindors made their way to the large grass courtyard. In the center were twenty-three brooms all lined up on the ground and a stern woman watching them approach with hawk-like eyes. Come! She shouted and looked tempted to blow her whistle. All of you stand to the left of a broom, that's it now. My name is Madam Hooch, and I will be your flying instructor. She looked at each and every one of them hard in the eyes. She was dressed in expensive clothes that were blue and silver, her gray hair was short and spiky, and her left hand was holding a whistle. Flying is a complicated skill, she began. Those of you comfortable enough to rise further than three feet off of the ground will learn the basics but be warned it takes those with a special talent to truly be able to fly. I will try to teach you. Anyone fooling around or disregarding my instruction will not be allowed on a broom while at Hogwarts, she added quickly with a shout. Everyone gulped and stayed silent as she stared at them all once again. First things first. She walked to the end of the rows so she could see everyone. Hold your arm over the broom and yell up. Harry raised his arm and looked at the old broom. Up, he shouted, and the broom rocketed into his hand instantly. To his surprise he was one of the few to be able to do such a thing. Blaze had his broom as did Tracy, Draco and Seamus. The others were constantly saying up until they all had broom in their hands. Now that all of you have your brooms, Madam Hooch started back up. I want you to mount it and kick off the ground, hover for a moment, then touch back down. She blew her whistle and some of the Gryffindors tried to push off the ground, such as Weasley and Finnegan. But only Longbottom got off the ground managing to rise five feet, but it was too much for the pudgy Gryffindor who began to panic. Mr. Longbottom come back down this instant, shouted Madam Hooch. Longbottom tried to come down but was too scared to control the broom and was flying overhead uncontrollably. Some of the Slytherins started laughing while many of the Gryffindors were watching quietly. Help! I can't come down! shouted Longbottom before his broom shot into the air toward the castle wall far faster than an old broom like that should be capable of. With his increase of speed, the impact against the castle was harder causing him to scream in fright and likely pain. After hitting the wall Longbottom fell to the ground where a waiting hooch caught him with a levitation spell. A moaning Longbottom was set onto the ground where Hooch started checking him over. A broken arm, she tutted. I shall have to take him to the hospital, none of you leave the ground or I'll have you out of here faster than you can say Quidditch. Harry rolled his eyes at the women, she didn't have that power nor did flying on a broom unsupervised warrant such a punishment. Not that he cared, he wasn't chancing it on these terrible brooms, they were obviously substandard and likely Professor McGonagall's age. Harry ignored Draco who was strutting around the field insulting Longbottom, Harry would have said something but Weasley did it for him. The red-faced Gryffindor started insulting Slytherin House as a whole and was quickly ganged up on until a Gryffindor girl pulled him away. Harry really hated that his house was insulted in in its entirety because of a prat like Malfoy but he would think on that later. Twenty minutes later Madame Hooch returned and after another round of glares and warning slash threats the students who wanted were in the air. Harry looked down at all of his fellow students flying around the courtyard, he was twice as high as everyone else and was calmly flying around the sky. Harry had never felt more natural than he did on a broom, it was like he was born to fly, and Harry never wanted to get off. Getting a bit braver Harry shot forward and started doing some aerial maneuvers, a corkscrew, sharp turns and finished with a high-speed dive that he pulled up from at the last possible moment before shooting back into the air. He could feel that he was pushing the old broom far harder than he should but didn't care, he wasn't even aware of the other students anymore, he was only aware of the wind hitting his face as he flew. Only thing that broke him from his daring aerial adventure was Madame Hooch suddenly appearing in front of him with a glare. I've been calling you for ten minutes, she growled, 
Come back down now. Harry followed her to the ground unapologetically, he was having far too much fun to care about the totalitarian instructor. Now that everyone is back on the ground, she sent him another glare, class is dismissed, Potter stay behind. Harry watched as everyone left while Madame Hooch gathered all the brooms into a neat stack with her wand, after a minute of cleaning up she walked back over to him. Follow me. Madame Hooch then started leading him into the castle and after a while Harry recognized where they were going. Harry knew that if he was in trouble then this was the last person he wanted to know, Snape would likely giggle at the thought of punishing him, the man hasn't exactly been subtle with his disdain toward Harry. Madame Hooch had the unrivaled nerve to barge through the doors to the classroom with such force that Harry winced. Luckily, thankfully, the class was empty, Snape behind his desk snapped his head up and sent the most chilling glare at the flying instructor who didn't seem to care. Severus, she started using the Snape's first name earning her more of Harry's respect. I have found you your seeker. This boy is a natural on a broom, far more than most of the fools I teach at this school. Thank you, madam, he said in his low whisper. Leave Potter here, thank you. Madam Hooch started out of the classroom with long strides, she was out of the room in less than a second. If Harry wasn't nervous about his current situation, he would be impressed with the women. Well Mr. Potter, Snape said bringing Harry's attention back to him. I will say that I am not, entirely, surprised at this turn of events. Harry let his confusion show because Snape snorted. Do try to act like a Slytherin. Even when confused it's unbecoming to show one's inner thoughts so blatantly. Snarled Snape as he rose from behind his desk and walked toward him. Harry wanted to say that he could always read Snape since he made his thoughts known quite often. He hated pretty much everything and loathed everything else. You father, Snape looked to be in pain as he spoke. Was, among many other things, quite skilled on a broom. So, I can safely say your skills aren't unwarranted and I expected you on the team next year. No matter, I will notify Flint the team captain, that you will be at the next practice. The Slytherin Quidditch team practices at four on Tuesdays and Saturdays on the Quidditch pitch. Snape had finished writing a note and folded it up before animating it into a paper airplane that flew away. I am notifying the headmaster of this turn of events, I expect you to buy a broom and have it delivered to me. He said turning back to him, I would rather avoid people thinking this is favoritism on my part, so we'll be discreet. Now away, do something productive. Thank you, professor, said Harry before leaving the classroom behind. He was excited and nervous, excited to be able to fly much more often and on a competent broom, but he was nervous at how people would think about his new position, he would likely have to prove himself to the team but after practice he would be a full member of the team, if he proved himself worthy, at least. Muttering the Tempest spell once more he started making his way to Hagrid's hut for their scheduled cup of tea. Hagrid's home was located right at the edge of the Forbidden Forest and down the cobblestone steps leading to the Hogwarts main courtyard. It was a small home likely only having a loft and bedroom, but it seemed cozy and inviting. Walking up to the steps Harry knocked twice and waited for Hagrid. Fang back! shouted Hagrid from within the hut. The door opened to reveal a smiling Hagrid, Ari, come on in, back Fang. Hagrid pushed the large bark hound further into the room who cowed at the orders of his master. Don't worry, he's a right coward that one. Chuckled Hagrid as he patted his dog's head. Harry smiled at the dog, it's fine, I don't mind cowardly dogs. Never a more honest statement, Harry thought. Ever since his meeting with Marge did his opinions of canines shift he abhorred dogs especially aggressive ones. So, it was refreshing to see such a large and cowardly dog. Cup of tea? asked Hagrid, extending a steaming cup toward him. Thanking the giant, Harry took it and sat down. Hagrid looked at Harry's left with confusion. Gotta say, Ari, I didn't take ya for a Slytherin. Both her parents were Gryffindors. I know, Harry started with his, by now, practice response. But I'm proud to be a Slytherin. I also plan to raise everyone's opinion of my house. I don't like that people think everyone in Slytherin House is a dark wizard because their robes have green on them. Hagrid turned thoughtful as he sipped on his massive teacup that Harry thought resembled more a bucket than a teacup. I suppose you're right, he began. Most don't have the best opinion on her house. I hope you can change it. But I don't think her a dark wizard, Ari. You would have cursed me for questioning ya. Hagrid said with a booming laugh. Hagrid grinned at him and Harry relaxed into his giant chair. 
the large man had a way of making Harry feel relaxed. You said that you knew me when I was a baby? Sure did, beamed Hagrid. I was the one to take Yaw from her parents' home and kept Yaw safe until we found a place for Yaw. I also knew her parents quite well, especially her father, quite the troublemaker back in his time. I never knew, muttered Harry, what were they like? Er Daw was a clever one, Hagrid said sadly. He and his friends were right pranksters, give those Weasley boys a run for their money. Hagrid said with a laugh. But her mum, she was a brilliant witch and never put up with her dad's pranks. As a prefect she would yell at him all the time, so her daw would do it more to get her attention. Chuckled Hagrid taking another swig from his tea bucket. Both of them were great students and it wasn't until they were named head boy and girl that they got really close. Hagrid got a little sad again. They married a year out of Hogwarts and had you not long after, I remember their Christmas card. A little baby Harry on a toy broom with James laughing behind you and a worried Lily watching. Harry smiled sadly, he truly wished to meet them and know them. Hagrid saw his expression and stood up to grab something. That in mind, he said from the other room. I wrote Suma their friends to get you this. Hagrid came back with a red book filled with pictures. Harry blinked back the sting in his eyes as he saw his mom and dad smiling and waving at him from the picture. Some were of just one of them while others had their friends. The most shocking was a young Lily, likely in her second or third year with a Slytherin boy. Harry could never mistake the crooked nose and greasy hair and shot his eyes up at Hagrid who spotted the picture with a grimace. Didn't know that one was in there. Winced Hagrid and seeing the look on Harry's face he sighed and elaborated. Er mum and Snape grew up as neighbors, I think. I don't know everything, but I remember Black saying that she and Snape had a fight in their fifth year and she never spoke to him again. Snape did something to her or said something that made Er mum hate him. Harry stayed silent as Hagrid tried to find his words. You see, Ari, he started carefully. Er da had it bad for Er mum since they met, and he was jealous that Snape was knew her so well. He was a prankster and targeted Snape more than anyone else. Snape took it and would retaliate. They really hated each other. I didn't want to have to tell y'all this, he sighed. No, I'm glad you did. I didn't think my parents were perfect, but now I know that for sure. That does explain why Professor Snape seems to not like me very much, said Harry. Hagrid grunted after he finished his tea. Ura spit an image of Erda Harry, especially with those glasses, said Hagrid with a smile. But her eyes, they're pure lily. She had the most emerald eyes just like you. Thanks for telling me about them Hagrid, Harry said with a big smile, I really appreciate it. No problem, Hagrid cheered now back to his jovial self. Now that we're done with all that talk, why don't you tell me how you tamed a Lunistia, or found one at all? Harry laughed, he knew the gamekeeper would be disappointed in the story of his and Hedwig's meeting. I went to Diagon Alley to buy an owl, started Harry. Inside the animal shop a white owl landed on my shoulder. I thought she was an owl at least, so did the shopkeeper, he said it was a rare breed of snow owl. Hedwig, her name, took a liking to me instantly and I her. It wasn't until my friends saw her at lunch earlier this week that they pointed out that she wasn't an owl but an ivory owl. Now she has been changing more and more under the effects of the moon. I expect after a full moon cycle her change will be finished. Hagrid slumped in his chair and Harry laughed. Not as exciting as I'm sure Dumbledore's story on befriending a phoenix I'm guessing. Asked Harry, he too was curious how what had to be the most elusive beast, second only to a unicorn, could have been tamed. Especially when they could travel instantly unabated by wards. Hagrid grunted once again. That story ain't interesting either, he moaned. Dumbledore said that he found a large blue egg in Godric's hollow in the summer before his sixth year that hatched into his phoenix. Harry chuckled a bit. Leave it to dumb luck to pair a wizard with such a familiar, just like himself. Er lucky though, started Hagrid after he poured more tea into his bucket cup. Lunistia are magical beasts revered for their brains and have magical abilities tied to the moon. Hedwig's always been smart, but even more so ever since the full moon. Agreed Harry, he expected it took a full moon cycle for her to completely change so by October she should be a full-fledged Lunistia. Hogwarts 7 September 1991 Harry slumped into a green chair in the Slytherin common room, he had just woken up and made his way to the main room with his daily bag. He was planning on finishing his charms assignment and getting to work on his potions essay. Saturday had been a boring day, 
no classes and he spent most of the day exploring the grounds with Theodore and Blaze. Both of whom were becoming fast friends with one another. Harry considered them friends but didn't get too close, he was still unsure as to how to handle Theodore's supposed bigotry against Muggleborns. Harry planned to confront him when they had a moment alone, likely when Blaze studied by himself. Harry found it strange that the guy was so secretive but shrugged when he realized that he himself was also quite secretive. Not because of the type of magic he was learning but more because he didn't want to rely on anyone else or have people think that he couldn't do it on his own. Focusing back on his assignment Harry groaned, he needed to write six inches of parchment worth of information on the practical and theoretical uses regarding the levitation spell. Easy but tedious, he was four inches into it and was just now getting to the practice uses, it was a basic spell with hundreds, or practical uses and Harry didn't know if Professor Flitwick wanted all of them listed or just some. Potions on the other hand was eight inches on the pepper up potion. Harry found it interesting that his ancestor was the one to create it, he planned to add that to his assignment if only to see Snape's reaction. His other classes were thankfully without homework assignments. Transfiguration was the only class that had extra work it was that everyone practices and master the matchstick to needle transfiguration before next class as Professor McGonagall will ask to see it at the start of class. He had already did it in class, so he didn't have to worry about it. The rest of his day would be spent in his common room lazing about or doing his assignments. He was glad that he could rest from his first Slytherin Quidditch practice, Flint was doubtful of his skills at first, but Harry had managed to catch the snitch in seven minutes. Almost twice as fast as their previous seeker and Flint quickly warmed up to him. The others didn't care who he was as long as he could play, they had lost the last two cups to Hufflepuff as their seeker Cedric Diggory, was the second coming of Charlie Weasley on a broom. Harry was just happy to spend more time on a broom. Speaking of brooms, he needed to order one soon, their first game was in a little more than a month and he wanted to practice on it as much as possible. Flint told him to buy a Nimbus, strongly suggesting the newest model the Nimbus 2000. Harry saw in the catalogue that it ran about 750 galleons, it was the most expensive broom at the moment and the best. Harry shook his head and went back to his homework, he would worry about brooms later. Now that we have progressed past simple transfiguration, we can move on to more complicated transformations. Professor McGonagall walked over to her desk and placed a fork on a pedestal, she waved her wand over the fork changing it into a hair comb. The fork to comb transfiguration is a bit trickier than our previous spell as the two objects aren't similarly shaped so your magic will have to supply the rest of the missing material for the transfiguration to be complete. I want chapter 3 read and 10 inches on the material due next class. Everyone began packing their things up, Harry closed his notebook and put everything back into his bag. I was thinking about getting in some study time later, want to meet in the library? Asked Daphne who was sitting next to him. Harry smiled, sure, we can meet up later. Daphne had been sitting next to him in class more often recently, she and Tracy Davis were as thick as thieves but in transfiguration Daphne was his table buddy. If Harry were honest, he liked working with her, she was interested in all the same classes that he was, which was all of them. Mr. Potter, stay behind please, said Professor McGonagall right before Harry could follow Daphne out. I'll meet up with you later, tell Theo, Blaze and Tracy if you want, Harry said before walking over to McGonagall. After everyone left the classroom McGonagall sighed from behind her desk. Mr. Potter, she started with thin lips. It has come to my attention that you possess a familiar that is not an owl or a cat or a toad. Oh, he had totally forgotten about the rule about different animals needing to be vetted by the headmaster. Sorry, Professor, I bought Hedwig in Diagon Alley and was under the impression that she was an owl. I didn't find out until the first week of term that she wasn't an owl, explained Harry while scratching his head. McGonagall nodded and didn't seem angry, I understand, however, Professor Dumbledore would like to see you in his office. Lemon drops is the password. Off you go, Mr. Potter. Harry nodded and left. As he made his way to the headmaster's office, he tried to think of a way he could explain her presence at the school. 4x rating in the Magical Beasts Index meant that technically he shouldn't even be in possession of her as they were heavily regulated and monitored by the ICW. Naturally, he didn't know that until yesterday when Theodore told his grandmother about Hedwig, who then wrote to him saying that he needed to get a license to keep her. Professor Dumbledore was likely going to tell him the same thing or tell him that Hedwig couldn't stay and have her leave the grounds. Harry really hoped that wasn't the case, 
he cared too much for Hedwig to send her away. Harry arrived at the griffin statue that guarded the headmaster's office. Lemon drops, said Harry to the statue that began to twist and rise leaving behind a swirling staircase. Stepping onto the stairs Harry let the moving staircase carry him up to the office. At the top was a closed door so he knocked and waited. Come in, Harry. Harry didn't know how the headmaster knew it was him behind the door but shrugged and walked in. The headmaster's office was a large circular office that had stairs that lead up to a second level that was a smaller circular room. The walls held portraits of past headmasters and headmistresses who were either sleeping or away from their portrait. Along the walls were large bookcases filled with tomes and books, artifacts and other interesting items. Harry's attention was brought to a large swan-sized bird sitting atop a golden perch next to the desk at the center of the office. The bird cooed at him and leaned down to eat one of the candies on the desk. It was the first time he'd ever seen a phoenix in person and he was captivated by its presence. He is a handsome boy, isn't he? asked a chuckling Dumbledore from behind him. Harry turned around in surprise, he hadn't even noticed the headmaster, yes, he is. Dumbledore walked around him and went to sit behind his desk, lemon drop, he offered before popping one into his mouth. Harry shrugged and took one, Dumbledore beamed at him as they sat in silence for a moment. I hear that you have a rather interesting familiar, Harry Dumbledore said curiously not at all as upset as Harry thought he might be. Harry nodded, yes sir, my familiar Hedwig. She's a Lunistia, I expect that she will be finished maturing after the upcoming full moon. I see, hummed Dumbledore. I have only met one Lunistia, a former student owned one himself. Curious creature Lunistias, and a rather strange choice in pet. I thought she was an owl when I brought her to school. Harry said quickly, I didn't know she was an ivory owl until the first day and then I kinda forgot about that rule. Harry hoped that was enough for the headmaster to keep Hedwig, although he couldn't get a read on the headmaster's face. I see. Dumbledore rubbed his beard in thought, well, Hedwig is your familiar, so it stands to reason that you are allowed to bring her to Hogwarts. Harry perked up but Dumbledore raised his hand to stop Harry from speaking. However, Lunistia are classified as a 4x beast, all of which are heavily monitored by the ICW. One must go through the correct channels to own one. Dumbledore said making Harry wince, it wasn't looking good for him. Do you remember your Hogwarts letter? asked Dumbledore suddenly. Harry frowned in thought, I do, and do you remember my titles? I. Harry slapped his forehead. You're the supreme mugwump of the International Confederation of Wizards, are you saying that you will help me? asked Harry hopefully. Dumbledore smiled at him. I'm saying that I will help you go through the proper channels, and that for now you can keep Hedwig. Harry let out a sigh of relief and slumped into his chair. Thank you, sir. No problem my boy, Dumbledore said with a kind smile. All that I need you to do is write a formal letter requesting an acknowledgement of ownership of Hedwig, refer to her by name and species. I will push it through the channels to move this matter along. It is far from the most important thing the ICW needs to acknowledge so it should be resolved quickly. Harry quickly got to work writing the letter, he made sure that he wrote slowly and carefully making sure his handwriting was clean and neat and his words were as formal as possible. He requested that Hedwig, the Lunistia, be recognized as his familiar and property. Harry didn't like referring to her as his property, but Dumbledore assured him that it was the correct thing to write as Dumbledore was officially Fox's owner. After writing the letter Dumbledore accepted it with a smile. This should clear things up, have a good rest of your day. I will write with any new news on the matter. Said Dumbledore before dismissing him. Harry left the office with a large smile on his face. The library at Hogwarts was perhaps the most magical room in the castle. Sealing high bookcases lining the walls and making hallways in between them. The bookcases constantly moved around and changed the books to what the person standing in front of them needed. Harry looked thought the library until he came across Daphne who was writing on a roll of parchment. Daphne. He greeted making her look up. I guess no one wanted to come? No, Tracy and Blaze didn't want to work on homework and Theodore had something else he wanted to do. Daphne said with a shrug. Harry sat down and took out his transfiguration textbook. He set out all his necessary supplies and went to work. Have you started on transfiguration? Asked Harry while flipping through the book. Daphne nodded, yes, I have about two inches finished. I even tried the spell a few times, it takes a fair bit of magic, 
several times more than the matchstick. That sounded right to him, the matchstick and the needle were the same size, the comb and fork were not, so to make up the difference in mass magic would be needed to fill the gap. This was the first of many steps needed before trying conjuration as that would be magic completely filling the gap. Harry was excited to see that they were making progress toward the field. Harry wanted to try some of the spells from Adrian's adventure guide but all of them were way beyond a first year's capability. Harry was getting quite upset that every interesting spell that he came across in his book were far out of his level. How is that bird of yours? asked Daphne. Harry smiled at the thought of Hedwig, she's good, getting bigger and bigger. After the full moon she should be a full lunistia, and your cat? She's great. Stella likes to scratch all of Trass's things, laughed Daphne. Harry snorted at the thought of the exuberant girl getting into an argument with a kitten. Shaking his head, he went back to his essay, it was as dull as a theoretical essay on complex magic ought to be. The transfiguration equation needs to change on the bottom part. W, or wand power, needs to increase to balance the lack of materials or body weight or A. The book states that the more the weight of an object changes, either increasing or decreasing, needs to be balanced by wand power or magical output. Daphne was furiously writing with her quill while Harry explained, he didn't think it was complicated to understand but it seemed that he just good at understanding transfiguration. So, the equation T, or transformation, equals wand power times concentration, AXC, over viciousness and body weight, VXA, all multiplied by Z or an unknown factor, most think knowledge or talent. But this is only applied to transformations like matchstick to needle as they are relatively the same. All transfiguration spells will vary the equation drastically and we need to know how to balance it or how spells are balanced, this will help if we ever take arithmancy and want to make our own spells. That's why Professor McGonagall lectured about the equation for an hour, realized Daphne. Yeah, so we need to put that into writing for the essay. Get everything right and we'll get a big O on our assignment, smirked Harry. Hogwarts 29. September 1991 Harry gasped and dove toward the ground faster, a bludger flew past the area a second after Harry moved. His broom shot forward at an incredible speed as he weaved around the other members of the Slytherin team running through drills as he looked for a small golden ball. Flint was roaring orders to the chasers who were going through maneuvers, the two beaters were banging the bludgers around at the team members. The beaters were told not to let up with their attacks, Flint said that constantly looking for incoming bludgers was good practice for a real game. Harry had to admit that he was getting good at avoiding the terrifying balls. Potter. Get that snitch or divert attention off my chasers, roared Flint. I don't want you in your thumb while we work our asses off. Harry aimed his Nimbus 2000 and shot forward at speeds nearing 100 kilometers an hour. The Nimbus company expressed their pleasure that the boy who lived personally decided to use their broom and gave them a custom silver broom with their name and logo written in emerald green cursive at the tip. After seeing his broom, the other players used the color changing charm to match his broom. Harry smirked at the thought of setting a trend since he assumed the other teams would follow their lead. Bobbing and weaving through his teammates and bludgers, Harry finally spotted a golden blur fly right in front of his face. Twisting his broom Harry shot toward the snitch as fast as he could. A bludger sped toward him from his right flank. Harry leaned forward to descend enough for the bludger to fly over him then increased his speed more. Harry extended his arm and willed the broom to go faster, he was inches away when he got a burst of speed and managed to wrap his finger around the snitch. An instant later he felt something slam into his back knocking him off of his broom. The ground approached far faster than he expected in landing, or crashing onto the ground hurt much more than he was hoping. He heard several people land next to him. All right there Harry? Flint asked looking down at him. Harry groaned and rolled onto his back, yeah, gimme a second. Keepin' an eye out for them bludgers, E.H. Potter? Miles Bletchley, a chaser, asked. Course he ain't, got hit by one, didn't he? Gerald Bricky, a beater, laughed as he twirled his bat in his hand. Adrian Pusey, chaser, offered a hand to Harry, come on. Harry accepted and was pulled back to his feet, he spent a few seconds to recover then gave the others a thumbs up. Good, nodded Flint, I'm glad you got your first solid hit in practice, you know what to expect in a real game. Take the rest of the day off, Potter. Everyone else back to your drills, roared Flint despite everyone within 10 feet. 
Harry dragged himself back to the common room with a sore back and slight exhaustion. Harry, he heard Theodore say as he caught up to him. I thought you had practice until five, Harry nodded, I got the snitch and a good hit from a bludger, Flint gave me the rest of the day. Ah, well in that case you can help me with my potion homework. I haven't been able to find anything to add to the sleeping draft's history to make the essay ten inches, groaned Theodore. This was becoming a common occurrence since the beginning of term. Harry was, somehow, the top student in Slytherin and would be asked for help on assignments. While Harry knew that he was doing well in his classes, it was only because he read ahead and would try to lean it himself rather than wait on the class to teach him. Harry didn't know how he was doing so much better than purebloods when they were likely taught before even coming to Hogwarts, so they should hold an advantage. Sure, shrugged Harry. Luckily, he already finished his potion essay, it was a habit for him to finish all his assignments as soon as he could especially since he had Quidditch practice at least twice a week, sometimes Flint was able to book the pitch more times, so he had to be ready for his afternoon to be taken by Quidditch. Getting back to the common room Harry went to his room to take a shower and change into his robes. He would dress casually but they still had dinner and Slytherin House was more formal than the others and wanted, required, that students be formally dressed unless they didn't have classes on that day. Getting back to the common room Harry noticed that only Theodore was there sitting at one of the tables while the rest of the room was empty. This was a perfect chance to talk to him about some things privately. Let's get to it, show me what you did as an example, Theodore said as he took out his half-finished essay. Harry took out his notebook but didn't take out his essay yet, this was a good time for him to ask Theodore what he'd been wondering for a while. I have a question for you Theodore, the last male not looked at him curiously. Do you have a problem with muggleborns? Or non pure bloods? Harry asked whilst trying to keep his face blank. Theodore set down his quill with a sigh, he rubbed his face and slouched into his chair. There was an irritation to the question that he was trying to hide, but Harry managed to catch it, even if it was only present for the barest of moments. I, he started hesitantly, I don't like them, he finished lamely. Theodore took a breath, but I don't hate them like Malfoy. While I don't agree with all that purity nonsense, I don't like them trying to change the way my family has done things for centuries or making life harder for my family and those like mine. My father took that view to the extreme, I don't agree with him on that, Theodore said with a slight growl and he glared at Harry while saying it. My grandmother has had to spend thousands of galleons on new bills passed to cater to muggles, not just muggleborns but muggles. What do you mean? Harry asked, he'd never heard of such a thing. The misuse of Muggle Artifacts Department has been passing laws that wizarding families have to pay more money to help that department protect muggles from magicals. Five years ago, none of this was around and everything was as good as it is now, only thing different is families like mine have to pay thousands of galleons to appease people like Arthur Weasley. So, I may not like and resent Muggleborns because of it, I don't want any part of them. That made more sense than just because of blood purity not a good reason but a better one than pure racism. Harry didn't know that wealthy families were being forced to do such things and it made Harry make a note to subscribe to the Daily Prophet as that was the best source of information on the day to day of magical Britain. My mother was a muggle born, Harry said seriously, I don't care for blood purity or all that other nonsense that Malfoy spouts every five minutes. But if you don't like muggle-borns and don't want to be around them then I don't know if we can be friends. I don't know how I'll react to people insulting my mom, but I won't take it silently. So, if that is the case, trailed off Harry waiting for Theodore to say something. Theodore stared at him for a moment then went back to work on his essay with a grunt. Harry took that as a refusal to change and got up and left, he already spoke with Blaze who didn't mind Muggleborns and was willing to associate with them. Tracy was a half-blood like him and was openly friends with Muggleborns. Daphne as far as Harry knew didn't care either but he hasn't done anything to suggest otherwise, she was also childhood friends with Tracy whose mother was a muggle born so she couldn't be against them. Harry regretted that his first friend was someone that he didn't want to associate with for racism. Hell, Hermione was far better than Theodore and Draco in class, yet they would both glare at her for just having parents that weren't magical. Harry held his tongue for nearly a month trying to handle the situation discreetly and preserve the friendship. But he had other friends in Slytherin, Blaze was nice to talk to as was Daphne and Tracy. Hogwarts 4. October 1991 tonight, was going to be a full moon, the second one of the term. 
and if Harry was correct then Hedwig's final change was going to be tonight. Unfortunately, Harry hadn't seen her in the past two days, she flew by with a daily profit then he hadn't seen her since. It would have been cause for concern if this wasn't the first time it had happened. Blaze, like Harry, suspected that she needed to undergo the last of the changes in solitude and Harry thought that might be it but lacked any more information to be totally sure. Lunch today also saw the latest change to his group, Theodore, was sitting by Millicent Bulstrode talking quietly. Since their falling out Harry and Theodore hadn't said much to one another, Blaze was the only one in their room to speak to both of them. Harry didn't want their relationship to fall further and decided to just not speak to Nod if he could help it, he didn't want to have to share his room with an enemy. Like back on the train, Theodore still didn't like Malfoy and his blustering rather preferring to stay at a distance from the other Slytherins. Harry didn't really care that he was alone, Theodore made his choice and Harry refused to be friends with someone like that. Harry, where did that come from? asked Tracy pointing to a letter next to his plate. Harry reached down to pick up the letter, it was written in a loopy cursive and had his name on the front with golden ink, an interesting choice. Opening it up Harry saw that it was a note from Dumbledore. The ICW had permitted him a license to own Hedwig, Harry didn't like the terms used but understood. It also stated that he was responsible for anything Hedwig does, for instance should she kill something or someone he was responsible and could be tried. Dumbledore said that the same was true for him should Fox do something along those lines and to not worry. Dumbledore also said that he would be interested in any research Harry gathered on Hedwig as Lunistia were incredibly rare. Harry fully planned on researching his familiar's abilities once she returned. It was a note from Dumbledore. Answered Harry, about what? Asked Blaze. Hedwig is technically classified as a 4x beast so I needed a permit to own her from the ICW. Dumbledore helped push the paperwork through the hoops. This was Dumbledore telling me that everything worked out and that I'm legally responsible for anything she does. Where is she by the way, she usually comes to eat our food? Asked Daphne. I don't think she will be back until tomorrow. Tonight is the full moon and I expect this will be the end to her change. Blaze nodded, yeah. We thought that it would take a full moon cycle for her change so like the first time she will likely stay away. I give up, came a frustrated shout from further down the table. Everyone looked to see Estella Graves ripping a paper in half with a pout. She then set it down and burned it with her wand. She then sat down with a pout as she glared at the smoldering remains of the paper. What's up with that? asked Harry while walking over to the prefect. Estella looked up to see the group of first years staring at her making her cheeks turn a bit pink. I gave up on my ull, she said before sighing when they didn't understand, sorry, unidentified letter, it's a mystery that has been around the school for decades. Every year the top student of the years gets a letter that reads solve me, but don't worry about it only third years and up get them. But everyone only gets one chance, so if you get it in your fourth year you won't have another chance. No one solved it, ever asked Tracy in shock, Hogwarts had some of the brightest minds come through it in the past couple decades. Estella shook her head. No, a seventh year Ravenclaw a few years back got close and last year a Hufflepuff almost had it but gave up before the window ended. We only have a month to solve them, we get them a month before summer starts. I was still looking at mine to see if I could get it even if it was after the window. Harry narrowed his eyes, I'm going to solve it, if no one else has done it then I'm going to. Get the top marks in your third year and you can try. Estella said with an eye roll, don't come crying to me when it stumps you like so many before you. The first years exchanged looks of intrigue at the seemingly unsolvable mystery. Harry wanted the chance to do something that no one else could manage and made a vow to achieve top marks in his year. It would be a good way to raise Slytherin's standing in many people's eyes, especially since Ravenclaw, the House of Intelligence couldn't solve it. Harry was second only to Hermione at the moment, who was ahead of him only because she would do nearly twice the amount of requested work when he only did what was required. Harry was sure that once practical exams started, he would pull ahead, his wand work was where he truly thrived. No one learned spells faster or better than he did. Astronomy class was in full swing, the beautiful Professor Sinistra was going around the area answering any questions asked of her, had while pointing out the different constellations. She was randomly asking the names of the stars that made up Orion's belt, the constellation they were studying tonight. 
Remember that Orion's belt is a symbol of stabilization in astronomy and is referred to in divination that those born when the belt is brightest will live longer and healthier lives. Rituals and runes were engraved with symbols in the same shape to help stabilize the processes. Explained Professor Sinistra passionately as she gazed into the night sky. Harry listened absent mindedly while looking up at the full moon, wondering where Hedwig was. She was likely undergoing her change or resting from the change at this moment. He sent a note to Professor Dumbledore saying that tonight was the night of final change and thanking him for helping with the permit. I want five inches on Orion's belt and its significance. Instructed Professor Sinistra, note that the position of the surrounding constellation and their importance to rituals in the past as well. The endless space above us directly affects the very magic we use. I hope everyone recognizes this. Before she could continue a silver streak was seen flying toward the tower at incredible speeds almost looking like a shooting star. Harry took out his wand but smiled when it got closer and he felt the familiar presence. Hedwig. He whispered happily. The silver streak stopped, and a large white and silver bird landed on top of the wall of the astronomy tower. She was still the same three feet in height, but the ends of all of her feathers on her wings were silver and her all silver tail feathers extended for several feet behind her and looked to be made of silk. Her golden eyes glowed resembling molten gold and she let out a happy trill. What's that? asked someone from behind him. Harry turned around to see all of the class as well as Professor Sinistra was staring at Hedwig with surprised looks. Many of the Slytherins recognized the bird as Harry familiar but didn't say anything. She's Hedwig, my familiar she won't bother anyone. Assured Harry, she just finished her change tonight under the moon and was excited to see me. Hedwig cooed making Harry run a finger over her feathers. The Lunastia leaned into his touch and cried happily making him smile. Sorry about interrupting class, professor. Apologized Harry when he realized that he had interrupted class. Professor Sinistra walked closer to Hedwig after telling everyone to get back to work. She's a Lunastia isn't she? Sinistra asked with barely hidden awe as she walked closer to the Harry. Harry nodded, yes. She has been undergoing a metamorphosis since the last full moon, now she should be a full-fledged Lunastia. What a treat, smiled the beautiful professor. Lunastia are mentioned heavily in astronomy, they are said to draw power directly from the moon and their presence alone can affect plants and potions that respond to astronomical properties. Harry could hear her passion in her voice and silently chuckled when he became aware of several people's jealous glares at being the center of the beautiful professor's attention. He would have thought that most would have cut their losses and by now realized that she wasn't interested in them. Now back to work Mr. Potter, she said reluctantly while walking away from Hedwig. I ask that she not interrupt another class, I can let it slide tonight. Next time will be a detention. Of course, Professor. I'm sorry. Harry turned to Hedwig, you can't burst into class like that. He whispered. I promise tomorrow we can go flying. I also want to see what you can do now. Harry was grinning as he finished talking with her. Hedwig trilled and somehow Harry knew that she apologized but seemed excited by the prospect of flying together in the morning. He suspected that it was because of their familiar bond but wasn't sure. Hogwarts 31. October 1991 Homework, Quidditch practice and increasingly difficult classes took all of Harry's focus and before he knew it, Halloween had arrived. Currently Harry was listening to Professor Flitwick lecture about the levitation spell with the Gryffindors. Having displayed this spell on the first day of class Harry was working on the assigned essay that Professor Binns gave them earlier in the day about Yurik the Oddball. Now, swish and flick. Instruct the small professor while waving his wand through the motions. Everyone try it on your feather. Mr. Finnegan please focus. Mr. Malfoy I trust that you are talking about class. Come on now give it a go. Harry smirked at Malfoy's reaction to being called out. Professor Flitwick and Professor McGonagall were the only two non-Slytherin professors that Malfoy listened to without back talk. Professor McGonagall was a transfiguration master and was a highly respected witch in the ministry while Flitwick was a charms and dueling master. Even the pureblood supremacy spouting Malfoys respected the both of them. Publicly, at least. Now everyone give it a try, sheared Flitwick always the champion of practical learning. Shouts of Wingardium Leviosa were heard from around the class as people attempted to make their feathers fly. Bavarti Pottle was heard correcting Ron who was sitting next to her and was getting progressively more irritated at his inability at casting the spell. I can do it myself, growled Ron before turning his back to the girl making her huff. Fine. 
she shouted back clearly upset. Pavarti was then consoled by her ever-present best friend, Lavender Brown, who was also glaring at Ron. Harry rolled his eyes, Weasley had far too much pride to accept help on a spell or anything really, especially publicly. The surrounding Slytherins were all in a variety of different stages of succeeding with the spell. Daphne had managed to do it right for a second while Theo and Tracy were making their feathers move on the desk. Blaze and Draco haven't started yet and Harry couldn't see the rest of his housemates. Mr. Potter, Professor Flitwick said getting Harry attention, I know you showed this spell on our first day but please demonstrate it for the class, be sure to enunciate and use proper form. Harry picked up his holly wand and felt his magic resonate with the phoenix feather within the wand. Wingardium Leviosa. With concentration, intent and focus, Harry raised his wand, and the feather followed the tip into the air. Harry waved his wand around and the feather followed loyally, after a moment Harry let go his concentration on the spell causing the feather to fall toward the ground while Harry placed his wand back into his pocket. There you have it, cheered the diminutive professor with a couple claps and squeaks. Five points to Slytherin, Mr. Potter. Harry smiled and nodded to the charms professor. Blaze next to him let out a snort. Save some recognition for us, Mr. Potter. Harry looked over to see the feather in front of Blaze moving along the pattern of his wand showing that he had successfully casted the spell. Good job, Harry said honestly, but he wasn't surprised since Blaze always picked up a spell quickly. After another hour Professor Flitwick clapped and told everyone to write up five inches on the levitation charm's origin and creator. Harry and the others filed out of the class making their way to Transfiguration when they overheard some of the Gryffindors talking. I can't stand him. So bloody perfect, growled Ron. Bad enough potters in Slytherin, now he's a show off like that Ravenclaw Pratt Granger. I wouldn't be surprised if they spent every second in the library studying alone. The two boys next to Ron, Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas, both seemed to agree to various levels. Harry rolled his eyes at the comments, obviously the redhead was jealous and was lashing out, but he wouldn't rise to the bait, he has had worse things said about him to his face by his relatives after all. Daphne, however, decided to stick up for him. Shut up Weasley. She said angrily with a cool glare that impressed Harry in its iciness. She must have been taking private lessons from Snape. Just because you're a rotten wizard doesn't mean you should badmouth the good ones. A red-faced Ron glared at her venomously. Shut up Greengrass. Potter's a know-it-all snake just like you. Harry managed to get to Daphne before she said more, that enough, he told her with a hand on her shoulder. It's not worth it he'll huff, and puff and we'll have wasted five minutes. Let's get to class, I don't care about anything that comes out of his mouth. Daphne looked ready to refuse but Harry started to move back toward the hallway leading to the staircases. Ron was similarly pulled away by his friends and Harry was thankful that he wasn't going to have to hear him yell across the school about his slimy snake ways or whatever. It wasn't a good insult after the first ten times, and they must be up to about fifty times now. The Halloween feast was in full swing, bats flying overhead, jack-o'-lanterns floating around the great hall and the ghosts talking with one another happily retelling their own deaths with fondness. The Slytherins were happily drinking pumpkin juice and eating sweets while the rest of the hall were similarly celebrating the holiday. Blaze told him that magicals and muggles celebrated the day for different reasons but were both nicknamed Halloween and it held several significant magical characteristics. Snape had been in the dungeons working on highly complex potions that needed to be finished on the day of Halloween and Professor Sprout was doing similar things in the greenhouses with plants that were more active tonight. Harry half-heartedly drank his pumpkin juice but wasn't up for celebrating. Three months ago, he found out that tonight was the night that Voldemort murdered his parents. So, he wasn't going to act festive on the anniversary of their death. Especially since this was the first year he knew of their fates. If he knew where they were buried Harry would have requested to visit the gravesite to pay his respects. Something he'd never done, something he'd have to rectify in the future. After the speech from Dumbledore encouraging the festivities Harry stood up from his spot on the bench. What's wrong? asked Blaze. Harry took one last sip from his drink, I'm headed back to the common room, I'm not feeling up for celebrating. See you later. Blaze dipped his head and some of the others watched him leave but didn't say anything. Harry saw Theodore send a look then quickly turn away. It was blank enough that Harry couldn't infer what he was thinking. Walking out of the Great Hall Harry saw Professor Quirrell running towards the large doors leading to the Great Hall and snorted. 
the guy likely forgot about the feast or was too scared to go with all the bats flying around. Making his way toward the staircases Harry let out a huge yawn before turning the corner. He would have continued on his path if he wasn't obstructed by a massive pair of legs belonging to a troll that was curiously looking down at him with a raised club that was the size of a tree trunk. Oh, Harry muttered trying to understand what was happening. The troll decided that it didn't care what was happening and decided to attack. Harry screamed in terror and ran forward between the massive legs of the troll confusing the beast. An instant later Harry heard the thunderous boom of the club hitting the ground. Harry began running away from the troll and if the large approaching booms were any indication the troll was in pursuit and catching up. Trying to figure out a way to come out of the situation alive Harry pulled out his wand hoping to think of a spell that could help. He took a deep breath, Fulman, roared Harry hoping for a glorious bolt of lightning only to be rewarded with a bit of static at the end of his wand sputtering pathetically for a second. Of course, groaned Harry with a roll of his eyes as he resumed his retreat. The troll kept swinging its club around smashing into the walls and ground. Paintings were yelling for him to hurry while the staircases were moving to help him. Harry jumped onto the staircase and descended down the flight hoping the troll would cut its loses. The troll looked at the staircase with a confused tilt of its tiny head and took a step down before tumbling down the rest of the stairs falling toward Harry who tried to wrap his mind around what he was seeing. As the troll crashed onto the level, it was on Harry had an idea and nearly slapped himself. In the same book he got Fulman he got another spell. This time Harry focused more on his intent and took a deep breath to steady himself. Conchurpie. He cried and from the tip of his wand a sickly yellow ball shot toward the troll's stomach. The spell impacted with a loud crack as the magic exploded on impact. The troll groaned but still managed to climb to its feet and reach for its club. Harry, seeing that his spell hurt it even if barely casted it again, this time aiming for the troll's knees. The troll groaned and fell to the ground having buckled from being hit by the spell again. Harry spotted the bruising flesh on the troll's knee and knew that his spell was working and kept it up. A hit to the troll's face got a groan from the beast. One to its other knee kept it down and one to its hand holding the club made it release its weapon. Getting an idea, Harry casted the levitation charm on the club and smacked the troll in the face with it knocking it over. Seeing that the club was a better weapon, Harry swung the large tree trunk around bashing the beast's head over and over until it stopped moving. Harry fell onto his butt and slowly let the adrenaline fade which allowed him to fully realize the terror of the past few minutes. He was barely aware of the rushing footsteps approaching or various paintings shouting out his location, preferring to take calming breaths. Mr. Potter, came a familiar Scottish accented shout that snapped him out of his thoughts. Opening his eyes, he saw several of the faculty, including Dumbledore, looking at him while Snape and Flitwick were examining the troll off to the side. Both were waving their wands over the downed beast while waves of magic washed over its body. What happened Harry? asked the headmaster gently. Harry took a few more breaths. I left the feast to head back to the Slytherin common room when I turned a corner and ran right into a troll. Why was there a troll in the school? Is that a part of the holiday? He asked incredulously, he was sure it shouldn't be a part of it if for some reason it was. Of course, it isn't snapped McGonagall. Professor Quirrell told everyone what happened shortly after you left the feast, somehow the troll entered the school. She said angrily, and Harry realized that it wasn't aimed at him but rather the situation. Truly miraculous that no one was injured, Dumbledore said with smile. I think a reward is in order, 30 points to Slytherin for defeating a troll and protecting your fellow students. Harry didn't want to say that he didn't take down the troll with anyone else's safety in mind but his own, but he wasn't going to object to that many points, he did earn them anyway. Thank you, sir. Snape came back around with a noticeable limp. With this under control, I suggest you go back to the common room, ordered Snape making sure Harry nodded before looking away from him. One more thing, Harry, Dumbledore said before he could leave. What spell did you use to damage the troll? Conchurpi. I read about it in an adventure book, explained Harry with a shrug. He noticed that some of the professors didn't recognize the spell while Snape and Dumbledore and looked at him with recognition. Dumbledore smiled at him and waved him off, thank you, now get to bed Harry. Yes sir. Hogwarts 1. November 1991 news of Harry facing down the troll, even if by accident, had spread throughout Slytherin house and likely the rest of school. 
Harry didn't know how it happened but assumed that people saw that he left early and that the troll was taken down before Harry returned to Slytherin along with 30 points, he didn't care for everyone staring at him, but he was going to have to deal with it. You can tell me, Blaze said while staring at him from across the table in the Great Hall. You took down a mountain troll, it's the most interesting thing to happen around here in weeks. So, is it true? Yes, groaned Harry while throwing his head down. I didn't intend to fight it, like I said before leaving last night, I wanted to go back to the common room. Explained Harry with a sigh already tired of talking about it. I got lucky, it was really dumb and slow, and I just happened to knock it off balance. How very Gryffindor of you! Snarked Daphne from the seat next to Harry with Tracy letting out a laugh. Harry rolled his eyes, you sound like Professor Snape, whenever he talks to me it's about how I'm not acting like a real Slytherin. Like what? Ask Tracy curiously. Don't show your thoughts, don't act recklessly, don't embrace the urge to cause trouble. I don't know where he got the last one, I don't have enough time in the day to run around like the Weasley twins. Well, you did fight a troll and smuggle in a 4x beast into the school without permission, Daphne said thoughtfully. The first one couldn't be my fault and the second one is now resolved nor was it my fault, argued Harry as he piled more food onto his plate, there was a good spread of food today. Whatever, shrugged Daphne. Just don't lose his points and no one will really care. Blaze nodded, yeah Harry, we need to make sure we beat Ravenclaw for the house cup. I heard from one of the fourth years that Slytherin threw a huge party three years ago when they won last time. Slytherin hasn't won in three years? Asked Tracy. You'd think Professor Snape would hand out points until we won. Professor Snape is a true Slytherin, explained Blaze slowly likely to mock her intelligence. He couldn't be that blatant about his favoritism when the other heads of houses aren't. Tracy turned away from Blaze with a pout. Whatever. Harry rolled his eyes at the exchange. Blaze never hesitated to talk down to someone if he thought they were stupid or were acting stupid. Harry's favorite was when Malfoy was boasting about a racing broom his father bought him for his birthday and was quite vocal that he was a better choice than Harry for the house Quidditch team. You are barely skilled on a regular broom. He must think you will fly better on a broom that costs more, I guess Malfoys believe that you can buy anything? On that day Harry's respect for Blaze rose another notch as did several other Slytherins as they were all worried about Draco's father's influence and liked that someone was willing to stick up to the blonde. Harry later found out from Blaze himself that the Zabini family was both wealthier than the Malfoys and had an older bloodline. Draco either respected that or feared the infamous Black Widow's power and influence himself. Blaze's mother was currently on her seventh husband and many believed that she had killed the previous ones and took their fortunes adding to her own, she was never formally accused nor any evidence of this ever found. But it was commonly acknowledged as being the truth, not that the Black Widow herself ever let anything slip other than the public reasons she's always given. Harry was happy that he was friends with someone who spoke their mind, Blaze told him that he had written to his mother about him and that she expressed her interest in meeting Harry in the future. Harry called Daphne getting his attention, we need to go, double defense starts in 10 minutes. Harry sighed and went to follow them to class. The familiar smell of garlic was as welcome as it was unwelcome, Harry hated the overpowering smell, but it certainly took his mind off of the troll. Harry sat toward the middle of the room and tried to breathe through his mouth as much as he could. Blaze was looking over his defense assignment next to him coolly, he and Harry had worked on it for three hours last night and yet Blaze was worried he left something out or it wasn't good enough. Harry was willing to let the chips fall where they may when it came to written work, after he wrote it then he wasn't going to stress about it. W welcome to C class, Quirrell stuttered as he made his way to the front of the class. TT today, we're G going TT to talk A about trolls. Harry's head fell to the desk with a groan, for some reason he felt that Quirrell was enjoying this. Looking up he noticed that Quirrell was staring at him before turning away to begin talking. As class went Harry tried to follow along, mostly because the subject matter was both interesting and important. Quirrell was trying to get through a lesson on basic curses but was struggling to say the names of the spells and what they did without stuttering incessantly. T the LL leg locker C curse, is used B by even the MM most advanced W wizards and W witches. T the incantation I is locomotor mortis. W would any 0001 want to V volunteer to help me SS show the C class? Quirrell managed to look at everyone once before settling back on Harry. M Mr. Potter, H how about I it? 
Harry shrugged and walked up to the front of the class, he was very much aware that the Gryffindors in the class were all snickering at him in his soon-to-be cursed state. Standing across from Quirrell Harry noticed that the professor was staring at him intently, not quite like Snape or Lucius, but Harry was still unsettled by the look. Quirrell seemed to know this as he turned to address the class. And now everyone w watch cc carefully. Quirrell swung back around then pointed a rather strange looking and curiously short wand toward Harry. Locomotor Mortis. Harry didn't have a second to prepare himself, the silver orb of magic slammed into him causing both of his legs to snap together making him unable to even twitch his legs. Harry had to spread his arms out to keep from falling over. Harry looked up to see a slightly curious Quirrell staring at him, this time Harry thought he felt the familiar tingle, but it didn't stay longer than an instant. He wasn't sure but it almost looked like Quirrell was surprised for a moment but like the slight tingle it left the professor's face in the next instant. A as you can see TT the L leg locker C curse is very U useful. Quirrell raised his wand toward Harry and muttered finite rather than the spell specific counter. NN now H how about WW we move on TT to some interesting sea creatures. Fire burned with intense heat, as if he was standing in the depths of hell. The ground beneath him cold, lifeless stone, black as night and cracked. The room's ceiling was high, and pillars surrounded him. A form stood in front of him with a wand raised, he could feel their power but could not see them clearly. Next to the person, so plainly visible, a mirror. With curious writing written on top and the image of himself with a strange rock held in a white knuckle grip. Surrounded by fire, atop cold stone and in front of an enemy yet unknown, he was triumphant in his goal. Harry's eyes shot open as he felt his magic calm, he had been lucid for the past few minutes but the dream, he wasn't sure if that was what it was, felt far different than any dream he had ever experienced. Looking around his dorm, both Blaze and Knot were still asleep. Harry ran a hand through his ever messy black hair with a sigh, somehow that non-dream felt real, like it had happened already. Curious. We have gone over maneuvers several times, Flint spoke roughly. We lose this game and all hex each and every one of ya, got it. Harry held in a flinch at Flint's words and swallowed thickly. This was his first game as a seeker, and it had to be against Gryffindor of all houses. His teammates were somehow calm and assured of the upcoming victory as well as nervously jittery. Harry would try and push the thought of a jittery brickly from his mind, the guy was huge, and he didn't look good moving like that. Potter. Pusey snapped. Get ready. The Weasley twins are perhaps the best beaters to come to Hogwarts in a while. They'll be aiming for you. Harry gulped again. Brickley slapped a large meaty hand to his shoulder. Don't worry Potter, we'll keep an eye on y'all. The following laughter didn't inspire much to Harry. Come on, shouted Flint leading them onto the pitch. They were met with many boos and Slytherin houses cheers. Unfortunately the house of green wasn't large enough so the boos won out. Across the pitch from them he spotted the Gryffindor team. Oliver Wood, a large fifth year stood over his team imperiously as he locked eyes with every Slytherin. He was known throughout the school as a potentially pro keeper and Flint had complained during practice many times that scoring on Wood was nearly impossible if he wasn't distracted. The three chasers, Angelina Johnson, Alicia Spinett and Katie Bell. Three admittedly pretty girls talked with each other happily as they walked forward. Harry hadn't heard anything about them other than a few catcalls from the crowd specifically the Gryffindor section. Their beaters. Fred and George Weasley, the notorious pranksters. Harry was tempted to lose if only to avoid the potential prank assault for beating them. Like Pusey said earlier, they were the beast beaters to come to Hogwarts in a long time. Must be because of some sort of twin telepathy that made their teamwork so fluid and deadly. Newest addition, according to Flint, was Cormac McLagan their seeker. He was taller and broader than Harry and wore a smug. Superior smirk as he looked down at Harry. He didn't know who the guy was, but Harry decided then and there to end this game as fast as possible only to wipe the look of his face. Attention! Madam Hooch, who was standing in the center of the field, shouted loud enough to be heard over the cheers. I want a clean game, from all of you. She pointed at the quaffle with her wand and banished it directly into the air. Harry and the others shot to their positions and the game began with a roar from the crowd. Harry shot in and out of the action, flying right through the three Gryffindor chasers to throw their formations off and avoid Bludger's courtesy of the Weasleys. The snitch was far too fast to see in the chaos, 
so Harry resigned to helping the flow in Slytherin's favor. Wood, even from the other end of the pitch could be heard screaming at McLagan to join in and try to stop Harry from getting in the way of the chasers. Harry nearly snorted when McLagan ignored his captain only to shout his own suggestions that were similarly ignored by the other players. Harry had enough of the support play now that they were at 60 points to Gryffindor's 20. The announcer, a Gryffindor Harry assumed, was clearly biased against Slytherin but the constant shouts from McGonagall managed to keep him in line for the most part. As he got to a high enough vantage point Harry began to scour the field for any small sign of gold. It was less than a minute later that he spotted the snitch curiously close to the teacher's stand. Harry aimed his broom and shot forward with every ounce of power that he could control. The world around him blurred as he flew closer to the snitch, it was within reach only for an instant when his broom stopped with a buck. Harry lurched forward, obeying Newton's law, and off the broom. His Nimbus 2000 wriggled in the air for a moment, but Harry was more concerned with the several hundred foot free fall. With hope and desperation fueling his movements Harry raised his hand toward his broom and called summoned it to him. The broom obeyed and the roars from the entire crowd were nearly painful for Harry to hear as he caught his broom and righted himself before surging back into the air in search of the snitch. Incredible save from Potter keeping him in the game and out of the hospital. Oh no. A nasty foul from the snakes takes Angelina out of the game. What else should we expect from those cheating Slytherins? Jordan. Sorry professor. Harry shook his head and closed himself off from the sounds of the game to refocus on finding the snitch. The score was now 120 to 80 in Slytherin's favor. Harry saw that it was quickly going to go further into their favor as Gryffindor lost one of their chasers to a bludger hit by Flint of all people. Another streak of gold caught his attention but this time another person saw it. McLagan shot forward at the same time as Harry who noticed that his opponent had the same broom as him. Two nimbuses pitted against one another so only skill could take the win. Harry was pleased to see that he was far more in control of the broom than McLagan who was either unable or unwilling to push his broom to the max. Harry was more than willing. Speeds of nearly 100 miles per hour. Harry was again blurring toward the snitch that took a sudden dive toward the ground. Harry followed without hesitation while McLagan dove at an admittedly safer speed. A roar came over the crowd as both seekers dove for the snitch, unfortunately for the house of bravery and courage. Their seeker wasn't brave enough to outspeed Harry in a dive toward the ground. Harry snatched the snitch and pulled up as hard as he could quickly realizing that he was far too close to the ground than he expected. Slytherin's cheers were defining as Harry held the snitch into the air. He was swept up by his teammates when he landed and was surprisingly praised by Flint, who was extremely happy that his team had a capable seeker, not that he was proud of Harry, he made sure to say that numerous times. The defeated and depressed Gryffindor team flew off toward the school while a subdued crowd left the stands. Harry threw his hands up again with a cheer following the example of the rest of his team. Potter. Harry turned to see Professor Snape rushing over to him looking very serious. What happened in the air? I've never seen someone just suddenly stop going at those speeds, he asked. Harry narrowed his eyes in thought. Well I didn't do that, I was about to catch the snitch when my broom bucked on its own. It was only luck that I managed to pull it back to me. In that case I want your broom, Snape said holding a hand out. I will run some test on it to see if it has been tampered with. Harry reluctantly handed over his Nimbus 2000, I thought that Nimbuses were charmed against being tampered with, and I've kept it in my trunk since I bought it. Snape narrowed his eyes, it should have been, but if it wasn't tampered with, he trailed off to himself. I suggest you hurry to the common room. You've earned it Potter. A blur of motion later and he was back in the Slytherin common room with almost all of the Slytherin house celebrating their victory. The older years smuggled in a few barrels of butterbeer from Hogsmeade and were passing around mugs flowing with the fizzing yellow liquid. This just marks the first win, roared Flint. We'll go all the way until that cup stands tall in our house. Cries of approval sounded out in the dungeon as green and silver sparks were shot into the air by some fifth years. Harry was on the receiving end of numerous congratulations by upper years that just a few months ago were looking at him like he didn't belong in their house. Now, thanks to a victory in a Quidditch match against their rivals, Harry was well received in the House of Snakes. Harry's face was stuck in a large grin for the rest of the night as he was the center of attention of his house. Hogwarts 29. 
November 1991 with the midterm exams coming soon all of Harry's classes were doubling down on work. Potions and Transfiguration both pulled out all stops and were determined to weed out the lazy students from the serious ones. Harry was more than ready to prove himself, he was quite far ahead of all his year mates thanks to his summer study and time at school to practice. Professor McGonagall was extremely pleased with his skill at turning a mouse into a snuffbox, which she said was going to be the practical part of their end of term exam. 30 points to Slytherin and an excuse on upcoming homework for Transfiguration freed up a lot of time for his other studies. Not to mention that Harry was becoming extremely popular in his house having been responsible for pulling in nearly a hundred points on his own since the start of school. With the free time he gained from not having to worry about constant Transfiguration assignments he focused on extra charms work. So, he waited after class to speak to the nearest charms master. I see mused Professor Flitwick while twirling his mustache in thought. Well, it's no surprise that you want a challenge, O Minerva was beside herself the other night when she told us about your progress in Transfiguration. Are you interested in anything in particular? Harry thought for a moment, I heard about the under-17 dueling tournaments and thought to have a go at it in a couple years. So, I would say that I'm interested in dueling. Fantastic! cheered Professor Flitwick. I happen to be a rather successful duelist myself and I know just the thing, let me find it. Flitwick waved his wand making a book fly out from the large stack in the corner of the room. It was old and the cover didn't have a name. The small half-goblin professor flipped through the pages before brightening up. This is it, he cried before turning the book to show it to Harry. The spell Protega, the shield charm. It blocks spells and physical attacks, the better and stronger you are the better and stronger the shield useful, but for some reason only duelists like myself and some aurors bother learning it past the basic level. Harry read over the movement and read a brief description of the spell. It was a simple spell, quite basic and seemed to have no real drawback to knowing it, yet if what Flitwick said was true something had too difficult about it. You are wondering why it isn't used more if it is this simple? Guessed Flitwick. Well, learning the spell is easy but mastering it to the fullest extent possible is something that takes a lot of time and dedication. Not to mention the power and control required. So, it's easy to learn but difficult to master, said Harry. Right, beamed Professor Flitwick. I would like to see your progress with it after the holidays. I'll have it down by then Professor, Harry said with a grin. Leaving the charms classroom Harry let out a sigh. He had an excellent challenge for the next few weeks as the winter holidays start on the 17th of December. He would work on the shield charm and try to finish the year in the rest of his class by then so as to free up the rest of his time in school to study whatever he wanted. Harry. The familiar voice of Hermione called as he stepped into the hallway. I heard that you were excused from all assignments in Transfiguration until the end of term exams. You simply must tell me how you got so far ahead. Instead of jealousy or anger at his accomplishment like he expected from his fellow overachiever he was met with a giddy Hermione that looked like he just solved one of the world's problems. She must either hate homework or really want to impress Professor McGonagall, either was likely as she was a bit of a teacher's pet. Oh, I just get bored going at the same pace as the class. Shrugged Harry, I read through all of my course books in the month before school and have been going through the practical part since I've been here. If it wasn't for all the homework then I would have been further in all of my classes but for now it's only Transfiguration, doesn't hurt that it's my favorite class. I read through them as well, committed them to memory even, she said with a rapid shake of her head. No, it must be something else. I haven't even managed the matchstick to quill yet. I've found that focusing on the quill before and during the spell makes it easier, at least at first, until you get the hang of it, said Harry. Hermione gaped at him. I have been focusing on visualizing the change in my head, seeing the matchstick change into a quill not just the quill. No, replied Harry. That's just too much to think about, just focus on what it will be not what it is. For now, that's all we need to worry about, for animate to inanimate you need to worry about both but for inanimate to inanimate only the end product. Of course, she groaned, the book suggests that several times, the various rules for various methods, I should have gone back over the book when I kept messing it up, thanks Harry. No problem, shrugged Harry. You would have figured it out even if I didn't help you anyway. Hermione looked like she was about to argue that when she shook her head. What are you going to do with your spare time, she asked. Keep working until I catch up with my other subjects, 
Professor Flitwick also wanted me to try to master the shield charm. I've read that it wasn't used much, even by Aurors, Hermione said with a raised eyebrow. Another shrug. It's easy to learn but hard to master, also takes a decent amount of power for it to be worth it. I want to learn to duel and it's necessary if I want to have a chance at winning a real duel. Well, I think you'll get it, she said lowly. Your talent with magic is incredible, even other Ravenclaws talk about it. Harry turned away to hide a blush, well, it's just a lot of practice. Muttering the time spell Harry groaned, I have to go Hermione, we'll catch up later. Harry didn't even hear her response as he sprinted through the hallways toward the courtyard. He had promised to meet Hagrid for some tea after class today and was running nearly a half hour late. I'm telling y'all it's fine, Hagrid said with a wave of his massive arm. I was working on something else anyhow. Harry followed Hagrid's eyeline to the fireplace where an egg was sitting in the middle of the flames. It was far larger than any egg he'd ever seen, and it was almost solid black. The shell of the egg looked to be incredibly hard and thick, especially if it was surviving the heat of a roaring fire. Um, Hagrid, what kind of egg is that? He asked dreading the answer. Hagrid puffed up his huge chest, that be a dragon's egg. Won it in a game o cards not long ago. It's why I wanted Yaw to visit, so you could see it. Of course, that's what it was. Hagrid, I should tell you, that the International Confederation isn't going to like this. He told the half-giant gently. A dragon being out of a reserve, especially on a school's grounds, is a very serious offense. They could send you to Azkaban. You need to tell Dumbledore, I don't want you to get into trouble, said Harry worriedly. It was strange enough that Hagrid got what had to be one of the rarest and most sought-after creatures in the world but also one of the most illegal and dangerous. Wait. How did Hagrid win a dragon egg in a game of cards anyway? From what he had heard Draco say. A dragon egg ran close to 20,000 galleons and Harry was sure that Hagrid didn't have that much money. You don't think that de ya, Ari? They wouldn't haul me off ta Azkaban prison for looking after a baby dragon? Worried Hagrid while sending looks to the egg. They would, nodded Harry. But more importantly, who gave you the egg and why? Someone who just happens to have a dragon egg then loses it in a card game. That doesn't make sense. Hagrid tilted his head in confusion. Well, he was down quite a few galleons by that part in the night. Said that if I won the next hand I could have it to square the debt as it were. He was interested in all manner of beasts, anyway, really interested in Fluffy. Fluffy? Asked Harry. I never told y'all about Fluffy? Mused Hagrid. Big three-headed dog? Well, I guess I wouldn't since he's up in the school garden. Hagrid shot Ramrod as he looked away nervously. Harry jerked in surprise at Hagrid's words and more so when Hagrid began muttering that he should have told him that. What's in the school that needs a giant three-headed dog of all things to guard? asked Harry shocked. Hagrid tried to calm Harry, now don't you worry about that, that's business between the headmaster and Mr. Flamel and. I shouldn't have said that, groaned Hagrid again. Harry just rubbed his forehead. He'd heard that name once before but couldn't recall from where, apparently whoever that person was they were connected to Dumbledore somehow. He would look into it the next time he went to the library. That doesn't matter, said Harry trying to snap Hagrid out of his self-scolding. We need to make sure that you don't get sent off to prison for the egg. Hagrid looked worried once again, likely have forgotten about their previous conversation already. Professor Dumbledore helped me with Hedwig so I'm sure he'll help you with your dragon, assured Harry. Er right, Dumbledore's a great man he'll help me out, nodded Hagrid. And the dragon ain't going to hatch for another month or two, the man did say no later than Easter. Then it gives you plenty of time to work it out with the headmaster, smiled Harry Calmer now knowing that the dragon wasn't going to hatch and burn down the. Hagrid, how are you going to raise a dragon in a wooden hut? Hogwarts 6. December 1991 Protega, said Harry as he completed the wand movement. He was rewarded by a thin blue veil of magic sprouting up in front of him. It wasn't going to stop a curse, but it was getting there, maybe a weak jinx. Harry let the spell collapse and took a couple deep breaths. Harry was successful in casting the spell although it took longer than he expected to get down, but now he was realizing the difficulty in managing to make it useful. Unfortunately, it was becoming clear why this spell wasn't mastered that often, one would have to stand in front of jinxes, hexes and curses until their shield was perfected which meant that it wouldn't be at first. 
Harry really didn't want to get jinxed, hexed or cursed if he could help it. But if he wanted to master the Protega then he would need to recruit some help or find a way to cast spells at himself. Harry took stock of the abandoned room to see what he had on hand. It was an empty classroom on the first floor that had a few desks piled in a corner and several chairs strewn about the room. He could make this his own training room but he would need to learn some advanced transfiguration for the items already in here then bring his trunk and learn a locking spell that wasn't undone by the Alohomora. He would look up training equipment, what he would need to buy and what he could make himself, for now, it was off to the library, he needed to look up the spells he was thinking about earlier. Luckily the library was also on the first floor, which was the reason he chose this floor for his room. This part of the castle was void of anyone other than students who were lost trying to find the library so the hallway with his room was almost always abandoned. Back when over a thousand students could occupy the school at a single time this floor was known as the charms floor with several charms classes with a single instructor for each different year. Now, even generations after Grindelwald's war and only a decade after Voldemort, the British wizarding community was still underpopulated thanks to several families being wiped out and most not having more than two children per generation. Weasleys excluded, they made it like rabbits. The library was home to thousands of books that could only be found here, it was home to many books written by illustrious wizards and witches over the centuries. Any book written by a former student was immediately put into the library, a way to show how proud the school was of their former students. Also, the head librarians and headmasters all added books to the library based on what they thought was useful or interesting. The only books that weren't found in the library were advanced subjects that were too obscure or beyond any WT level, obviously anything dark that was beyond theory wasn't in the library and the theory books were in the restricted section and monitored for who checked them out by Madam Pants and Dumbledore. Mr. Potter, do you need any help finding anything? asked Madam Pants the head librarian who was notorious for kicking students out of the library for talking too loudly. I'm looking for advanced transfiguration and training guides, said Harry. Training guides? She asked with a raised eyebrow. For what, training to become a dancer, on how to fly? What boy? Harry rolled his eyes, dueling and anything on oars really, how they train, a guide if you will, he snarked. Follow me. She snapped clearly not a fan of his remark. She led him several rows back, number 12 based on the number on the side of the shelf. Here is the transfiguration section, the higher the row the more advanced. Mostly theory and beginner to novice at the bottom and NEWT at the top. Madam Pants pointed to an open book on a stand on top of the desk in front of the row. This book has the name and location of all the books on the shelf as well as a small description of the books. Now, follow me, she said not bothering to look if he was behind her. She led him further back, row 22, an older girl a Hufflepuff if her robes were colored correctly, with curiously colored hair flipping through a book while sitting on the desk. Ms. Tonks. Desks are not chairs, Madam Pants shouted. Tonks jumped at the sudden shout and managed to somehow fall face first onto the floor. She quickly jumped to her feet while her hair somehow changed to red as she looked away with a blush. Sorry, Madam, she said, it won't happen again, promise. The head librarian rolled her eyes, well, then you can help Mr. Potter here. He has an interest in aura training and dueling. Harry watched Madame Pants go with a raised eyebrow. She didn't even ask if there was anything else she could help him with. He didn't have any more questions, but that wasn't the point. So, you're interested in becoming an aura? A little early to commit to a career, Tonks said as she picked up the book she was reading before Harry and Madame Pants interrupted her. Harry walked over to her and sat on the desk. Well, I wouldn't hate being an aura but I want to learn to duel and see about mastering a spell without getting hurt, he said as he flipped through the index book. Without hurting yourself? She asked as her hair returned to its original pink color, somehow. I'm trying to master the shield charm, explained Harry offhandedly. Tonks groaned as she plopped into one of the chairs in front of the line of the desks. I hate that spell, but all the best orders know it. So, I had to get it down myself, although I didn't try until my fifth year, and you've got it down? Well, I can cast it, but I doubt it will stop anything stronger than a Lumos. Tonks let out a laugh, sounds tough. Harry rolled his eyes, so what's your name and what's with your hair? Tonks, just Tonks. She ground out getting a raised eyebrow from Harry. As for my hair, I'm a metamorphagus meaning that I can change my appearance at will. That seems useful. 
thought Harry out loud. Can I learn that? Is it an advanced transfiguration technique like being an animagus? Tonks grinned at his questions. No, no, you can't learn it. I was born with the ability. Typical. Groaned Harry. Now, any recommendations on mastering the shield charm? Nope. Other than trying to block things and getting used to blocking things with your magic. She said happily. Find a friend or animate a training dummy, but that might be a bit beyond an ickle firsty. Harry's eyes glowed from behind his glasses. Tell me where I can find information on training dummies. Gotta look in your eye, Potter, she said before shrugging. I'll get it for ya. Tonks pointed her wand toward the desired book which floated out from the shelf and down onto the desk. She then did the same for another two books. First one is on Auror training dummies, they fire small paintballs at different speeds and patterns. The second one is on dueling and the last one is on Aurors in general so as to give you some basic knowledge, she said while placing them in his arms. They don't fire spells, asked Harry. Tonks shook her head. No. I don't think a training dummy has been made capable of firing spells on its own since it wouldn't have magic, among other things necessary to cast a spell. But blocking the balls will be enough to prepare your shield for actual spells. Can you help me with that? asked Harry. You seem to want to be an auror and can give me some pointers on dueling. Studying's fun, but I'd rather learn practically if it's possible. Tell you what, she said, leaning back into her chair. After the holidays, if you manage to make the dummy and animate it, and get skilled with your shield. Then I'll consider helping you out. Harry nodded, okay, I'll find you when I get those things done. I look forward to it, she said with a wave. Hogwarts 16, December 1991. Harry had just finished saying his goodbyes to his friends. Blaze had extended an invitation to spend Christmas at the Zabini home, but Harry declined not wanting to impose on another family's holiday. He had to watch several Christmas from a distance in the Dursley home and if he could help it, it would never happen again. However, he did give Hedwig some errands to run, since her maturation the speed in which she could fly was incredible. So, with that in mind he was having her pick up some Christmas presents for a few of his friends then delivering them. Harry estimated that she could easily keep up with his Nimbus if not completely overtake him. Harry wrote down all of his observations in his notebook, hopefully when he got enough information, he would be published in Crazy Creatures catalog. Surprisingly, Harry was the only Slytherin that opted to stay for the holidays. It was both nice and creepy to have the entire Slytherin house to himself. He could finally explore without anyone bothering him or stopping him from entering somewhere. Unfortunately, nothing of note stood out so Harry plopped down on the chair closest to the fire. Being under the Black Lake made the common room very cold during the winter. Harry had foregone his outer robe and decided on wearing the coat he bought during the summer. It looked similar to a coat worn by muggle businessmen over their suits. Harry chuckled to himself when he remembered his uncle complaining that they weren't made in his size. It was thick, was charmed to keep his body warm and had a pocket for his wand. Harry looked through the transfiguration book he checked out from the library. He was trying to master the cup to pigeon transformation. It was the first inanimate to animate spell in the book. His first few tries were unsuccessful, so he was looking back over the book to refresh himself on the theory. This would help in changing one of the desks into a training dummy, which was an inanimate to animate transformation as well. Thankfully aura training dummies weren't that complex, the mechanisms were tough but not as tough as an animal so if he could make a pigeon from a cup, he should be alright. But he did manage the mouse to snuffbox well enough, somehow it only took him an afternoon to manage it, yet the cup to pigeon was coming up on day 6. Dueling was another animal altogether, he couldn't even practice without a partner. Learning offensive spells was important and practicing his accuracy was important as well but the biggest part of dueling was firing spells at another person who would fight back. One couldn't read about that, it was a completely practical art since no one knows how they would react in a situation like that, most think they would be fine, but it was common that most flinch away from oncoming spells rather than try to combat them. Harry felt he was giving himself far too much to do just for a side project for Professor Flitwick, but he was too deep to give up now. Taking out a cup he set it on the table and took a few breaths. Half circle wand movement and a tap on the cup, Daruga. The cup started to morph but after a few moments the cup stopped moving and the only changes were a couple feathers and two wings sticking out of the side. Harry sighed and muttered finite turning the cup back to normal, he managed to add wings so that was a plus. Harry looked down in thought wondering on how to proceed. 
Maybe jumping to inanimate to animate was a little too difficult a leap to make, he had the power to do it, but he was missing something. Foregoing transfiguration for the moment Harry grabbed his charms book. Maybe focusing on a different branch of magic would help him figure out what he was missing. Looking through his textbook Harry settled on a spell that could help bridge the gap for another one. The incendio conjured a jet of flames, it was a second year spell but maybe after mastering it Harry could work on the lightning spell from Adrian's adventure guide. Unfortunately, he couldn't practice shooting fire in his common room, he didn't even want to think about how Snape would punish him for something like that. Mr. Potter, the man he was just thinking about spoke from behind him almost, almost making him flinch. I have looked over your broom, nothing seems to be out of order. Harry turned around to accept the broom from his head of house, thanks for looking into it, do you know why my broom threw me off of it during the game if it wasn't tampered with? I believe that someone in the stands was using a very powerful jinx. Snape looked away for a moment in thought. The protection charms on a high-end broom like yours would mean that it would have to be a very strong spell. So, it wasn't a student, muttered Harry to himself. Snape heard it however and nodded. Do you know who could have and would have done this? I have some suspicions, but until I or the headmaster learn the full truth of the matter I would suggestion caution. Said Snape severely be on the lookout for any out of the ordinary behavior. Harry nodded, I will professor, thanks for the help. Snape nodded tightly and billowed out of the common room without another word. Harry threw his broom over his shoulder and went to take it back to his truck where no one other than him could get to it. Hogwarts, 24. December 1991 Harry walked out of the great hall toward the courtyard with his broom in hand. He wanted to get some flying time with Hedwig since he was making good progress with his projects. Getting outside he was met with six-inch snow lining the ground and a strong wind making it hard to see with all the snow falling. Harry knew that it was foolish to fly in weather like this, but he really wanted to spend time with Hedwig and her favorite thing to do was to fly rain, sleet or snow, Hedwig loved flying. Hey Potter! If it isn't the boy wonder! Harry turned around only to be hit in the face by two snowballs. Shaking his face, he saw two identical Gryffindors grinning at him. A direct challenge. Harry waved his wand over the snow closest to him making several large snowballs then muttering the levitation charm before launching them all at the two Weasley pranksters. The two Weasleys scrambled out of the way but were pelted with huge snowballs knocking them off of their feet. Your wizards, called out Harry while he made more snowball ammunition. He's right, the called at the same time, I'll make them, said the one on the left. I'll throw them, the one on the right added. Let's go, both of them cried. Harry was quickly put on the defensive as large snowballs were banished at him at rapid fire. He tried catching them midair with the levitation charm but only managed to catch one at a time rather than all of them. Come on! growled Harry as he tried to return fire under the non-stop barrage. Three large snowballs were sent across the courtyard at the twins who were too busy attacking and supplying that they didn't see them until they were hit in the face. Grinning at his direct hits Harry went further on the offensive creating more and more snowballs before sending them at the Weasleys. I think that's enough, called Harry victoriously. The two Weasleys jumped to their feet, they sent looks at each other before nodding. Harry had always been curious if twins possessed some sort of telepathy that allowed them to speak to one another mentally. He's right, one said, he won, the other finished. Ickle firsty Slytherin is the champion both of them said simultaneously. Harry watched as the one on the left waved his wand over the snow, a crown of snow compacted and landed atop of his head. Thanks, said Harry, humble for a snake, quite strange. They usually hex, or jinx us, you're not bad Potter, they both finished at the same time. Harry shook his head at the verbal tennis match, it was getting exhausting to watch and try to keep up. Can you tell me your names? I'm Harry Potter if you didn't know, said Harry with a sigh, it was awkward to never have to introduce himself to people since everyone always knew his name. He felt like a jerk having to ask others for theirs every time. Fred Weasley, the one on the left said, George Weasley, the one on the right added. Thanks, Harry said, how come you two didn't go home for the holidays? The Weasleys were known for their huge family so it was strange that they wouldn't spend the holidays together. Our brother works with dragons in Romania, said Fred with a shrug. So, mum and dad took our little sister to visit for the holiday, finished George. 
Harry's eyes widened and a grin spread across his face. Come with me, he shouted before running off. It didn't take long for the three wizards to make their way to Hagrid's hut. Fred and George were confused as to why they were following a first year Slytherin to the gamekeeper's hut, but their curiosity won out. Hagrid, called out Harry before rapidly knocking on the door loudly. What's going on out there? Hagrid's booming voice was heard over the wind. Back fang. I'm coming stop or bang in. Harry stopped banging on the door and took a step back to allow the door to open. Fred and George shared another look but stayed quiet as the large gamekeeper opened the door. Ari, and you two Weasleys, what are you three doing here? asked Hagrid. Can we come in? I can explain to everyone once we're out of the cold, answered Harry. Hagrid nodded and stepped aside for them to get in and all three of the students rushed to the nearest chair by the fire. So, what are you three doing here? asked Hagrid again. We don't know, he told us to follow him, yeah, I did, interrupted Harry before they could do their routine. They were telling me that their brother works with dragons in Romania Hagrid, dragons. Hagrid brightened up, is that right? Then I might need to ask you two for a favor. The twins looked at each other again, more confused than before. Harry saw the look and pointed toward the fire, Hagrid came across that a few weeks ago, we don't want him to be shipped off to Azkaban so we need to get rid of it before it hatches. Whoa! That's a dragon egg, wicked! Both of them said with matching grins. If the two of you could get a letter from me to her brother, I'd appreciate it, said Hagrid hopefully. Sure! They both said. Harry grinned at the turn of events, have you talked to Dumbledore about it yet? He asked the half-giant. Hagrid looked away with a bit of pink on his cheeks, I might have mentioned it to M, he said he'd look into it. Then we just need to finish this on our own, said Harry confidently, I'll write a letter to Mr. Weasley in Romania, don't worry Hagrid I can handle it. Fred, George, I hope that you can tell me how to get it to him. Both of them flashed grins getting a similar one out of Harry, he quite liked the older Gryffindors, they didn't worry about asking questions making this much easier. I'll get the letter to you tomorrow and hopefully we can find a way to send the egg to your brother or for a way for him to come and get it, said Harry. Thanks for all her help Ari, said Hagrid with genuine happiness, and to both of yous, tell that brother of hers thanks from me too. We'll tell him, Fred said. Charlie will be thrilled, added George. To get a new dragon, they said at the same time. Harry rolled his eyes, he was starting to wonder if they were capable of not speaking like that, but with this matter solved thanks to a random meeting with the Weasley twins Harry could get on the road to meeting Hedwig to have a bit of fun flying in the snowstorm. Should be fun. Hogwarts, 25. December 1991 Christmas had never been a good day for Harry. During his time with the Dursleys Harry was made fully aware of the depths of their hatred for him. Dozens of gifts for his cousin, loving family time and Harry was forced to watch and cook them food, it didn't help that they loved to taunt him about not receiving anything other than chores for Christmas. However, waking up in Hogwarts on Christmas was another feeling altogether. First was that he was very cold, the dungeons were nearly unbearably cold, so Harry was forced to use the warming charm on his bed. Second was that when he arrived in the common room there were several wrapped gifts, seeing as how no one else in Slytherin stayed for the holiday it could only mean that they were for him. He had sent all his gifts out a few nights ago through Hedwig. He sent a custom dragon leather wand holster to Blaze who was always forgetting his wand. For Daphne and Tracy, he gave them silver necklaces with their birthstone as the jewel, amethyst for Tracy and aquamarine for Daphne, it was convenient that they were their favorite colors. Hermione was the tough one to buy for, especially since Harry didn't know her that well, so he settled for buying her a book on the history of Wizarding Britain that went a bit further back than their textbook. Harry sat next to the fire and began opening his gifts. The first gift was a book from Blaze, it was a rare book that Harry had been looking for since his first night in Hogwarts. Magics of the mind. Ever since Harry learned from the sorting hat that the buzzing he felt when people stared at him was the mind arts, specifically legilimency, Harry had wanted to learn more. Blaze was the only one he confided in about his search for information on the highly regulated art, it would seem that the Zabini family was more than willing to hand out the book for a friend. Harry, mom told me that this is one of three remaining copies of the book left in working condition, she hopes that this will show you that her intentions toward you aren't malicious. Happy Christmas, Blaze. Harry smiled at the note, it would seem that the Black Widow was very interested in meeting with him, 
far more than he thought. He would have to meet with her at least once, this book could cost hundreds of galleons and was far too valuable a gesture to brush off. Maybe Blaze was a better friend than he thought, not someone trying to use him for his fame, or at least he was willing to give enough incentive that Harry didn't care as much if he was. The next gifts were from Daphne and Tracy. From Tracy he received a wand and broom polishing kit, from Daphne he received a new pair of glasses, black rectangular rimmed and high quality material. He put them on, and his world became far clearer than he realized was possible, his vision was dreadful without his glasses but with them they were acceptable enough to see the follow a golden snitch. Now he was able to see things even more clearly, it was amazing how bad his vision was when he believed it to be normal. Harry picked up the note and began reading it over with his now perfect vision. Harry. These are far most stylish than those dreadful glasses you have now. They are charmed to be unbreakable and self-cleaning from smudges and fog. They will adapt to your eyes as soon as you put them on so don't worry about them not working for you. I hope you toss those ugly round glasses into the Slytherin common room fireplace. Daphne Harry rolled his eyes at the note. Daphne was the most fashion savvy person he knew. Tracy and Hermione were all about function, the latter nearly always wearing her robes. Blaze frequently told him that he should look through some of the Italian catalogues for clothes but never alluded to Harry's clothes being ugly. They were pretty expensive and high end, or so he was assured by Cindy at Timothy's tailor shop in Diagon Alley. Next, surprisingly, was a gift from Hermione, he didn't think that she would bother getting him a gift since they spoke so infrequently. A book, not that he was surprised, Transformation for the Adept in Transfiguration, a new transfiguration book was not unwelcome though. I know it's your favorite subject, so I hope you like it. Happy Christmas. Hermione. A short and to the point note, Harry very much approved and he was very pleased with the book as it could help with the wall he hit on progressing with his inanimate to animate transfiguration. Last was a silky cloak that felt extremely smooth to the touch, like water had been woven into the material. Harry picked it up and flapped it open, it was far bigger and far lighter than he expected it to be. It looked large enough that a full grown adult could be completely covered by the cloak. A note fell from within the cloak. Your father left this in my possession before he died, it is time it is returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. The note was written in very elegant loopy handwriting that was pleasing to the eye. Luckily, the handwriting was familiar to Harry as he had received a note earlier in the year from this person. Question was why did the headmaster have his father's cloak? And why was it special? Running his fingers of the material once more, he felt the magic pulsing through the fabric. Harry wrapped it around body, specifically the lower half, to act like a blanket, but when he looked down, he was shocked that his body had vanished. Harry would have freaked out if he couldn't still wiggle his toes, telling him that he still had a bottom half. He stood up and walked over to a mirror in the corner, throwing the cloak over himself. Harry watched as his reflection vanished from sight. An invisibility cloak. Harry pulled it off of him and ran his fingers over the cloak with even more care. Invisibility cloaks were incredibly rare and immensely expensive, apparently this belonged to his father which likely made it an heirloom. Which made him wonder why his father gave such a valuable and useful heirloom to Dumbledore. He'd ask the headmaster the next time that they spoke. Harry folded up his cloak and put it into his truck, safely hidden at the bottom under his entire wardrobe compartment. The Great Hall was rearranged into a large U-shaped table format to allow all the remaining students and faculty to eat together. Behind all the tables and people was the largest Christmas tree Harry had ever seen decorated top to bottom with ornaments and ribbons that got everyone in the festive spirit. Harry. Two matching voiced called out as he walked into the hall. Fred. George. Happy Christmas. Greeted Harry happily. Happy Christmas. Said Fred. Thanks for the gift. Added George. Harry nodded, he decided, rather last minute to give a gift to the two Weasleys for their help in finding a way to help the dragon problem. He didn't have time to get them a gift, even with Hedwig's incredible speed, so he decided to give them a card with 25 galleons each. About the same amount that he spent on his other friends with the exception of Hermione, hers was only nine sickles, but it was the thought that mattered. It was nothing, said Harry with a wave. I have been worried about Hagrid's dragon problem for a while now. I sent out the letter last night with Hedwig, I hope Charlie replies quickly. He will, said George, anything with a dragon, added Fred. Makes him go crazy, they finished at the same time. Harry let out a sigh, well, 
I'm going to get some food, he said before walking over to the table close to some of the faculty. Fred and George sat down with him while some Hufflepuffs sat across from them talking happily with each other. One of the Hufflepuffs noticed him sitting quietly and turned to him with a carefree smile. Hey, I'm Cedric Diggory, he introduced while the two boys next to him continued to talk to each other. Harry Potter, replied Harry despite knowing that Cedric probably knew who he was. I'm surprised that you're here, most Slytherins run from the castle at the first chance, laughed Cedric. Harry rolled his eyes, most of them have too many ideas ingrained in them from their parents, I happen to like being here. It was no secret that many Slytherins held anti-Dumbledore views thanks to their Death Eater families. Cedric didn't comment on that, so I saw your catch on the pitch, you have a lot of talent. It was more the broom than anything, said Harry bashfully, he was still unused to all the praise especially by people he didn't know well. I heard that you're the best seeker in the school. I look forward to our match, despite it being in May. I won't go easy on you, grinned Cedric. I will say that you don't have to worry about me losing because of your broom. My dad got me a Nimbus for Christmas this year. Have you flown on it yet? asked Harry with a grin. No, way too cold for me. Harry nodded. I tried to fly yesterday with my bird, I think I lasted seven seconds, said Harry, making Cedric laugh into his goblet. So why did you stay at Hogwarts? Switch things up, shrugged Cedric. The past two years I went home for the holidays, but I decided to stay this time. Mom and Dad decided to go out of the country on vacation when I told them. Sounds fun, said Harry, so you're a third year, right? What electives did you take? Harry had been interested in the multitude of extra classes that Hogwarts offered, specifically a seventh year course in alchemy, however, the prerequisites for the class were very steep. Care for magical creatures and ancient runes. Answered Cedric, I was going to take arithmancy, but I'm not interested in spell creation or excessive amounts of homework and study. I like both of those, but I think I'll add arithmancy, said Harry with a grin. I love a good challenge. Well, my class is certainly a good challenge, Mr. Potter, said a woman further down the table. She was wearing silky red robes and had dark brown hair that fell halfway down her back, she had sharp features and looked to be in her thirties. I'm Septima Vector the arithmancy professor, she introduced. So, Mr. Diggory, I'm saddened that a bit of work pushed you away from my class. I had heard you were one of the very best in your year. Cedric blushed at her comment. Well, I, I just, well the study of magical numbers isn't really for me, floundered Cedric after being put under the spotlight. That's understandable Mr. Diggory, I know that a Hufflepuff like yourself wouldn't shy away from a little hard work, said Professor Vector with a smile. Professor, started Harry getting her attention. Who is the alchemy professor? I read that it is only taught to any WT level students, but none of the upper years in my house are taking it. Cedric and Professor Vector looked at him with raised eyebrows for a moment. Well, if the need for the class, meaning enough students that qualify and want to take it, the teacher would be the headmaster as he is the only master alchemist in Great Britain. Are the requirements still O's in Transfiguration and Potions? asked Harry unsure. The class description was a bit outdated considering it was printed in 1924. No, it is O's in Transfiguration, Potions, with at least an ease in Arithmancy, Charms and Ancient Runes. Understandably, there hasn't been an alchemy class in nearly two decades, she explained with a shrug. That sounds really difficult, said Cedric with raised eyebrows. Is it really that complex? I don't know much about alchemy other than Nicholas Flamel and the Dumbledore being alchemists. Harry coughed as he drank his pumpkin juice and would have sprayed Cedric if he hadn't covered his mouth with a napkin. Nicholas Flamel was an alchemist. He was the only known make of the Philosopher's Stone, which meant that Hagrid's giant three-headed dog was guarding the stone. But why was the stone here? Were Nicholas Flamel and Dumbledore close? asked Harry. Yes, answered Professor Vector, the headmaster was taken as Flamel's apprentice during his seventh year and right out of Hogwarts. A master and apprentice relationship were much more than student and teacher, it was a bond that wasn't broken unless one of them died or the master banished their apprentice for actions specified in their contract. That meant that Dumbledore was one of the few people that Nicholas Flamel trusted above anyone else, so it was within reason that he would ask Dumbledore to guard his precious stone. Harry looked down the table at Dumbledore who was happily eating a variety of deserts while speaking with a group of Ravenclaws, 
Professor Flitwick and Professor McGonagall. The man was keeping one of the most coveted objects in existence in his castle and no one knew it. To answer your question, Mr. Diggory, began Professor Vector, alchemy is very complex and difficult. It requires pinpoint control of one's magic and a deep understanding of a variety of magical subjects and the muggle science chemistry. Harry raised an eyebrow at the term, muggle chemistry, he would have thought that it would just be called chemistry considering gold, iron, hydrogen and so on were the same in the magical world as they were in the muggle world. Must be more of the pure blood supremacy, they were incapable of accepting anything a muggle discovered without making it very clear that it was a muggle thing and not magical. Unfortunately, the headmaster is a very busy man so at least five students need to want the class for it to be taught, finished Professor Vector. That blows, muttered Harry. I was interested in taking that class if I qualified, but I don't think there are four others who would be interested in my year. You could always study it independently, said Cedric with a grin. You did say that you liked challenges. Yeah, but I'm struggling enough with my side projects for now, muttered Harry to himself. I guess I'll begin to look into it this summer, said Harry sadly. Professor and student looked at him with a raised eyebrow. Harry quietly made his way to his training room under his new invisibility cloak. He wanted to get in some practice with the incendio spell and try again with his transfiguration project. Also, he couldn't sleep so he was taking a stroll through the castle at night. He was sure that with the new book from Hermione he would be able to make some real headway into his transfiguration project. Arriving at his private classroom Harry immediately levitated anything flammable out of the way of the far side of the classroom so he had a target. The stone wall would be a perfect target considering he doubted that he was capable of damaging the incredibly sturdy Hogwarts walls. Throwing caution to the wind Harry pulled out his holly wand and aimed it toward the wall. Incendio! shouted Harry. The tip of his wand spouted a dark orange orb of magic that increased the heat of the room before it died out. Harry's shoulders dropped and he let out a depressed sigh, he didn't expect the spell to work on the first try but he wouldn't have been upset if it had. Not to be discouraged by failure Harry raised his wand with more intent and concentration. Incendio! said Harry strongly. This time the tip of his wand spat a thin uncontrolled stream of flames that crashed into the wall with no precision or control. Despite the spell barely working Harry grinned and let the spell end as he looked over the damage caused by his spell. A dark mark on the stone and a few dying cinders. Three hours later and several near accidents with his fire spell. Harry collapsed onto one of the chairs with a pleased smile. He had managed to perfectly cast the spell, making a tight stream of flames or causing an object to burst into flames. Now that he managed to master a spell beyond his year Harry was filled with enough confidence to try to transfigure a cup into a bird. He placed a cup on the table and took a deep breath. Intent, power and concentration. Daruga, he said while pointing his wand at the cup. For the briefest of moments, the cup didn't move but soon after the cup began to morph and shift and in the next instance an owl was sitting atop the desk staring at him. Harry didn't react at first before he threw his arms into the air in triumph. Impressive! A voice commented from behind him causing Harry to jump in surprise. Spinning around Harry saw that. There wasn't anyone in the room with him. Looking around quickly Harry tried to figure out if the voice was in his head or not, maybe he was too tired to continue if he was hearing voices. The very air in front of Harry distorted to reveal Albus Dumbledore looking at him with an amused expression. That voice wasn't in your head Harry, he said happily. I must say when students are caught out of bed at night, they aren't caught practicing spells in a classroom, this is a welcome surprise. Well, I wasn't able to sleep and I had a few spells I've been trying to get down for a while, answered Harry airily. Yes, Phileas told me that he challenged you to master the shield charm. A difficult spell and a worthy challenge to someone as talented as yourself. Praised Dumbledore with twinkling eyes. Harry blushed at the praise, I can cast it well enough, but I need to practice blocking things. So, I need to be able to transfigure one of the chairs into an aura dummy, which is inanimate to animate so I've been practicing the Daruga spell, he explained. Dumbledore chuckled at him before conjuring a comfortable looking chair for himself. Well, I wonder where all the fire spells come into that equation. Harry looked at the chair that Dumbledore made with awe, so many intricate designs and it looked very comfortable. He levitated a chair form the corner and tried to transfigure it to look better but was only rewarded by making it sprout a thin cushion on the seat and back. Harry took a seat with a pleased smile, 
his skill in transfiguration always made him pleased. Now to explain to Dumbledore about the incendio training. The fire spells, muttered Harry embarrassed. Well I was stuck on the Daruga so I started on the incendio hoping that working on something else would help, which it did. Also, I wanted to master the fire summoning charm hoping that it would help with a lightning spell I've been looking into for the past few months. I will say that you commit fully to your goals, chuckled Dumbledore, now, lightning spell? Fulman! shouted Harry while aiming his wand toward the wall. Once again, he was only met with static that crackled out of the tip of his wand. Well, Dumbledore muttered. I should tell you that the lightning spell is considered a dark spell. Harry's eyes widened and was about to speak when Dumbledore raised a hand. I'm not telling you to stop trying to learn it, I am telling you this so you know that you shouldn't use it recklessly. Why is it classified as a dark spell? asked Harry, to him it was in the same thread as the fire spell he was just learning. The lightning spell is heavily based in emotion. One needs to want to destroy their intended target. The ministry deems spells that are dangerous and based on emotion to be dark, on the opposite end of that spectrum is the Patronus charm which is heavily based on positive emotions. Explained Dumbledore. That isn't to say that you shouldn't keep trying to learn spells because they are based on emotion either positive or negative. But I will caution you with this. Dumbledore leaned forward. A true dark arts magic isn't something that causes pain or kills, while they certainly do, it is something that makes you need to keep using it. Like an addiction? asked Harry. Precisely, beamed Dumbledore. So, if you ever stumble across a piece of magic like that, I urge you to come and find me at once. Harry nodded, I will sir, I don't have any intentions to delve into that kind of magic to be honest. I've just been looking through Adrian's adventure guide, that's the book that I learned the spell that hurt the troll. I've heard of that book, said Dumbledore thoughtfully, it was quite popular some seventy years ago. It's that old? I got it for a galleon in Diagon Alley, said Harry surprised. Then I would urge you to not tell Mr. Flourish or Mr. Blotz about the treasure you swindled from them. Replied Dumbledore happily. Is there anything else you're working on, if you don't mind my asking? Harry looked down in thought, I've been interested in learning the mind arts and looking into alchemy after I master the shield charm. Dumbledore leaned forward eyes twinkling, mind arts, may I ask why? That is very advanced magic. I've felt people looking into my mind before and when I was being sorted the hat told me what I was sensing was people using legilimency on me. So, I would like to keep my mind to myself, I got a book on it already. Magics of the mind. Explained Harry hoping Dumbledore would understand. I see, whispered Dumbledore. I would exercise caution in learning occlumency and legilimency, they are very taxing on the mind. You're not telling me to stop or asking for the book, whispered Harry surprised. Dumbledore gently shook his head, at your age I was delving into similar subjects and practicing much more questionable magics. I was taught to protect my mind by my mother before my first year. Most magical families give their children at least the basics to protect family secrets. So no, I'm not going to tell you to stop or take the book, as I have my own copy. Now what is this about learning alchemy? Harry perked up at the subject change, I'm fascinated by the admittedly small amount I know about the subject, answered Harry. I was much the same to be honest. Reminisced Dumbledore. I was and still am fascinated by how things interacted with other things and the possible transformations of magic. I haven't put too much thought into learning any alchemy yet, but it was going to be my summer project for sure, said Harry. Then I wish you luck, said Dumbledore for standing and vanishing his chair. Now I must ask you to refrain from sending waves of fire at the castle, I'm attuned to the wards, so I was unsure as to what was happening. Harry looked down to hide his embarrassment, I didn't know that anyone would notice I was using this room. I won't tell you to stop practicing here as I think it's a good idea. I will help you make this room your own," said Dumbledore while waving his wand around the room sending out a wave of magic that crashed into the walls of the room. I'm modifying the wards to ignore your magic so that I don't feel it every time you attack the walls. Harry laughed and looked up at the headmaster gratefully, thank you, headmaster. I didn't think that the wards of Hogwarts could be altered, said Harry. Only by the headmaster of the castle, said Dumbledore. Now I have to ask you to return to bed as it is late and I think that you have undergone enough training for tonight. Harry nodded and put his wand away before walking over to his cloak that was folded on top of one of the tables. Oh, Professor Dumbledore, 
Harry said while turning around before Dumbledore could leave the room. Thank you for the cloak. Dumbledore smiled and gave him a nod, of course, but I was only returning something that belongs to you and your family. Now off to bed. Dear Harry Potter, I will start by saying that it is a pleasure to meet you or write you, rather. From how you have described the egg, wonderfully detailed by the way, we have concluded that you are in possession of a Norwegian Ridgeback. They reach their full size at three months so it's good that you're on top of this. I have approval from by job to retrieve the egg from Hagrid I'm waiting to hear from Dumbledore and the International Portkey Office. Charlie Weasley Harry finished reading the note with a smile, he was glad that the dragon problem was being resolved without much incident. Hagrid was happy that he was avoiding Azkaban and Harry was sure that Dumbledore was happy that he didn't have to worry about a dragon attacking students. Harry, we need to get to potions, Blaze said taking Harry's attention from his letter. Right. Said Harry before gathering his things and following his friend from the common room to the potions classroom. I'm glad we're finally moving on from the more basic potions and on to the ones we're actually going to use outside of school. Said Blaze as they walked into the potions classroom. Harry nodded and as they took a seat toward the front and began to set up his supplies, on the board was the description for the sleeping draft. Harry took out his personal journal, he actually had something for this potion. The addition of pixie dust to the potion before adding the crushed formula would decrease the brewing time by nearly half. It was something that he learned by reading the description of pixie dust and how it affects potions. Harry couldn't wait to see Professor Snape's reaction to his potion when it was done in half the time and was even better than the others. Ten minutes later the class was full, and Snape still had yet to arrive, officially this class started at 8 o'clock in the morning and it was still 7.59. Snape would never waste a second of his time teaching unnecessarily. Potter, said Draco from the table to his right. Professor Snape is holding a meeting in the common room tonight at 8, tell the others if they don't know. Harry didn't know what that was about but turned to Blaze, did you hear him? Yes, do you know what this is about? asked Blaze curiously. No, it may be some sort of announcement, but I don't know, said Harry. The two doors flew open allowing Snape to fly into the room and take his place at the front of the class. As he was walking up, he jabbed his wand at the chalkboard causing a piece of chalk to fly around the board writing the instructions. Today we will be exploring a potion that is as important and relevant as it is difficult, said Snape in his signature low tone. The sleeping draft is notorious among you first years as it takes the entire time, we have to make so you can't try again. This will be marked and graded heavily toward your overall grade. Begin. Harry went to work preparing his ingredients and cauldron and got to work on his potion. Lavender and the standard potion ingredient. Two blobs of flubberworm mucus into the cauldron on a small flame. Crush four lavender sprigs into a mortar. Add standard ingredient to mortar then mix. Pour a third of crushed mixture into cauldron and let it sit for three minutes without stirring. Blaze, said Harry getting the boy's attention. I'm going to alter my potion to make it better and cook faster. I hope you know what you're doing, said Blaze while not looking up from his ingredients. I want you to make enough for two, said Harry, I will do the same, if I'm right then you will be done in half the time but if it doesn't then I won't fail, all right. Blaze turned to him and looked at his gathered ingredients, if it works you will be sharing the altered recipe, he said with a nod. Agreed. Smirked Harry. After three minutes Harry took the cauldron off the heat. Adding the rest of his mixture into the cauldron he then stirred the potion four times clockwise. Harry increased the heat of the flame to halfway between medium and high. Harry put the cauldron back onto the flame then added a pinch of pixie dust then stirred the potion once counterclockwise. Now he had 23 minutes until the rest. The instructions called for 70 minutes on a medium flame. From the energizing nature of pixie dust the potion will mix and mold together in a third of the time. Pixie dust was usually added at the very end of most potions as its effects only last 20 minutes and then it would dissolve into nothing. Harry, have you started the defense assignment? Asked Blaze after he set his cauldron for the 70 minute brew step. I haven't started reading about immediate treatments to werewolf bite. But I have several inches done already on their nature and their natural dangers. I have, I wrote about the wolfsbane potion and the herb aconite being sprinkled over the bite to purge the effects if it is within one hour after being bitten. Other than that, I haven't finished it, there isn't much to write about since there isn't a treatment for lycanthropy other than those anyway, answered Harry. I forgot about the wolfsbane potion, 
groaned Blaze into his hands. Well, that's what's going to fill the last three inches of my assignment then. Snape swooped around the classroom after a couple minutes to look over everyone's potions. He berated several Gryffindors for setting their knives in crooked positions or for not holding their ladles correctly. Harry felt that the pettier Snape's complaints were the better you were doing in class, if he avoided you altogether you were as good as it could get. Today, much like every other potions class, Neville Longbottom was the center of Snape's taunts. Harry almost felt bad for the guy since it was obvious that he wasn't that good in potions and was in the house that Snape hated above all others. Harry thought that Longbottom was acting quite pathetic for blatantly expressing his terror and sadness so openly in class, especially since he should have noticed that Snape got off on it. Harry used to let his emotions control him, back in primary school he would run to teachers whenever he was feeling bad or was being picked on too much, after a while with no change Harry learned to disregard those feelings. After a while Harry thought that suppressing his emotions may not have been a good idea but when he noticed that his relatives were getting more and more frustrated the less he reacted to their torment, the more he controlled his reactions. Harry decided that he would try and talk to Neville after class, if the guy didn't run away because his robes were green that is. Twenty minutes passed since letting his potion brew on the medium-high flame. The potion was a dark maroon showing that it was at the last stage of the brew. Harry added two more measures of standard ingredient to the potion, then cranked the flame up to high. The last ingredients to the potion were four sprigs of valerian in two second intervals. Stir with his silver ladle seven times clockwise. The deep maroon potion took on a silver twinkle. Harry waved his wand over the potion to settle the brew to finally complete the potion. It worked, said Harry triumphantly. Blaze looked over and into his cauldron with raised eyebrows. Looks perfect, if not better than the standard, commented Blaze. Harry grinned, it is, he said before pointing his wand at Blaze's cauldron. Exaro, said Harry making Blaze's potion brew vanish. Take a file of mine and we can get out of here. Thanks, pass me the ladle, he said before filling his file then packing up his supplies. They made their way to Snape all the while getting curious looks from their fellow Slytherins and ones of outrage and envy from the Gryffindors. Snape looked up from his work then extended his hand toward Harry, let's see what you've made Potter. Harry extended his file to the greasy professor. Snape made a humming noise, I see you have actually applied the reactions of individual ingredients into your notes. I suspect pixie dust to expedite the brew. Harry nodded with a touch of smugness at being recognized by his toughest judge. Obviously, Snape noticed that, don't get full of yourself, Potter. He snapped with a surprising about of venom. He took a breath before continuing. You are far from the first to discover this, but be warned it only works for simple potions, nothing past second year would benefit from this method and some brews would actually be damaged by it. You and Mr. Zabini are excused from the rest of class. Walking out of class Harry quickly dropped a note into Longbottom's bag telling him to meet in the library after class. Harry read through an advanced charm textbook used by fourth and fifth year students. While some of the spells in this book Harry would indeed learn in the coming weeks, he was more interested in the summoning charm. In his early life Harry has had several incidents of accidental magic many of which were summoning objects that he wanted but were out of reach and one time when he apparated onto the roof of his school. What Harry wanted to know, was how difficult these spells were and why he was capable of doing them without a wand when he was a little tight. Wandless magic was a difficult subject. Only those with the ability to feel their magic without the aid of their wand, which took most years of meditation and inner focus. Unless you were a curious kid with no friends, a family that wanted no part of their life and endless hours of alone time to think about the strange things that happened to him. Harry was one of those kids, he could feel his magic flowing through him but had no knowledge on actively using it without his wand. Which was why he was reading up on the spell he has unknowingly been using for years. The summoning charm was deceptively easy, only requiring intent and magic strong enough to support the object in question. The wand motion was simple, and the incantation was short and easy to remember, hardest part was picturing what you wanted in your mind and making your magic bring it to you without eye contact. Harry pointed his wand at a book at the other end of the desk, Accio, said Harry and unsurprisingly the book shot toward up from the stack and flew into his hand. Yup. A deceptively easy spell and since Harry knew that he had done it in the past without even a wand Harry had no doubt in his ability with a wand. Next Harry set his wand down and raised his hand toward another book in the stack. 
Accio. The book wiggled and rose from the stack with a noticeable wobble as if it was being pulled into the air by thin strings. Then a moment later the book fell back onto the stack and didn't move again. A little tougher but at least something happened, maybe if he. Potter, an unsure voice called from other side of the section, did you give me a note to meet here? He was noticeably tense and looked ready to bolt. Yes, I wanted to talk to you for a while and today seemed like as good a day as any said harry while gesturing to the chair on the other side of the table he was at neville took a seat but still looked unsure so he started right harry started i noticed how people treated you at least in potions so i wanted to tell you that you needed to stop letting everyone walk all over you snape and malfoy are only the first sharks to target you and they won't be the last neville actually flinched at snape's name how unimpressive that snapped harry making neville jump don't fear Snape's name, if you constantly react to their taunts then they will keep doing it. I can't help it I'm not like the others, I'm not brave, said Neville with slumped shoulders. You're right, said Harry with a nod making Neville snap his head up at Harry, obviously you're a terrible Gryffindor, or you were such a coward that the hat thought you needed to be in Gryffindor to help you grow a spine, said Harry thoughtfully. So, I think maybe you should start reacting less to Malfoy, like flinching or avoiding eye contact or stuttering. Things like that are like food to him. Snape is a different story, since you seem to genuinely fear him so for now just try to suppress what you feel in front of him or ignore him. How are you in your other classes? Asked Harry seeing that his suggestions were having the opposite affect than he was hoping. Harry was hoping that his not so subtle insults were going to light a fire making him lash out but maybe the insults had more merit than Harry originally thought. On to strategy 2. Prove that Neville was skilled in other subjects and potions were just not his forte. Um, well, I'm good in herbology, stammered Neville. Harry leaned forward waiting for more than blinked when Neville didn't add more. That can't be it. Harry said disbelievingly. Neville looked down, most of my family thought I was a squib until I got my magic, so I guess my magic just isn't strong enough to do most of the things people like you can do. There is your problem then, said Harry with a nod. You put way too much thought into what everyone thinks about you to the point you fail before you try. If people thought I was a freak or a waste of space or wanted nothing to do with me then I would ignore them and know deep down that they were wrong. It helped that what Harry was saying was completely true and had actually happened to him, made his advice actually have merit. But Gran as always, doesn't matter, snapped Harry before Neville could add to his self-deprecating tirade. Magic is mostly based off of intent so if you think that you'll fail then you will. Also, if your grandmother believes that you're a failure then tell her that she's wrong and then become a strong wizard to prove her wrong. I don't know if I can do that, Neville said while surprisingly looking Harry in the eye, my gran wants me to live up to my father's reputation as a powerful or, so she's always been tough on me. But I just can't, no matter how much I try I just, can't. This time Neville wasn't his pathetically sad self but more resigned and tired. Harry felt for him since this seemed like the source of the cowardly Gryffindor's problems. Not to mention it seemed to be a genuine problem that Harry was in no way prepared for. He was expecting shy and timid not damaged, like him. Harry had no idea how to help Neville with this, so he was going to wing it and hope for the best. I think you should tell this to your grandmother. I think you should write everything you feel, from your anger to sadness and tell her. If she is only more upset by them then you don't need her if not she'll hopefully realize her mistakes and change, proposed Harry. Harry knew that he was basically pushing away Neville's problems after asking to hear about them, but they were far more real than he expected, and Neville wasn't like Harry with an unyielding will to suppress and ignore his feelings. Neville seemed to have been beaten down by his family's expectations and lack of empathy for his shortcomings, they were different yet the same. Harry would do his best to be there for Neville if the Gryffindor wanted his help. But I will help you if you need it, said Harry hoping that his Slytherin robes would put Neville off of a simple friendship. Really? asked a surprised Neville making Harry smile. Yes, nodded Harry, but please write to your grandmother about what you think. I would also like to hear what she says. Harry took out his defense textbook and opened to a new page that had a useful curse on it. He would show that Neville was capable of magic by tutoring him on a spell. Nothing boosted confidence like mastering a spell that was giving you trouble. Neville. I want you to try this, the leg locker curse, said Harry showing Neville the page. Neville looked unsure, I've tried it, but it never works right. Then use it on me and believe that it will work, 
I'll see if you're anything messing up, said Harry getting up and standing in front of Neville who took out his wand. Just do it, said Harry bracing himself for the curse. Neville took a breath and took out his wand then pointed it at Harry. Locomotor Mortis, he exclaimed going through textbook wand motions and his eyes showed perfect focus. Harry turned away from the spell but after a second he only felt a slight tickle in his legs. Looking down Harry frowned, this wasn't right, Neville did it perfectly and his focus was as good as anyone's. See, nothing works for me, muttered Neville putting his wand away. Harry frowned and sat down next to Neville who was looking at him strangely. Your focus was great, and technique was as good as it could get but something didn't work. I don't think it's you maybe your wand has a crack in it. From what I've learned about wands a crack can make magic destabilize and cause spells not to work properly. Theorized Harry aloud. Neville's eyes tightened at the mention of his wand. This wand is in perfect condition. I polish it every night. He snapped with clear fire in his eyes. There it is. Grinned Harry seeing the repressed lion coming out a little bit, but I'm serious about something being wrong. What branch did Ollivander say that your wand was predispositioned to when you bought it? Maybe defense magic isn't your wand's forte. Maybe it's aligned more towards charms or transfiguration not combat. Wondered Harry while looking at the wand. This is a combat wand, snapped Neville again. But I didn't get this was from Ollivander it was my father's. He whispered looking down at his wand. Harry frowned in thought. May I hold your wand? He asked gently now knowing why Neville was so touchy about the wand. Neville very reluctantly handed over his wand. Harry ran his hands over the wand. It was longer than his wand likely over 12 inches and the core felt very different than his phoenix core. The magic felt like a perpetual storm not the inferno of a phoenix. It was likely a dragon heartstring as unicorns were known to be very calming, while dragons favored power and strength and didn't yield lest they were won by a superior wizard. Neville wasn't an Auror so the wand likely wouldn't obey him especially since he didn't win it off of his father rather was using it out of a sense of sentimentality. You need your own wand that chose you. For example, Locomotor Mortis, said Harry casting the curse at Neville. Unlike in class or in practice where the spell worked for him perfectly, the only thing the wand did was light up at the tip and sputter out after a second. I mastered this spell on the first day in class, said Harry while handing the wand back to Neville, the wand didn't choose me so it wouldn't obey my commands, I know very little about wands so I may be wrong, but I think you should talk to Professor McGonagall about getting your own wand. This doesn't make sense, said Neville looking at the wand strangely, Gran could use this wand easily before she gave it to me, said that it would accept a true longbottom. I don't think that's how wands work, added Harry with a raised eyebrow at the image of the elder longbottom that was building in his head. She didn't sound very pleasant or flexible. But she must have very strong magic to be able to win over a powerful Auror's wand without actually winning it off of the deceased man. Maybe you're right, muttered Neville, I will talk to Professor McGonagall, see what she has to say. And write to your grandmother, added Harry seriously, but wait until after you hear about your wand. Harry was sure that Neville was going to be very upset if it went how Harry expected. Oh, started Harry before Neville could leave, if you want. We can meet here to study after potions on Fridays. I don't like herbology very much other than learning about ingredients for potions, so I will say someone who enjoys the subject could help me. In return, I can help with whatever you need. Harry was top of every other class, so it was up to Neville on what he needed. Neville's eyes widened, really? Yes, that would help a lot. See you later then, said Harry with a smile. Slytherin House was notorious for its secrecy on the inner workings of the house. Salazar Slytherin was credited by being a pureblood supremacist and wouldn't allow anyone less than a prominent half-blood into the house. Nowadays half-bloods were common in the house, but it had been centuries since a muggle-born was sorted here. Not even headmasters of the school knew the inner workings unless they had been in Slytherin during their time in school. On the outside, Slytherin was a unified house that stood up for their own and didn't take anything from anyone. No one knew how it went on the inside, not even the first years, yet. Harry and the other first years were all gathered in the common room waiting for their head of house to arrive for the meeting. Potter, do you know what this is about? asked Malfoy who plopped down next to Harry. Harry looked at him bemusedly, no, but why are you asking me? Malfoy shrugged, you know a lot of people, something I've noticed I failed to accomplish, said Malfoy while glaring at the table in front of him. 
You're not the most approachable guy, snorted Harry while gesturing to the two large first years who were a few feet away looking at them. The outbursts against anyone not rich and pureblood don't help either. Malfoy glared Harry then sighed, I don't hate non-pure bloods, but it doesn't help growing up with my father. I was raised as the Malfoy heir and was taught how to act since birth. Harry was about to say something, but Malfoy cut him off, I don't like Granger because she's annoying and don't say she isn't, being a mud. Muggle-born doesn't help her argument either. Harry rolled his eyes, she's very, enthusiastic but give her a break she's only known about magic for a few months. As have I for that matter, I just internalize a lot of my thoughts, said Harry. Whatever, Potter, said Malfoy before turning away. Snape chose that moment to arrive to the common room and the room as a whole silenced instantly. Harry had to admit that he was impressed with Snape's presence, it took a lot to silence a group of eleven-year-olds. Welcome. He started only loud enough to be heard if everyone else was silent. This will be your official introduction to Slytherin House, years ago this meeting was given after the first week. But I figured that it took longer than that to get an impression on each of you. Slytherin House is a house of nobility not of blood necessarily but of talent and notoriety. So far only four of you have stood out in your studies as being worthy of this house. Potter you are top of the entire first year, Greengrass and Malfoy. Both of you are in the top ten and Zabini is right behind them. The fact that three of you are in the top ten is impressive considering the bookworms of Ravenclaw hold weekly study sessions with higher years helping the younger ones. Adding to that, we in Slytherin look out for our own, if you are struggling. I urge you to go to Potter and if he doesn't know how to help then to an upper year. If the situation is not solved by then my office is welcome as long as you have tried to solve your issues beforehand then I will always help. Only those who try to solve their own problems then ask for help will receive it here. Moving on to Howe's inner conflict, thankfully I haven't had to deal with any of you fighting with one another, but should something arise that needs to be settled physically I expect you to bring the situation to a prefect who will notify me, tonight. I will take you all to see a dispute being settled between two fourth years to show you how it works. Lastly is inner house ranking, every year before fifth year has one or two students that are in charge. I usually give it to the one or two students that stand out, fifth years and up the roles are obviously given to the prefects. For you all Potter is leader, he is as I mentioned top of the year and had shown skill beyond that of first years. Increasing your academic ranking is a good way to become a designated leader, as of now there isn't a co-leader or second in charge but closest to the position would be Ms. Greengrass and Mr. Malfoy. The conflict resolution you all will witness is another way to rise in ranking. Students can challenge others for positions such as year leader or if you are on the Quidditch team the captain can be challenged for the position. Are there any questions so far? Asked Snape after finishing his long-winded speech. Harry raised his hand, what is my role exactly? Being a leader didn't actually make sense considering he didn't have any real authority as a first year. He was also in shock that Snape was talking about him so favorably, but he guessed that Snape couldn't exactly lie, Harry was top of the year based on midterm exams. Helping your year mates with anything they need should they ask or next year to assist the younger years with similar things should it be asked of you. Consider yourself an unnamed prefect with authority of your current and younger years within Slytherin House. Also, I will be speaking to your year through you. So if there is another meeting like this, I will notify you to notify your year mates. Answered Snape cordially further surprising Harry. Harry nodded, understood. Now if you will all follow me, we will be going to one of the many secrets of this house. The dueling rooms. Said Snape with a grin. Snape went to the corner of the common room that had a large panting of a knight sitting regally on a throne. Senatus said Snape to the painting which the knight nodded before the painting swung out from the wall revealing cobblestone steps leading deeper beneath the school. Snape led them down and the further down Harry got the more shouts and yells he could hear. Once at the bottom they were shown a massive room that had numerous stands with enough room to comfortable sit the entirety of Slytherin house if there were over 200 students in the house, at the center of all the stands was a dueling arena. Most of Slytherin house was already sitting in the stands waiting for the duel to begin. Already standing on the arena was a fourth year boy and girl. The boy was wearing his school uniform without the robe and was running his fingers over his wand while glaring at the girl. The girl was in casual clothes while staring at the boy seemingly unimpressed by his glare. Take a seat in the stands and observe, ordered Snape while gesturing to a section that was unused. 
Harry walked over and took a seat on the bottom level with Draco and Blaze flanking him on each side. Snape took to the center of the arena getting a hush from the entire Slytherin house. We are here to settle the dispute of leadership of our fourth year housemates. Current leader Ms. Ella Wilkins has been officially challenged by Mr. Wallace Wallingworth for the current leader position. Any other claims? He asked the two standing at each end of the arena. The girl, Ella Wilkins, shook her head with noticeable apathy while Wallace Wallingworth glared at her. No sir let me put her in her place. He shouted getting a very small number of claps from a small group of boys the same age as him, likely his only supporters. Very well, no killing or maiming and the duel ends with a disarm or incapacitation. Begin, said Snape before walking to the side. I heard that Wilkins was a top five duelist in the last England U-17 tournament. Wallenworth family isn't worth much from what my father has said, only the current head has done anything of note other than donate to better politicians commentated Draco. Wilkins's family? asked Harry while Draco was willing to give out information, Harry would be first to say that he was ignorant to many if not all magical families' achievements. All he knew was that the Potters were an ancient and noble house that was wealthy enough for Harry to be accepted into Slytherin, he was also one of the few ancient and noble heirs in the house at the moment. Not ancient but noble, they've only been around for about 300 years but have had many noteworthy witches and wizards. I think her great great grandmother was the headmistress of Hogwarts, answered Draco. Harry nodded, that was interesting to know, he didn't think about previous headmasters or how the school used to be ran, something that he would have to look into. For some reason, he kept thinking that Dumbledore was going to outlive him, the old man had to be over 150 and didn't look to be weakening or slowing down due to age. Wilkins and Wallenworth gave each other a slight bow. Before even a second could pass, Wallenworth shouted out stupefy while Wilkins batted it away and replied with her own. Wallenworth was unprepared for his spell to be unsuccessful and only just managed to dodge the retaliation. Wilkins pushed her offense with a call of reducto, the ground in front of Wallenworth exploded, causing him to cough and run out of the cloud of dust and debris. Another shout from Wilkins, this time Defindo, launched a yellow streak of magic that caught Wallenworth on the leg slicing deep enough for a large gash to effectively immobilize him. I won't say I'm disappointed, Wallace, this was about as well as I thought you would do, said Wilkins with disinterest, stupefy. Wallenworth, despite only firing one spell and lasting less than a minute in the duel faced the oncoming spell without flinching. Harry thought he could have ducked and retaliated but Wallenworth's spellcasting wasn't as quick as Wilkins's so it likely wouldn't have mattered. With the stunning charm hitting its mark, the duel was ended with mild applause sounding out, most talking amongst themselves after the duel proved to be heavily one-sided. He was sloppy, and she didn't even take him serious, noted Harry, I don't know what made him think he could beat her. Pride, said Blaze with a shrug, she has a known family name and talent of her own as well as recognition in the national dueling circuit, he was likely jealous. This certainly didn't help the Wallenworths prove their worth snorted Malfoy to himself while looking pleased with his word play. I want to give this a try, said Harry with a look in his eye. I'll need to look into more offensive spells after I'm finished with my current project, but I definitely want to start dueling. Harry already made a mental note to look into all the spells used in the duel, the only one he was unfamiliar with was the stunning charm which was beyond third year since he's already given his charms textbook a full read through. This summer was going to be a busy one if he didn't finish his shield charm training soon, it would seem that he would give the training dummy spell another couple goes tonight, he was getting close but not quite there. Then he would need to find Tonks, she did say that she would help him with his dueling. After another challenge this time a third year that was somehow less interesting than the last the entire Slytherin house all filed out of the large arena toward the common room. Harry made his way to his trunk to get his cloak to get in another night of training. Seeing a duel got a fire started in his gut. Hogwarts, 19, January 1992. Harry sat in the library waiting for Neville, he had asked Blaze and Daphne if they wanted to come but both had other things they needed to do. Apparently, Daphne and Tracy were going to practice some spells with an older Slytherin while Blaze liked to be alone every now and then. Neville showed up a few minutes later with a letter in hand, she wrote back, he said while taking a seat. Harry nodded. About a week ago Neville finally worked up the courage to write to his grandmother, under Harry and Professor McGonagall's insistence. 
The Gryffindor head was appalled that Neville went this long without a proper wand when his family had plenty of money to afford a new one. What did she say? asked Harry too curious to wait for Neville to elaborate. Nev, I'm truly sorry, started Neville with a small smile. I was hoping that tough love would bring out that fire I know is in you, but it would seem like that method had the opposite effect. It was how I raised your father, but I now realize that he had your grandfather to balance it out. It broke my, so I'm sorry and I give Minerva permission to take you to get a wand. Neville obviously skipped the more personal stuff, but Harry could guess what was said. The Longbottom family was likely to repair itself now that Neville spoke up about his issues. I'm glad, said Harry with a smile. Now you won't be hopeless with your spell casting. Laughed Harry already having grown tired of trying to teach Neville spells while he was using his father's wand. Ha ha. Professor McGonagall said we could go today after potions, so we won't be able to study today. Said Neville sadly. While this was only the second official study meet both had grown to appreciate the time to be with people outside of their house. Harry shook his head, no worries, tell me what kind of wand you get tomorrow. Neville rushed off to meet with McGonagall while Harry went back to studying advanced transfiguration to take his mind off his Quidditch match against Ravenclaw coming up in February. Sitting atop a lone table was a chair that Harry found himself glaring at with actually hatred. He has been in his training room for the past two hours and the last five attempts have been partially right, but the firing mechanisms weren't fully operational. Taking a calming breath and a sip of tea that had been provided by a house elf Harry looked back at the chair. This time for sure, Mudo Makina, said Harry with a W-like wand motion. His holly wand heated up under the influence of the phoenix core as the tip glowed with a green light that shot at the chair. Harry pictured and thought of an aura training dummy with perfect mechanisms and his magic did the rest, the chair morphed and an instant later a perfect dummy was sitting and spinning atop the table. Finally, it only took two months, said Harry to himself, activate. The dummy's arms swung quickly and from the tips of its forearms paintballs shot out at inconsistent patterns. Harry ducked under the first few but was pelted by seven more. Deactivate. The dummy stopped firing and Harry looked down at his filthy clothes with a sigh, can a house elf come here, please? An instant later there was a pop and a small house elf looked at him expectantly, how may Mipsy help you? I'm Harry Potter, can you get me a spare set of clothes from my wardrobe and bring it here, please? asked Harry knowing that saying please was the best way to get a house elf to help you quickly. Of course. Mipsy will get it for young master Potter now. The elf left in a pop and a couple seconds later on one of the desks on the other side of the room a neat pile of folded clothes appeared. Instead of changing out of his clothes Harry stayed and prepared himself for another round of practice. Activate. The dummy sprang into action and Harry activated his shield. The first two paintballs bounced off but the third broke through. Harry reactivated the spell and continued to block and deflect the balls occasionally reapplying the spell while other times he would deflect them with his wand. A sweaty and pleased Harry collapsed into one of the chairs in the room, he was getting the feel of using the shield charm, he needed to add magic to the shield after every block, depending on what hit the shield, would affect how much magic he needed to add back into the spell. Harry changed out of his paint covered clothes and made his way to the great hall, it was only 7 so dinner should still be out. Hopefully he could find Tonks, most of the older students ate later to avoid the younger ones. Walking into the great hall he went straight to the Hufflepuff table getting a few looks from some of them. Luckily the person in question was easy to spot, pink hair stood out after all. Tonks was talking to another seventh year girl that spotted and pointed at him making Tonks turn around, when she spotted him, she grinned and waved him over. If it isn't my favorite first year Slytherin, she said gesturing for him to take a seat, since it was towards the end of the allotted dinner time there was plenty of room on the table. I've finished it said Harry proudly while piling a comical amount of food onto his plate. I got the training dummy to work perfectly and my shield is pretty solid. Tonks tore her eyes from his mountain of food before processing the word he said. Wow, that's impressive, she said with blue hair. When I told you about all that I honestly didn't expect you to manage, I actually gave up on the training dummy after a few days myself. Maybe I don't need your help then, muttered Harry while steadily eating his pile of food. Pratt. She yelled while smacking his arm with red hair. Tomorrow we'll meet in front of the library to practice before dinner. Then you can show me what you got. 
Harry could tell that she was telling him to go away but he had too much food on his plate to walk away with a clear conscience. This pork is great. Harry told her with a mouth full of food and eyes full of mirth. Hogwarts. 7. February 1992 Keep it up! shouted Tonks firing stinging jinxes and severing charms back to back at Harry's shield. Harry grunted as he quickly blocked all the spells making sure to put his wand at the point of impact of the severing charms. Tonks taught him that he should have something physical to meet the stronger spells as it hardens the shield and increased the density of the shield because of the dormant magic in wands and his body. Stupefy, said Tonks switching up the spell onslaught while adding a couple non-verbal spells to mix Harry up. Harry managed to block the stunning spell a one of the non-verbal spells but the rest broke through, he was stung twice then stunned still. A blur motion later Harry was revived and saw a laughing Tonks sitting in a chair next to him. How'd I do? He asked while rubbing his head, not as bad as you should have, she said honestly, I will say that I didn't think you would have been able to block a non-verbal as those take a lot more focus to block since you don't hear your opponent cast them. Harry grinned and nodded, awesome, now I can go to Flitwick. I suspect he didn't expect me to master it this year. I wouldn't say mastered since you still have to speak the incantation. You only master a spell when you can cast it without a sound, lectured Tonks. Well, then for now it's mastered, shrugged Harry, I don't plan on working on non-verbal until next year at the earliest. Now can you give me a few tips on offensive spells, I've managed the stinging jinx and severing charm, but the stunning spell isn't working, and neither is the disarming charm. Stunning is all about intent and power. Disarming is wand motion and intent it's all in the wrist. Said Tonks while going through the motions of each spell. Other than that, just practice a lot and you should get it. But I think today is going to be our last day. Harry nodded sadly, yeah, I can manage on my own now since I don't need a partner to practice anymore. I hope we're still friends and not just teacher and moving target. Tonks snorted at the moving target line, of course we're friends. She looked thoughtful for a moment. I think we're actually related. Your grandmother was a black and so is my mother or was I guess, she looked angry as she said that. Black? As in serious black? Asked Harry with wide eyes, he was related to a mass murderer? Yeah, most pure bloods are all related a bit, but you are actually a black from the main line since your grandmother was Arcturus Black's younger sister who was the head of the family until three weeks ago, said Tonks. I didn't know I had living relatives, magical ones at least, said Harry in shock. Don't get excited, technically you and I are related just as close to your yearmate Draco Malfoy who mother is my mother's younger sister. The black family was large and very rich and very noble and very ancient, everyone wanted to marry one, she said with disdain. Harry noticed the emotion, it was easy after all since her hair was blood red, I take it you don't like them. They disowned my mother because she married and had me with a muggle born. They were a very pure blood supremacist family, she said. I see. Muttered Harry in thought. I should go, he said before rushing out of the room. Tonks nodded and followed him out of the room before heading in another direction. Harry was making his way to the Slytherin common room while thinking about a letter he received a week ago that made a lot more sense after that talk. The Slytherin common room was relatively empty since dinner was still going and the older years were still eating. Draco and Pansy were the only first years in the common room, both of them were working on a history essay. Draco, said Harry getting both of their attention, Pansy looked at him with a sneer while Draco was mostly curious. Did you know that we're related? He asked curious if Draco actually knew or not. Pansy glared at him while Draco looked thoughtful, Malfoys are from France until three generations ago so it must be mom, oh, Doria Black was your grandmother, she was my great aunt. Apparently a seventh year girl in Hufflepuff, Nymphadora Tonks is your first cousin as well said Harry wanting to see Draco's reaction. Draco looked very surprised, really, I know Bellatrix didn't have any children so it must be Andromeda. He looked down after saying that yeah, mom used to talk about her a lot saying that she missed her older sister, but couldn't talk to her because of dad and grandfather not liking to associate with a disowned witch. That's dumb, said Harry before running to his room while shouting, I'll be right back. Harry rifled through his trunk looking for a letter he got last week from Gringotts. Apparently, he needed to meet with them soon to discuss something important regarding his inheritance. 
Draco and Pansy looked at him strangely as he plopped down next to them with a letter. Normally he wouldn't tell anyone about something this private, but Draco was his best bet to explain it since he was actually family, convoluted family tree notwithstanding. Harry read aloud. Listen to this, dear Mr. Potter. It has come to our attention that you have been declared the sole heir of an ancient and noble family. You are required to meet with me to confirm the contents of the will. Send a reply as soon as possible. Sharp Tooth, banker and manager of all ancient and noble houses. What do you make of that? Asked Harry already knowing now that it was the black family but didn't understand why he was the sole heir, his grandmother on his father's side was a black not either of his parents. It didn't make any sense and it was starting to drive him up the wall. Hopefully Draco knew more since he was a part of that pure blood community. My father will want to hear about this. Muttered Draco to himself. This time the familiar words weren't a threat to someone. I guess your godfather made you his heir for some reason. Godfather? And most godparents without children of their own make their godchildren their heirs, said Harry. You don't know, snorted Pansy getting a flat look from Harry, he didn't like her in the best circumstances, and this wasn't even close to one of those. Sirius Black was named your godfather, father said James Potter and Sirius Black were basically brothers, said Draco with a shrug. Harry leaned back in shock, that made no sense, why would someone that close to his parents betray them to Voldemort? He would need to hear what the will said, maybe that would give him some insight, for now, he needed to think on his own. I see, said Harry before going back to his room to get his cloak, it was already past curfew so he'd need to be discreet, Filch would love to give him detention at the earliest convenience. Hogwarts, 10. February 1992 The halls were completely silent tonight, only sounds were some of the portraits snoring in their sleep. This was the second night that he had taken to walking the halls alone, he had sent a reply to Gringotts this morning to make a date to meet with his account manager. For now, he just wanted to be away from Draco who was suddenly very interested in hanging with him and Blaze, still the same Draco though so Harry wasn't very interested in his company yet. A light at the end of the hallway and the sounds of two people wrestling got Harry's attention. Getting closer Harry heard Snape's angry monotone. I know what you're up to quarrel. You'll never get it. Sneered Snape holding his wand to the defense professor's throat. S. Severus the first A. Assure why why you I O only want T to help P protect T T the stone, begged Quirrell, slightly pathetic in Harry's opinion. Well, I know it was you who cursed Potter's broom during the first Quidditch game. I also know that you only came back to Hogwarts when you heard what was being kept here. I don't subscribe to coincidences. After every syllable Snape sounded more and more dangerous and Harry actually felt intimidated from twenty feet away under an invisibility cloak. SSSS Severus, stop that act, it's not even consistent, snapped Snape, shocking Harry, he had bought the stutter for the most part. I, 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 I assure why you I, I it is not, cried Quirrell. Snape grew tired of the conversation and threw the defense professor away. I'm watching you, Quirrell. With that Snape billowed away without a sound, although he didn't leave in the direction of the dungeons. Harry stood completely still trying to make sure his breathing wasn't heard by the recovering Quirrell. Harry was about to quietly walk away when he heard something strange. Severus is no fool. A voice hissed, he will kill you at the first chance, you have failed me once again. No master I didn't I will get the stone tonight when Dumbledore leaves the school for the ministry. Pleaded Quirrell without a single stutter in his voice. Pray you succeed, otherwise, I'm sure you can figure it out, threatened the hissing voice. Harry felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up at the threat. Quirrell looked to be in worse shape having been the target of the threat. I won't said Quirrell for the first time with a genuine stutter. As soon as Quirrell turned the corner of the hallway and his footsteps were no longer heard Harry ran toward Dumbledore's office. Arriving at the Griffin statue Harry threw off the cloak. Let me in. I need to speak with the headmaster. Headmaster Dumbledore is away from the castle on ministry business. The griffin said in a monotone, Harry pushed down the impressiveness of the statue's enchantment to think of another plan. Dumbledore was already gone, which meant that Quirrell was going for the stone now, he needed to act. The stone was too powerful to leave in the hands of a dark wizard, and he was sure the voice was worse than the average dark wizard. Harry knew that Snape wouldn't believe him not to mention he didn't know where Snape was going in the first place, he didn't have time to think about it he needed to act now. 
Harry whistled while pulling out a small bit of parchment and a quill. Writing a note to Dumbledore Harry gave it to Hedwig who appeared in a blur of silver after hearing the whistle. Take this to the headmaster, hurry please, Harry said frantically. Hedwig gave a trill before disappearing in a blur of silver and white. Harry made a mental note to look into her new abilities but pushed that thought away to throw on his cloak and run to the third floor corridor. How did I get into this situation? asked Harry to himself seeing a snoring three-headed dog that looked about as big as a house. Thankfully the dog was already asleep, so Harry tiptoed to the trap door right in front of the dog and gently opened it. The giant dog started to wake up from the movement, so Harry threw it open the rest of the way and jumped down. He heard extremely loud barks but landed safely on the hard stone floor. Harry rubbed his backside from the 15-foot drop before getting back up making sure to stay under the cloak. He didn't know what else was down here so he was going to play it as cautiously as he could. Walking through the room he was met by a large hallway lined with torches that bathed the cold stone in warm light. A troll twice as large as the one from Halloween was snoring in the corner of the room and Harry made sure to quietly go through the room so as not to disturb the dangerous creature. He closed the door behind him slowly making sure not to make a noise. The next room was a large chessboard that was missing a single piece on the black side. Harry ignored it and walked through while still under his cloak. The chess pieces didn't react to him while under the cloak, so he went through the door on the other side. At the center of the next room was a table with several potions, when he got close to the table black flames erupted in a ring around Harry. On the table was a note. Danger lies before you, while safety lies behind. Two of us will help you, whichever you would find. One among us seven will let you move ahead, another will transport you back instead. Two among our number hold only nettle wine. Three of us are killers, waiting behind a line. Choose unless you wish to stay here forevermore, to help in your choice, we give you these clues for. First, however slyly the poison tries to hide you will always find some on nettle wine's left side. Second, different are those that stand on either end. But if you were to move onward, neither is your friend. Third, as you see clearly, all are different size. Neither dwarf nor giant hold death in their insides. Fourth, the send left and the second on the right. Our twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Harry rubbed his eyes tiredly. This was getting exhausting. He reread the note several times and came to the conclusion that the smallest one was forward. Snape's logic puzzle would have stumped any wizard since they lacked logic, being around magic did that. Luckily, he was raised muggle where logic was very important so he understood it very well. Harry folded his cloak several times and made it small enough to fit into his back pocket, the extremely thin fabric allowed it to fold several more times than something that size should. He downed the potion and hesitantly took a step through the fire, it was painless, so he kept on. The room he walked into had a very high ceiling and four pillars surrounding the center part of the room which held a large mirror. Harry froze when he realized that he'd seen this room before, in a dream or at least he thought it was a dream. Walking closer to the mirror the top was written in some weird code that he didn't bother trying to decipher. So predictable. A cold familiar voice said from behind him. Harry saw Quirrell walking up to him in the mirror and turned to see him actually standing there. Did you really think my master wasn't aware of your presence? Foolish arrogant boy, snapped Quirrell. He thought it was wise to give a fresh pair of eyes a chance to look at the mirror to get me the stone. How would I get through this? I don't even want the stone, asked Harry before seeing his reflection in the mirror grin at his words and show a red stone in his hand before patting his pocket that Harry felt a weight drop into suddenly. Tell me Potter, what do you see, asked Quirrell while walking around to stand in front of Harry to stare at him in the eyes. Harry quickly looked away to avoid eye contact, he had begun his journey into the mind arts and knew about eye contact and legilimency. Clever boy sneered Quirrell before taking out his curiously short wand and pointing it at him, Legilimens. Harry tried to run away but fire exploded around them. You're not getting away that easily boy, shouted Quirrell. High ceiling, surrounded by fire, stone in his pocket in front of a mirror. Harry was in his dream from months ago, somehow. Harry turned to the mirror, it was Harry tapping his pocket that he knew now held the philosopher's stone. What do you see, do you see where the stone is? shouted Quirrell. Harry tore his gaze away from the mirror, no, I see myself surrounded by awards and fans. I'm being given the order of Merlin. 
lied Harry quite convincingly considering he dreamt about such a thing a few nights ago. Lies. Hissed a voice Harry could barely hear. No, you're not, okay. Sighed Quirrell before unwrapping his turban. Beneath the cloth was a bald head, on the back of Quirrell's head was another face. A gray, wrinkly face with glowing red eyes that glared at him with palpable hatred. Based on the description Harry was confident on who this was, someone he was told was dead. But that would have been too easy. Voldemort, said Harry coldly trying to channel as much Snape as he could. Harry Potter, hissed Voldemort. See what I've become, see what I must do to survive. Live off another, like a parasite. You shouldn't be living at all, said Harry with more confidence than he truthfully thought he should have had in this moment. Oh, but I have most certainly conquered death. You survived off a fluke and divination, I took the full brunt of my killing curse without dying because of my own strength. Hissed Voldemort with eyes glowing with pride. Divination? How did you conquer death that makes no sense? Death isn't optional, said Harry not really expecting an answer from the lunatic. Join me and I will tell you, said Voldemort. I can see your ambition, we're very similar if you haven't guessed yet. Slytherin, talented beyond peers and both having bad experiences with muggles. Together I can assure you we will be unstoppable. Harry wondered if Voldemort actually possessed a working brain in his head or if he was forced to use quirrels. Why would anyone, anyone, join their parents' murderer in their quest for power? Seeing Voldemort in front of him only made Harry more determined to gain strength to kill him for good. No said Harry flatly, you're more insane than I thought if you expected me to accept. No matter, I will ask you for the stone. Hissed Voldemort, the one lying in your pocket. Harry tried to run but the fire grew in size nearly ten feet in height. Seize him, shouted Voldemort causing Quirrell to rush him. Quirrell tackled him to the ground and Harry was hard pressed to fight off a grown man. Quirrell went to Harry's pocket but before he could get there Harry punched him in the face as hard as he could. In surprise, Quirrell backed off and Harry was shocked to see some of the man's face start to crumble away. Looking down at his hands Harry narrowed his eyes, he rushed the possessed man and pressed both hands to his face speeding up the progress. Quirrell screamed in agony as his body crumbled away while a cloud of black smoke rose from the pile of ash. The cloud of black smoke took the appearance of Voldemort's face that howled as it flew through his stomach knocking him onto his back. The next thing he knew his vision was going black. Thirsty. That was Harry's first thought when he felt himself wake up. His eyes were still closed but he could feel the sun's rays on his face. Opening his eyes Harry looked around the hospital room, nobody else was in the hospital beds and Madame Pomfrey was nowhere to be seen. Mr. Potter. Said a monotone voice from right next to him. Harry turned his head to see that Professor Snape was looking over scrolls while sitting next to him. He set down the scroll and looked at him with such disappointment that Harry forgot that he didn't care what the potions professor thought of him. What, silence, snapped Snape. I had expected more from you, I have held my reservations about you for as long as I could after you were sorted into my house. Hoping that you weren't the same arrogant disappointing foolish dunderhead that your Gryffindor father was. For a while I was surprised, you excelled and didn't cause trouble but after last night. Snape took a long breath and a long blink. I was clearly wrong. But I, you thought that you were the only one trying to protect the stone, said Snape with an eye roll. I confronted Quirrell because we knew it was him, yes we, the staff and headmaster knew, it was supposed to make him sloppy and go for the stone ahead of his schedule without a real plan. Yet a foolish first year under his invisibility cloak thought he was the only one to recognize the threat putting himself into danger and nearly ruining the entire plan in a single night. Harry looked down at the bed feeling foolish, of course he wasn't the only one to recognize what was happening. He didn't think anything through, he just jumped headfirst without a plan, he was manipulated into going by Voldemort and played right into their hands, if it weren't for the strange magic killing quirrell he would be dead, and the stone gone. Pure luck, just like Voldemort said, that was all he had. I'm sorry, I didn't think after I found out that Dumbledore was gone from the castle said Harry apologetically not looking to meet Snape's eyes. Now this is what's going to happen, started Snape not acknowledging the apology, you will be prohibited from playing the next Quidditch game on Saturday and everyone will not know why meaning they are going to fill the gaps themselves. I will be reducing Slytherin 50 points and I'm sure people will realize who was responsible. 
Harry rubbed his eyes frustratedly, this would ruin a lot of people's opinion of him in Slytherin House. The older years won't want to be around him or worse he'll be challenged for endangering both their lead in the House Cup and potentially costing them the Quidditch Cup since he was the only seeker that had training in the House. It was going to be a frustrating couple of weeks until the third Quidditch game in May where he could hopefully regain some footing in his house. If he was still on the team by then, that is. Good, you understand your punishment, said Snape. I don't want you to think you're being rewarded for meddling in a situation that doesn't concern you. Don't do it again unless you're sure that all the angles are accounted for. I won't, sir. Snape stood from the chair then I should tell you that the headmaster wishes for you to see him in his office once you're dismissed from the hospital. Harry watched as his head of house left without another sound. Last night was mostly a blur of memory, he was walking the halls to clear his head about the black family stuff. Then he overheard Snape and Quirrell, then he rushed to tell Dumbledore thinking that he was still here, he wasn't then he rushed to the trapdoor and went for the stone himself. Stupid, so stupid, just like Snape said, it was a headfirst charge without any thought only to be nearly killed. However, the strange thing was the protections on the stone, a Cerberus was a good one. Then a massive troll, but a chess set? A mirror? The mirror was strange as he could feel it taking his magic when he looked into it but other than that it was just a mirror that showed his thoughts, or something similar. Not to mention his cloak took most of the danger away, the potions room was the only one that stumped him but even then, he got through after looking over the puzzle a few more times. Why was there a hint at all? Or even the correct potion? If Harry had made a protection, he'd have made all of the potions deadly or hurtful in some way and he certainly wouldn't have left a hint. The sound of flapping wing broke Harry from his thoughts, he watched as Hedwig swooped down from one of the open windows above him. I messed up girl, he said sadly with a shake of his head. A sorrowful trill answered him as she perched on the back of his bed post. She looked at him for a second before she started to clean her feathers making Harry roll his eyes, Hedwig hated looking anything less than perfect. I hope I can work this out. Released from the hospital with nothing more than a bit of exhaustion, Harry made his way to the headmaster's office. Harry sighed to himself, all this could have been avoided if he went back to his common room to talk to Professor Snape instead of trying to do it himself. I'm here to see Dumbledore. Harry said to the gargoyle who twisted up the spire leaving behind a twirling staircase. The headmaster's office was exactly the same as the last time he was here, several artifacts sat on the shelves next to rare tomes that were all a part of the headmaster's personal collection. Come in Harry, take a seat, Dumbledore said from behind his desk. Harry went and sat in the chair in front of the headmaster's desk, he sat silently waiting for Dumbledore to start. I must say that when I devised my plans for the stone that I never expected a student would go for the stone themselves. Said Dumbledore while looking at him, his normal trickling eyes were without their usual glow. Sorry sir, but I just reacted when the gargoyle told me that you weren't here, I also didn't think that Quirrell and Voldemort knew I was there. Or that Voldemort was actually alive, said Harry. From my understanding of last night from, forgive me Harry, looking through your memories of the events, Quirrell's back was to you when you were eavesdropping on them which meant that Voldemort was looking right at you. Covered by the turban as he may have been, it's not unbelievable that Voldemort would be able to tell that someone was listening if they were standing right in front of him, invisible or not, informed Dumbledore. I see, so I guess even invisibility cloaks aren't infallible, muttered Harry. Indeed, nodded Dumbledore. Now I know that you have questions so I will allow you to ask them, I'm sure that Professor Snape has disciplined you enough. Needless as I feel it was. Said Dumbledore while shaking his head. Why was the stone here? Asked Harry. A pertinent question, nodded the headmaster, I will admit the truth of the matter now that it is over. The stone was never here, or in the school at least. Huh? Was Harry's intelligent reply. My former mentor did ask me to look after the stone for a while, but I kept it in a hidden secure place but dangled a rather convincing duplicate as bait. Harry frowned. He did all that for no reason then. Why did you need bait? For who? Did you know about Voldemort this whole time? asked Harry. I had my suspicions since that Halloween night ten years ago that he was never fully dead, admitted Dumbledore. But in the past several months I've been hearing some rumors about a wraith in the forests of Albania. So, I very discreetly hid the stone within the castle, discreetly enough that most wouldn't know, but I hoped that this would bring Voldemort out of his hiding place if he was indeed alive. 
And I bumbled down there like an idiot, groaned Harry. I thought someone was about to steal away to unlimited gold and endless life. Well, I wouldn't say you ruined anything, said Dumbledore kindly. The goal was accomplished after all. Voldemort's continued existence was confirmed, and you stopped him from controlling Quirrell any longer. Which is all I would have been able to do. In that form Voldemort is neither fully alive or dead so finishing him off would be problematic. Meaning that Voldemort couldn't be fully stopped unless he regained his body so they could kill him for good. So, he's coming back. Harry said now knowing the terrible truth, and based on what he said to me, he'll certainly want me dead for causing this much trouble for him. Unfortunately, that is what I believe will happen. Sighed Dumbledore tiredly. I believe that Voldemort foolishly believes that you are responsible for vanquishing him that night. I don't understand, then what did happen? asked Harry, not that I ever thought a one year old could have killed him in the first place. On that Halloween night ten years ago, your mother gave her life for your own, all of her love and the rest of her life were willingly sacrificed for you to survive. That kind of sacrifice has very few equals in magical rituals, the protection received from such a thing would have virtually no weaknesses. Voldemort would be incapable of even laying a hand on you much less kill you, I think you saw evidence of that a last night with Quirrell. Harry looked down at his hands, that answered his next question. What about the protections on the stone? asked Harry still bothered by the unimpressive gauntlet leading up to the stone. If a first year could get through them, they weren't that great, right? Ah, quite simple no? Dumbledore asked with his trademark twinkle back in his eye. The only protection that was simple was Fluffy, a large three-headed dog is a very good deterrent from anyone entering a room. Now the room beneath Fluffy was filled with a complex set of runes laid out by Professor Babbling to latch onto an intruder. The runes would act as a beacon to anyone keyed into the runes for the intruder's location, another would slowly drain magic from the intruder at 2% per minute. The hallway following was quite long and held a troll that would cause anyone to waste a lot of time and energy to dispose of the chess game was a similar stalling tactic. The square with the missing piece that the intruder would need to stand on to command the pieces would draw from their magic to power the board further weakening them. The potions were a last minute addition to further stall allowing the runes to further weaken the intruder, but the mirror was the strongest defense. While the mirror draws on the magic of whoever looks into it the mirror is also considered extremely dangerous for the fact that people have wasted away staring into it for the images it showed them. Harry blinked several times at the information overload, oh, far more subtle than I was expecting and I'm the Slytherin here. But I didn't feel a drain on my magic other than when I was standing in front of the mirror. Dumbledore chuckled softly, everyone has traits of all four houses I believe, myself included. Now for the runes. I suspect that staying under that cloak of yours hid you from even the runes themselves, it's a very old and powerful artifact. I never uncovered all the enchantments and runes sewn into it when it was in my possession. Harry's eyebrows shot up at that, his cloak was far more special than he thought. Strange that it could hide him from runes but not Voldemort, but if anyone was stronger than reason it was Voldemort he supposed. He was sure that Dumbledore could likely see through the invisibility cloak to some degree as well. Wait started harry remembering something then how did i get the stone or the fake one rather ah one of my more ingenious ideas dumbledore said with a large smile i tweaked the mirror to only release the stone to someone that wanted it but did not want to use it complicated bit of magic but worth it in the end as not even voldemort figured it out the headmaster seemed disappointed in voldemort for his actions harry didn't understand why however do you have anything else to ask me Harry looked down trying to think, Voldemort said that I survived because of luck and divination, do you know what he meant? Dumbledore sighed, I believe I do, but I'm afraid that it is nothing more than nonsense. Prophecies are more self-fulfilling than actual future telling I'm afraid. Prophecy? asked Harry shocked, it foretold of Voldemort's downfall at the hands of a child born at the end of July. He never would have attacked you had he not heard the prophecy meaning he wouldn't have been defeated since he wouldn't have attacked you without the prophecy in the first place. It's all a loop of self-fulfilling circumstantial events that wouldn't have come to pass if no one believed they would happen. Unfortunately, Voldemort is a believer in divination and prophecies. Explained Dumbledore tiredly. Harry sunk into his chair twice as exhausted as before, meaning that he won't feel truly safe unless I'm dead. Perfect. 
Dumbledore's eyes bore into Harry's and he could feel the headmaster's magical power start to fill the room with warmth. I promise Harry that I will do everything in my power to bring about an end to Voldemort before something like that happens. As he was a problem from the generation before yours it is up to us to finish this. But you must take caution in the coming years. Voldemort's followers never stopped believing in his cause. Warned Dumbledore. I've been keeping my distance from students who have family that were, under the Imperius during the war, confirmed Harry. While I believe in second chances, I will say that may be for the best. Agreed Dumbledore. I will commend you on seeing through Mr. Knott and his father's plans. Harry looked up with clear surprise on his face making Dumbledore frown. Theodore said that he was trying to bring his family back to its former glory and that he hated his father, he was quite firm in distancing himself from his father, and it was all a lie, said Harry with a shake of his head. Not all of it, but half-truths are far harder to see through, said Dumbledore kindly. What is the truth behind his family then? Harry asked angrily. His father was one of the original Death Eaters and a part of Voldemort's inner circle. He married Theodore's mother about a year before he was born but like most political marriages very little love was involved. When she failed to conceive a second child she was banished from the family. Theodore was raised by his father to believe in the pure bloodways and to fight for their cause should Voldemort ever return. I suspect that when they learned that you would be attending Hogwarts in Theodore's year, he was tasked with getting close to you. As one of the very few actual, junior Death Eaters I commended you on seeing through it, but I suppose it was luck or Theodore's lack of experience in a long con. I had no idea, muttered Harry, I believed him when he said those things about his family, he seemed so genuine and I guess I understood someone wanting to distance themselves from their relatives. I had a plan before coming to school, to keep people at arm's length to avoid this exact kind of thing, but the first person I meet to act like my friend, and I forget all about it. Harry clenched his fist angrily, it won't happen a second time. Can you tell me if there are any other real junior Death Eaters? I had only really suspected Draco, said Harry getting back on subject. Ah the Malfoys, they have been an interesting family since the war, said Dumbledore leaning back in his chair. The Malfoys, while Lucius's father was an original genuine Death Eater and Lucius himself followed in his footsteps. Narcissa never took the mark nor did she act on the cause more than supporting her husband. Since the war Lucius has actually benefited in wealth and social standing, while I expect that he would run back to his master should Voldemort return he no longer works to find his master or to revive him like he did right after the war. I expect that they are curious about a rumor that went around right after the war as well. Which was? Asked Harry getting tired of Dumbledore stopping halfway while explaining. Many believed, especially in Voldemort's camp, that you defeated Voldemort because you were the superior dark wizard answered Dumbledore amused. An odd rumor. Muttered Harry incredulously, did no one realize that I was a year old at the time? You'll find Harry, much like I told you on your first day, that many believe the first thing they hear is truth, as coming to their own decisions on difficult matters is far too strenuous, said Dumbledore with a shake of his head. Now it's going to be worse with the black family stuff thrown into the mix, moaned Harry with a hand over his face. I got a letter from Gringotts a few days ago about a will that named me the sole beneficiary for the Black family," said Harry before Dumbledore could ask. I know they need me in person, so I was going to ask you if I could leave school for a few hours for the meeting when I found out more, but I suppose now's a good a time as any. I never expected Sirius Black to name you as his heir after what happened," said Dumbledore more to himself than to Harry. I've been thinking about that too, I was planning on reading the will to see if he said why. It just makes no sense from what Draco said. Said Harry still annoyed over the impossible puzzle, his father told him that my father and Sirius were practically brothers so it makes no sense that he would betray my father. Dumbledore stayed quiet and looked like he was mulling over some information internally. Harry, I believe that I will accompany you for the meeting as I too am finding it strange, said Dumbledore. Harry nodded, I'll let you know, thanks for telling me all of this. Not at all. I believe that as involved as you were it would be prudent to know what was happening and why. Also, to caution you about Voldemort and his continued survival and that some of the students in your house may be sympathetic to his cause. Which meant that Slytherin will likely become less and less safe as Voldemort's power grew, the Death Eater sympathizers would become bolder and bolder. 
Harry thanked Dumbledore one more time before making his way back to the Slytherin common room. Inside was the same assorted group of students, a few upper years talking and spread out across the room while the lower ones stuck to groups in the corners or at the tables. Harry spotted Blaze at the table and went to join him. Ah, if it isn't Potter, shouted someone getting the attention of the rest of the common room. Harry noticed that most of them didn't seem angry, it probably helped that Slytherin still had a 30 point lead after the deduction from Snape this morning. Thankfully, he wasn't responsible for losing Slytherin the lead but merely making it a closer race. Trust Snape to take points as a punishment but not ruin his chances at the House Cup. It was one of the few times he was glad his head of house was so biased. McGonagall would have taken a hundred points and all but destroyed their chance at the cup just to teach him a lesson. The boy who yelled at him came closer with a small group of boys following, Harry actually recognized him as Wallace, the fourth year that challenged his year's leader for the position, then lost badly. Seems as though he's given up on intimidating his age group and was trying for younger ones, Harry was unimpressed but stayed quiet for now. You got a lot of nerve showing up here after what you did, shouted Wallace making a scene of it, losing 50 points. Also, Professor Snape said that you couldn't play on Saturday meaning we may not even get a chance at the cup. Several of the other older students were getting more and more upset as Wallace spoke. Harry was starting to feel like the wizarding world had a nasty mob mentality and that the loudest voice usually won, he'd need to remember that. Harry also decided that he couldn't let Wallace's words stand without a retort. I'll make the points back up, I've already gotten nearly a fourth of the points in the house myself anyway. And you shouldn't say that about our Quidditch team, you make it sound like I'm the only player that matters. Maybe it was because Harry's face gave off no real reaction or the words but a few seventh years started laughing. Harry didn't know if that was good or bad seeing as how Wallace was getting progressively angrier as more people laughed. Unfortunately, most of the house still seemed angry at him. Only the seventh years that were graduating in a couple months didn't care about what happened in the house. How pathetic, a cold voice spoke up over the laughs, you are such a failure that you are trying to bully a first year and even then, you can't. Harry looked to see that it was Ella Wilkins, the girl that defeated Wallace in the challenge. Shut up, and Potter you're lucky that Wilkins is here, she won't always be there to watch your back, with that Wallace turned and left the common room with his little group following behind him. What? asked Harry to no one. Ignore him, snorted Ella, that guy is only trying to make himself feel tough, everyone with a working brain knows that you're one of the biggest point earners for us. But the Quidditch part is true, why can't you play? Harry noticed that all the others were listening in, Professor Snape revoked my right to play when I lost the points. I was out of bounds last night and he thought it was an appropriate punishment. He didn't know if he was saying too much or if he was even supposed to keep it quiet in the first place, so he went for a half-truth. Don't do it again Potter, she leaned forward to look him in the eye, we lose the Quidditch or House Cup because of this and I'll challenge you to a grudge match personally. Harry gulped and nodded, gotcha. Ella patted his cheek, good boy, now run along. He walked away with a shake of his head, Ella went down to her room without another word and he was glad she was gone. Hey Blaze he said as he sat down. You should be glad that you were in the hospital last night when Snape delivered the news. Said Blaze without looking at him. Flint looked like he was out for blood. Watch out for that by the way I doubt he's calmed down that much. Flint hadn't calmed down. At all. After dinner he was confronted by the giant Quidditch captain, screaming and posturing and Harry was glad that he wasn't cursed. His punishment by the captain was drills, a lot of drills, every morning he had to do 10 laps around the pitch on foot and 50 on his broom while dodging bludgers, he frequented the hospital quite often with broken bones from the four bludger onslaughts solely directed at him. After being healed he was to polish and maintain the team's brooms until they were shiny and perfect, after his seventh broken bone from a bludger he was starting to wish he was just cursed a few times to be done with it. Wallace Wallenworth had also taken to following him around in the hallways with a couple of his friends. Harry didn't know what his plan was, but it was getting weird that a fourth year was spending so much time stalking him. Harry made it a priority to get a few more offensive spells under his belt. His lightning spell was producing more lightning with every practice, however he wasn't going to get further without significant emotional fuel. He just didn't feel angry enough or have the desire to destroy a target in practice to succeed in casting the spell. Hogwarts, 16. February 1992 Today was the second Quidditch match of Slytherin's season, 
It was against Ravenclaw and the four Hogwarts houses were roaring with excitement in the stands as the two teams hovered in the air waiting for the match to start. The whole school knew that he wasn't allowed to play this game and Ravenclaw's seeker, a second-year girl, was sitting confident on her broom. Harry was confident that Adrian Pusey, his replacement, would be able to catch the snitch. Flint however was banking on the beaters to take out Ravenclaw's seeker while they tried to gain a big enough lead in case that didn't work. We can do it, said Harry as the quaffle was released, beginning the game. We better, Potter, shouted Malfoy from the seat behind him. Flint and the other chasers were playing particularly nasty today, already ahead by 30 points in the first two minutes. The beaters were relentless in taking out Ravenclaw's seeker. Cho Chong if Jordan's commentary was correct. Ravenclaw's premier player and captain, Roger Davis, was very much aware of Slytherin's plans to take out Cho as he was constantly ordering their beaters to protect her. The six chasers on the pitch were exchanging vicious attacks to take control of the quaffle. The edge went to Slytherin as they were a bit looser with tactics that could be considered against the rules. The score was staying neck and neck after minute 30 at 240 and 270 with Slytherin managing to hold a small lead. Harry felt worry build up in his stomach, he would have caught the snitch by now and he was sure that many knew that Cho was acceptable as a seeker, but she was being held up by the beater onslaught. Pusey on the other hand was incapable of locating the snitch, Harry had managed to spot it twice when it was close to the stands. Adrian Pusey struggled to keep up with the elusive snitch but looked to be coming close. Harry had taken to yelling and pointing at the snitch when he spotted it. Pusey didn't seem to notice. Cho Chong has found the snitch. She's going in for a dive this could be it, roared Jordan bringing attention to the diving Ravenclaw seeker. Pusey shot toward his opponent who was gaining on the small golden ball. The houses of blue and red were roaring with approval as Chong closed in on the snitch. Harry turned away from the battling seekers to see that Flint and the other chasers were getting as many points as they could while all the attention was on Chong and Pusey. Harry saw that the point lead for Slytherin was up to 60 points. She's got it. Chong has caught the snitch beating those cheating snakes, cheered Jordan. Jordan. Sorry professor. Harry sunk into his seat, of course they lost, he was the only seeker in the house with any real skill. Pusey could throw a quaffle well enough but keeping up with a snitch was beyond him, and Harry knew that he was going to be blamed for this lose. If not by the whole house then by Flint and Wallace, not that Harry really cared what Wallace thought but Flint's anger could be problematic as he could kick him off the team. Or increase the amount of bludgers used in practice, he had already broken both his arms twice what was a few more times. He hoped that everyone remained calm. Potter roared Flint in the middle of the common room getting everyone's attention, see what happens when we lose a member of the team, this loss is on you, he looked like he was going to do more but only kicked a table and left the room in his anger. That could have gone better, muttered Harry to himself, it also could have gone worse, I could have been challenged. What did everyone expect, said someone loud enough to be heard by the common room. Harry turned around to see Theodore not standing alongside Wallace and his little group of fourth years. We've allowed a foul disgusting half-blood to associate with this for too long, shouted Theodore, I'm all for using someone for their talents, but relying on a half-blood for anything is foolish and disgusting. The atmosphere of the room was changing from a disappointed group of students after losing a sporting event to a pure blood rally, and not everyone looked to be into it and more so looked angered by it. Harry wondered if Theodore knew that roughly a fourth of Slytherin were half-bloods and the rest were likely friends with them in some way or another. However, Harry noticed that there were many Slytherins that were agreeing with what Theodore was saying and glaring at him with hate. I think we should move to disassociate from Potter, or are we going to forget what he did to the Dark Lord? Roared Theodore getting more sounds of approval from the like-minded Slytherins. Harry marched up to him at those words, he wasn't going to stand around while a rally of his parents' murders picked up. He could tolerate words against him, that was easy, but he wouldn't stand by as people praised his parents' murderer. Shut up, not. Snarled Harry his wand in a white knuckle grip. Or what? Asked Theodore amused. Attack me so I can deal with you like the Dark Lord did with your mudblood whore of a mother. Silence. He couldn't hear anything but his own heartbeat. Harry noticed movement out of the corner of his eye. He saw that Wallace and his friends were laughing but he couldn't hear it. Someone came between them. It was a large black figure but Harry didn't acknowledge it he was busy coming to terms with Theodore's words and controlling his sudden fury. 
Potter. Harry noticed that he had Theodore at wand point. The glowing tip of his wand was pressed to Theodore's throat and Snape was glaring at him. Grudge match, said Harry. I want a grudge match. More silence before Snape nodded and as a whole the Slytherin house rushed to the painting of the night and hurried to the dueling room. Harry didn't move right away, he was staring off in the distance angrily, he shouldn't have done that, he shouldn't have let Theodore's words get that much of a reaction. But after learning from Dumbledore about Knott's true intentions and hearing such awful words about his deceased mother, he didn't want to think rationally, he didn't want to control himself, he wanted to hurt something. Let's go Potter said Snape reminding Harry that he was standing there. A warning, Not has been likely given reading material for dueling and personal instruction from his father. Harry caught the meaning, Not's father likely gave him some curses to use in a fight. Only problem with that was that Theodore was slightly above average in spell casting from what he'd seen in class. Unless he was holding back, and the look of concentration and focus was any indication he wasn't, then Harry was confident that at worst they would be even. It won't help him said Harry before walking down the steps. The dueling room was filled with all the students who saw the scene in the common room, likely seventy students. Snape walked to the center like with Wallace and Ella, the terms of the duel? I want the leader spot, and his position as seeker, said Theodore with a smirk. Like hell! shouted Flint who had just taken a seat in the stands. Snape shot the Quidditch captain a look, it's within the rules, there are weeks before the next match, plenty of time for training. Potter, your terms? Harry looked at Theodore, nothing, he has nothing I want I just want to beat him and for everyone to see it. Theodore bristled at the insult, likely at the words of having nothing of value to a half-blood like him. Harry smirked at the look being sent at him. Snape looked at him before making his way off of the platform, begin. Harry held his wand loosely in his hand while waiting to see what Knot would do. He had experience blocking spells from his time with Tonks, he was confident that the seventh year Hufflepuff was far more powerful than Theodore, so he would wait to see what Nod did first. Reducto! shouted Nod slashing his wand in a horizontal V-shaped pattern. A small blue spell sped toward Harry with enough speed to be dangerous, but it had nothing on Tonks' spells. Harry threw up his shield and made a show of batting away the curse without effort, all show as it actually took a fair bit of magic to do. Not and several others looked shocked that he was capable of using a shield spell and was capable of blocking a curse so easily. Defendo, said Harry while slashing his wand at not sending the Severn charm at his opponent who managed to get out of the way in time to avoid it. Statumdo, said Harry casting the stinging jinx at not while he was dodging and was hit on the side. Harry shot another hitting him in the chest, then in the other leg, then on the stomach. Harry had been on the receiving end of the stinging jinx from Tonks, he knew that it was painful, so he kept casting it. Not looked like he was about to collapse from the pain but defiantly sent another reducto at him that Harry avoided. Harry was about to cast another stinging jinx when he realized something, he was angry and had enough motivation to cast a spell that had been impossible before. It was powerful even when casted by a novice, but it was dangerous and potentially deadly. Others may think he was crazy or dark, but in this house maybe that was beneficial, posturing seemed to be an important part of succeeding in the wizarding world. Harry took a breath and thought about the words Theodore said before their duel, the insults he said towards his dead mother. The fake friendship that Harry believed in the days afterward where Harry almost went back to try and mend their friendship. His first friend, manipulating him, insulting his mother, trying to take his position as leader, as seeker on the house Quidditch team. The tip of Harry's wand crackled with white sparks, Fulman, he said darkly. Theodore watched in horror as a compacted white bolt of lightning shot from Harry's wand. The lightning filled the room with the smell of ozone and the hairs on Harry's arm and neck stood up on end from the static that filled the room. Lightning slammed into Theodore's chest knocking him off of his feet and launching him ten feet in the opposite direction. Harry watched dispassionately as Theodore's prone form convulsed before going still. It was only Theodore's rising and falling chest that assured Harry that he didn't just commit murder. Dislike or even hate Theodore he may, but he wasn't going to kill him. Harry looked around to see a shocked expression on Wallace and his little group of friends who had been previously confident in their newest recruit. The older students didn't have visible reactions on their faces, which should be telling enough, while the younger ones were openly gaping at him. None more so than Draco Malfoy who was staring at Harry's wand with awe. 
This is over, said Snape breaking the silence. The head of Slytherin House levitated not out of the dueling room to make sure the damage wasn't permanent. Harry slid his wand into his pocket and turned to follow Snape out of the room. He was done with today. Hogwarts, March 28, 1992. Harry rubbed his eyes as he waited for Dumbledore in his office. The goblins replied to his letter telling him he was scheduled for a meeting with Sharptooth today. They were impatient when waiting for a reply but made him wait near a month for an appointment, it was clearly their way to show power. If it wasn't for the fact that schoolwork and private study took most of his time he would have been annoyed to wait this long. Dumbledore was pleased that it wasn't a sudden meeting so he could schedule it into his own extremely busy schedule. After Snape's punishment of taking points and no Quidditch leading to his grudge match with Knott, Harry's position in Slytherin had changed, he was recognized as his year's leader and second years looked at him with respect after his display of powerful magic. Third year and up merely looked at him with interest after seeing what he was capable of. No one had approached him yet and Theodore had been very quiet since the duel, luckily, he was only left with a small, jagged scar where the spell hit and nothing more. Snape had taken him aside telling him that it was only because he was barely capable of powering the spell that Theodore still drew breath and that using it in a duel was forbidden henceforth. Harry was glad that he didn't say that in front of the whole house but to him personally, his ability with the lightning spell was a great deterrent for future challenges. Downside was Draco's new attitude towards him, he was reassured in Harry's less than light mentality and had taken to talking to him more. He was still the bigoted, snobbish and annoying Malfoy but he was interested in becoming friends with Harry, likely thinking that he was going to become a powerful dark wizard. Knowing that this meeting was going to be about the black family, Harry passed a note to Tonks who would send it to her mother Andromeda who Dumbledore said was an old friend of his family. After two days a regal looking eagle owl arrived from the banished black expressing interest in meeting. Harry told her to meet him in the leaky cauldron, she should arrive right after the meeting. Harry assumed that he owed her and her husband a sizable amount of money as head of her house, or heir rather. Blaze and his mother, through post, were helping him learn pure blood customs. Mostly through the use of books and genealogy maps to know who was who and how their families rose to power or lost it. The Weasleys were an interesting read, they apparently lost their fortune two generations ago with poor investments, extreme gambling and a Malfoy who smelled opportunity. It was rumored that their vault housed less than 10 galleons worth of funds. Funnily enough, he had given the twins 20 galleons apiece for Christmas, Harry had effectively given them double of their family's fortune on a whim. It was as funny as it was sad. With his growing knowledge of the pure blood customs Harry learned that daughters were given dowries that were renewed after the agreed amount of time. It was to allow those of noble birth to continue their way of life should their family fall on hard times. With how wealthy the families who still practiced this were, it was mostly symbolic. But a muggle born and a banished woman likely didn't have extreme levels of wealth, so Harry would help them if they accepted. His friendship with Tonks meant enough to him that he extended it to her family, his family. Ah, I hope you haven't been waiting too long, said Dumbledore as he walked through the flow in his office. We must leave if you are to make your meeting. Harry stood and followed Dumbledore into the green flames. The leaky cauldron, Harry looked around with a smile, it was here where he spent so many days reading his course books in preparation for Hogwarts. It was where he casted his first spell, he missed the rundown tavern and their excellent food. Now I think Mrs. Tonks is to arrive here in half an hour so I will wait here, said Dumbledore as he walked out of the fire. Come back here after the meeting, it has been a while since I have spoken with Tom. Harry watched as the headmaster jovially walked through the pub greeting each guest as they noticed him. Harry nodded to himself then left to head towards Gringotts. Even on a weekday during work hours, Diagon Alley was packed with customers while the shops and restaurants were full. Gringotts stood halfway down the alley with its imposing height and marble pillars standing over the rest of the shops in the alley. Walking in he passed the two guards that didn't even turn to look at him. The entrance hall of Gringotts was the same long hallway and high ceiling with hand-carved marble desks with floors that sparkled in the light that broke through the windows. Goblins were hard at work at the desks writing or stamping away at forms. Harry walked up to the same desk at the end that was higher than the others and the same goblin was working at it without looking up, content to ignore his presence. I have a meeting with Sharp Tooth, said Harry loudly so the goblin could hear him. The goblin looked up from his work at Harry, ah, Mr. Potter has returned so soon, 
You know the way. He said while jabbing a wrinkly figure in the direction of a door off to the side. Harry walked down the familiar hallway until he saw the door with a plaque that read, Sharp Tooth, Banker and Manager of All Ancient and Noble Families. Deciding it was best to be polite, Harry knocked three times and waited for a call to enter. Sharp Tooth was sitting behind his desk watching him enter then gestured for a seat. Good, you are on time wizard. He said roughly, this will not take long as the will was rather short and to the point. Sharp Tooth pulled out a roll of parchment and began to read it. I, Sirius Orion Black declare my godson. Harry James Potter, my heir until such a time that I conceive a child of my own. Only stipulation for him to receive the Black Lordship is that, if I hadn't already, he is to acknowledge Andromeda as a full member of the Black family once again. No other restraints are to be placed on Harry as I have full confidence that he will uphold the Marauder Code. Mischief managed. Harry raised his eyebrows at the unfamiliar words, what was the Marauder Code? Mischief managed. Sharp Tooth folded up the paper and set it down before taking out another as well as a black box. I will need you to sign your full name on the paper and put on the ring in this box. Said Sharp Tooth extending both in his direction. Harry looked over the paper. It was a form from the Ministry Wizengamot Administration Services so that Harry would be acknowledged as the heir to the ancient and noble House of Black. Harry signed his name and after the letters glowed blue before returning to Black. Then Harry opened the small black box which held a ring that had a crow depicted on the black jewel, carved into the golden band of the ring were the words, Toujours pure, French meaning, always pure. Harry suspected that the previous lords were rolling in their graves now that Harry, a half blood, was the heir to their family. Same could possibly be said of the Potters since they allowed his grandfather to marry Doria Black, who was likely just as prejudiced as the rest of her family since she wasn't banished after marrying his grandfather, meaning she held up her family's beliefs. Harry knew that his ancestors would be very adamant about him marrying a pure blood so that his line would remain pure from then on. As magicals were only acknowledged as pure if all four grandparents and both parents were magical. Unfortunately for them he wasn't going to marry someone because of their blood. So, I just put it on? Asked Harry while looking at the ring. Yes. Said Sharp Tooth with a bored nod, just do it quick as I have other engagements today. Ignoring the rudeness of the goblin, Harry slid the ring onto his finger. If he was expecting some magical reaction, he would have been disappointed as the only reaction was the ring shrinking to fit his finger. May I see the black accounts and I would also like to go down to the vault, said Harry after the ring shrunk to fit his finger. Sharp Tooth said some growl-like words into a paper. The black family boast 4,458,234 galleons as well as a large unplottable estate in southern England as well as an unplottable location in central London. Their locations are on the ledger, going to the vault is not my problem so go to the carts. Harry nodded while trying to his shock at the amount of money the Black family held. Most considered the Potters to be as wealthy as any other pure blood family, but they held less than a million while the Blacks held over four. Now onto a different matter, started Sharp Tooth, as you are the heir to another ancient and noble family you will have to decide on two ways to proceed. One is having two children to continue the families. The oldest will be the heir to the Potter family while the younger the heir to the Blacks meaning they would have different last names. The other is to absorb the Black family into the Potter family consolidating all assets together ending one family and continuing with the other. Those are my only options, asked Harry, it was a big decision to make and he didn't want to rush into it. Yes, this is not the first occurrence of these circumstances, however, you will not need to decide which option until you are of the age of majority, meaning 17. As that is when you will go from being the heir to lord of both families. I see. Is there anything else I should know pertaining to these families? asked Harry. Sharp Tooth looked at the papers once more, no, anything else regarding them is between you and the ministry. You are officially recognized as the heir after signing the form. A copy was filed in the ministry the instant the magic settled. One last question, said Harry much to the goblin's annoyance, why isn't there a ring for the Potter family? Sharp Tooth looked down in thought before nodding to himself, the Potter ring is in the vault I believe. However, the ring holds no magical properties unlike the Black family ring. I think the acting Lord Potter wore it as a symbol rather than to control the family through their magics. Harry looked at the Black ring occupying his left middle finger, he didn't feel any sort of power coming from it. Thank you for the help, Sharp Tooth, said Harry, 
All I will need is the Potter and Black business ledgers. I would like the monthly update service charged to my trust delivered by Owl. Sharptooth nodded and wrote a note, done, it will be a charge of 20 sickles a month for both families. Harry thanked him once more and left the office then headed towards the carts. Unlike his first time in the bank Harry was able to ride by himself. Key and name. The driver said roughly. Harry presented his ring, Black Vault, Harry James Potter. The goblin starred at the ring before slamming his hand on the latch then pressed several buttons. The cart shot forward at extreme speeds that pushed Harry back into his seat from the force, he was barely aware of the twists and turns the cart was taking until a sudden steep drop took away his stomach as he fell parallel to a waterfall. They continued on this path for several minutes until the cart finally stopped at what seemed to Harry was the bottommost part of the bank. Follow me, said the goblin leading him forward toward a bit of glowing metal stairs. Harry heard a deep breath and turned to see a huge white dragon sleeping in the corner. Around its neck was a large glowing blue metal collar that pulsed with magic and a chain of black metal leading to the wall. Its back were covered in lash marks and it looked to have dry blood on its claws and jaw. The dragon will only attack if ordered or during a break in. Assured the goblin while leading him up the steps past two doors then stopped at the third. The door held the black family crest. A shield with the top half having a picture of an armored knight's arm holding a sword in the air while the bottom were three crows. Under the shield were the words. Toujours pure, the family's motto. Stand back, said the goblin before slamming his hand onto the door. The door hummed and glowed with magic and a small hole was opened on the side at chest height. Press the ring into the hole. Harry did as instructed then he heard the booms of latches and locks undoing not dissimilar to a large safe in a bank. The hinges glowed then the door opened outward. Thank you, said Harry before entering the vault. It was a large room, about the size of a Hogwarts classroom. At the back on the wall were five chests, four of which were completely full of galleons while the fifth was about half filled. Harry guessed that a single chest held a million, it certainly made more sense to do that rather than have massive piles of gold. Lining the walls were large bookcases holding artifacts and tomes as well as other jewelry such as rubies, emeralds, diamonds and the glowing metal that was around the dragon's neck. Walking over to the shelf, Harry picked up one of the books. Magics of the Black. Opening the book, he was met with some of the darkest spells he'd ever heard of, Spells to induce madness in those hit by it either permanently or for a specified amount of time. Spells to conjure large statues to protect the caster or to slaughter one's enemies. Elemental spells as well as runic formulas for a variety of things and potions that could heal even the worst diseases or cause them. He carefully put it back on the shelf, all of it was far beyond him but he'd remember where it was for another time. While not wanting to use the dark arts if Dumbledore's warning of addiction were true, he'd definitely learn about them. Harry went to another book this one was made of a red leather. Controlling and manipulating the mind. Opening the book, he was met with a similar but more in-depth description of the mind arts. It seemed to be an older and more advanced version of magics of the mind that he received from the Zabinis for Christmas. Harry looked at the next book. Most potent potions. The book was dated back to 1567, Harry put that with the book on the mind arts and looked around a bit more. He doubted that any of the other books were at his current level. Talented he may be, but he was around third year in Transfiguration and Charms but only advanced in his other classes thanks to his reading and studying ahead. He was by no means capable of using the magics in these books yet, maybe in his fourth year if he continued to advance at this rate. Harry left the vault and followed the goblin back to the cart. A gut-wrenching ride later and Harry was back in the main hall of Gringotts. Getting back to the leaky cauldron Harry saw Dumbledore speaking with a lady. She was a beautiful aristocratic woman. High cheekbones and long curly brown hair with a kind smile on her face as she spoke with Dumbledore. Harry, said Dumbledore ending his conversation with who Harry assumed was Andromeda, have a seat, this is Andromeda as you have no doubt guessed. Said Dumbledore introducing Harry to the disgraced black. Harry sat in the open chair, nice to meet you Mrs. Tonks, Harry Potter. He said extending a hand that she took happily. Andromeda. My daughter speaks highly of you, she said with a kind smile on her beautiful face. I apologize in advance for skipping small talk, but I wanted to ask what you intend to do with your newfound power. It's no problem, started Harry, I would have anyway, but the only stipulation put in place by Sirius in his will was to acknowledge you as a black, said Harry. 
Andromeda laughed happily, I, I don't, I can't tell you how much this means to me. She said with a few tears brimming in her eyes, I may not have agreed with everything my family believed but they were still my family. Harry nodded, it's fine, I didn't agree with what happened to you when Tonks told me what happened. Andromeda looked at him with a raised eyebrow, she never told me her first name, explained Harry. Andromeda rolled her eyes, of course she didn't, she snorted, it's Nymphadora. This time Harry snorted, that's a, unique, name, said Harry unsurely. It's tradition for blacks to be named after stars, said Andromeda letting him in on some of their family's traditions. I wanted my daughters to be unique, she has been less than thrilled for as long as she's been able to voice her opinion. Harry nodded at that, it was understandable. I've been learning about pure blood customs since receiving the letter. So, I was going to give you two renewals of the black dowry, based on what I have put together in my own time a basic dowry is 5000 every decade, so 10 every 10 years seems fair. Said Harry with a smile, for the black family that amount was next to nothing. Andromeda reared back in surprise, I never thought, I don't, thank you Harry, she said with a small smile, are you sure, that would mean 20,000 galleons? Harry rolled his eyes with a snort but seeing the look he was getting by the two older people at the table he elaborated. The black family may have been many things if what I saw in the vault was any indication, but poor was far from one of them. I see, Andromeda said surprised, well that's great then, Ted and I really appreciate it. Not a problem, said Harry. Dumbledore took that moment to join the conversation. Did the will reveal any information as to why Sirius would name you his heir? Not really, said Harry, he just wanted me to acknowledge Andromeda as a black and that I would hold up the Marauder Code. I have no idea about the last one, but I intended to do the first one anyway. Dumbledore nodded, strange, I will think on this later. He was still going to bring me back into the family, whispered Andromeda. Why would he still care if he was a Death Eater and I turned blood traitor to marry Ted? Harry looked down at the table in thought, what were the circumstances of Sirius's arrest? Your parents casted a very powerful spell, the Fidelius Charm, this spell meant that their home was impossible to find unless you were told the location. Only one person can share the location, known as the Secret Keeper, they made Sirius the Secret Keeper who then went to Voldemort and told him the location, explained Dumbledore sadly. Then, started Andromeda, he was confronted in the street by Peter Pettigrew who screamed about him betraying Lily and James then he was blown up by Sirius. All that was left of Peter was a finger. Thirteen muggles were killed in the explosion. He went straight to Azkaban I don't think Crouch even bothered with a trial. No, said Harry with a shake of his head, I don't think that's everything, I don't or didn't know Sirius Black, but no one is a double agent for a mass murderer but still names his half-blood godson the sole heir to his wealthy and powerful family and still wants to acknowledge his cousin who was considered a blood traitor. I want to speak with him, I need to hear it from him. Harry, started Dumbledore. Tell me about Pettigrew, interrupted Harry wanting to see more of the picture. Dumbledore sighed, he was never the most outgoing or intelligent wizard. He excelled in potions and transfiguration but not notably. He was a part of a small group consisting of your father, Sirius Black, and another boy named Remus Lupin. Have either of you watched Muggle television, ever? asked Harry, he got two no's, well, in most stories it's never the one you most suspect, most of the time it's the person you least suspect especially when it seems so obvious. I think we need to speak with Sirius to understand all these inconsistencies. I agree. Said Andromeda, Ted and I will look into this, we're barristers. She explained seeing Harry's look of confusion. All we need to do is to notify Amelia and she can inform the Council of Magical Law and have Sirius brought in. I will write to her myself. Said Dumbledore while standing from his seat. Harry, I will keep you updated through postage said Andromeda while standing from her chair as well. Harry followed their example and thanked Andromeda. I think it is time for us to return to Hogwarts, Harry, said Dumbledore. Take care Mrs. Tonks. You as well, sir, she said before leaving through the flow. Hogwarts, 25. April 1992 Harry focused on his breathing, in and out, his mind going as blank as he could make it. Both of his books on the mind arts were adamant about mastering the art of clearing one's mind before going deeper into the mind arts. Thankfully, his time in school has been rather quiet since the incident with the stone. 
He hadn't been confronted by anyone else, not that he was around enough for anyone to, and he'd been focusing on his private studies more than ever. In class he worked with Blaze and occasionally Daphne while sometimes Neville would agree to meet for a study session. After getting a new wand from Ollivander's Neville had been coming into his own in his wand-oriented classes and the other Gryffindors were happier to talk with him now that he wasn't so untalented. Harry thought it was a double standard and quite shallow, but it wasn't his problem, he and Neville still met but instead of once a week it was once every two weeks. Neville was finally making friends and didn't want to spend extra time in the library, Harry just shrugged and wished him the best. So, Harry focused on learning the mind arts as best as he could on his own also researching and learning more battle-oriented spells. Specifically, transfiguration, as that was his best subject, and quite tricky to counter by the average wizard. Unfortunately, battle transfiguration was mostly conjuration based or very advanced animate and organic transfigurations, so progress was slow. Harry had managed to get a red spark out of his disarming charm last week, so he was making progress on that front. Little as it may be, it was far more difficult to master the fourth year charm than he was expecting. All wasn't bad, however, after the fiasco with the stone and quirrell's death. Dumbledore replaced the post of defense against the Dark Arts with a junior Auror who had only just graduated from the Auror Academy and was taking the position as a favor to the headmaster. Many were now extremely pleased with the new professor's lack of stutter and actual competence in defense. No one had expressed their sadness at Quirrell's disappearance, only that they were happy that they had a competent professor for even the small amount of time left in the year. Remembering what he was doing, Harry shook his head and re-cleared his mind. He took deep breaths and calmed his magic to make it flow naturally through his body. He felt his magic move slowly through his body from his chest to his arms and legs and head, through his muscles and into his bones. Harry didn't know what happened next, but he suddenly found himself somewhere else. He was sitting in some type of cage, looking around it was a bedroom, and the cage didn't have a top while the bottom of the cage was padded and had blankets. It wasn't a cage surmised harry as he noticed that there were toys in it as well it was a crib the door to the room slammed open and a red-headed woman ran in then slammed the door behind her she spoke frantically to herself and large amounts of magic surrounded the room creating thick powerful barriers it was a moment later that the door blasted open and a cloaked figure walked in pointing a bone white wand at the woman who was crying frantically while positioning herself in front of him words were said but harry couldn't understand them he heard a scream and a green flash before the women fell to the ground. The cloaked man pointed his wand at him, and another green flash caused him to jolt out of his memory then collapsed back onto the ground of his private room covered in sweat. Harry stood up and grabbed a towel to wipe himself off with. After a few calming breaths Harry realized what he had just seen. Perhaps his first memory. It was of Voldemort murdering his mother, he couldn't get a good look at Voldemort, but he did get to see his mother. She was a beautiful redhead, not the Weasley kind, but dark red and sharp features all ending with her bright emerald eyes that Harry knew he shared with her. Harry picked up the book he took from the Black Vault, controlling and manipulating the mind, and read the next passage after meditation. When one reaches the truest form of meditation, emptiness, all prior locks in the mind will break freeing thought and allowing the mind to work without restraint. For even marginal success with the mind arts, one must confront every aspect of themselves, the good and the bad. To master and protect one's mind, one must know it in its entirety so no false memories can be placed. A master legilimens can place false thoughts and memories into a target's mind to change how they think. A trained mind will know a fake memory or thought from a real one thanks to this step. After reaching emptiness and being confronted with thoughts that have been locked away, you must re enter the empty stage of meditation and organize all thoughts. While this may seem like a daunting task, it is far more complicated. Reaching the emptiness state of meditation is very difficult but organizing the mind is far harder, it is recommended to have a legilimens help in this task. However, if a master is unavailable or unwanted, the process should include sorting through memories and putting them into groups. There are no spells to do this, meditation and mental focus are the only tools and much like any other magic, intent and focus is the key to success. If you have succeeded in organizing, Harry closed the book with a sigh, he didn't like having to watch his mother's murder and he was worried that there might be a few more memories that his mind locked away to save him from pain. Also, the old book lacked all the hand-holding that modern spell books had as they tended to reassure the reader that the spell was possible for anyone and that all it would take was hard work. Deciding to see the other perspective, 
Harry went for the book he received from the Zabinis, Magics of the Mind. Meditation, if done correctly, you will have reached a blank empty state. Unfortunately for all aspiring mind arts masters, this will release all suppressed memories to allow magic to flow into and through the mind freely. Next step to creating a strong metal defense is to sort through your mind. Organizing and filing all memories. To properly defend against legilimency and acclumens must be completely familiar with all prior memories as implanting false thoughts and memories is a common attack. While painful to confront the bad memories, all aspiring acclumens must do this. A simple method to do this as well as a highly recommended one is to have the help of a legilimens to walk you through your mind. The more difficult method is to manually go through all memories and to organize them into different groups with personal meaning. While it may seem daunting, the mind is a powerful tool so intent and focus will go a lot further in the mind plane than it will anywhere else. Harry closed the book and set it down on the table next to him, while not as different as he thought it would be Harry now had a bit more information. His mind would likely fill the gaps in the organization process that he would be unable to. Before getting back onto the floor to continue meditating Harry casted the Tempest spell and saw that it was 11 o'clock at night so he had two more hours before he should call a quits for the night. Harry sat on the ground and began taking deep breaths. Hogwarts. 4. May 1992 As we are nearing the end of the year, it is time that we begin to review for our final exams. Said Professor McGonagall looking at all of the first years seriously. This is your first final exam so I should warn you. Every test is different, and all quills are charmed with anti-cheating spells. Receiving more than three failing grades will mean that you are required to repeat the year in its entirety while failing a class will force you to retake it. Everyone in the class shifted nervously, Harry noticed that even the more confident students, Blaze and Draco, were looking nervous because of the stern teacher's warning. If Harry were honest with himself, he was nervous for his exams. All classes besides Transfiguration and Charms would be difficult to pass with an O as he was only knowledgeable of the first year curriculum. The final for my class will consist of a cumulative written test over all the theory we have gone over this year, while the practical side will be the mouse to snuffbox transformation. Extra points will be award for those who go beyond the required tasks. Said McGonagall looking at all the slackers with serious stares, Harry thought it was funny that most of the slackers were in her own house. I will be available for questions after class in my office, also I recommend re-reading through your textbook from chapters 1 through 10 as that is all that has and will be covered this year. She said before walking back to her desk. That is all for today, dismissed. Harry threw on his bag and left the room, hoping to be away from Draco and his. Potter. Come on we're going to get in some study time in the library. Said Draco before he could leave the classroom. Crab and Goyle are going to get our things from the common room. Bring, Zabini, if you like. The way he said Zabini made Harry withhold a snort, Draco still held resentment towards Blaze since he wasn't afraid to talk down to the Malfoy. It was one of the reasons that Harry still spent so much time with Blaze. Harry saw that Blaze was walking over while talking with Daphne and Tracy, then an idea struck him. Sorry, Draco but I have already made plans with Blaze. Maybe some other time said Harry trying his best to seem apologetic before rushing over to Blaze. What's with the rush Harry? asked Daphne as he walked over to them quickly. Tracy laughed into her hand, he's running from Draco, I knew that girls crushed on you Harry, but I never thought you'd get fanboys. Blaze let out an undignified snort, Malfoy is the most unsubtle Slytherin I've ever met, he is so blatant with his desire to get close to Harry. He looked over at Harry, so what is this plan you and I have? Heard that huh? muttered Harry to himself, I was going to study but I, well, follow me, he said before walking away much to the curiosity of the three Slytherins. Blaze, Daphne and Tracy followed Harry through the castle on a path that looked to be on the way to the library. However, when Harry passed the library to continue through the hallway, they all got more curious, when Harry stopped at an abandoned classroom they waited for an explanation. This is my private study room, said Harry while pointing to the door. I spend most of my free time here to practice my more advanced spell casting or just to be alone. Aberto. After Harry casted the spell the locks were undone, and he stepped inside gesturing for the others to follow behind him. As the year was about to be over in a couple weeks Harry was willing to bring them to his private room, next year he'd just find a new one. The three Slytherins walked in looking around the room curiously. 
The walls were covered in burn marks and soot from the impact of powerful spells being casted. In one corner were several tables pushed together and a half dozen chairs randomly thrown about the room. One of the chairs had more cushioning than the others and looked to be made of better materials. I've been trying to transfigure a chair into a nicer, more comfortable chair. I saw Dumbledore do it and have been trying to do it for the past few weeks, it's much harder than I thought it would be. Explained Harry as he sat in one of the other chairs. This is where I spend most of my time, said Harry while taking out his workbooks and his personal journal. So, you just study in a room by yourself instead of the common room or the library? Asked Tracy with a tilt of her head. He obviously practices his spells here, said Blaze with a roll of his eyes. Harry, I assume this is where you practice your more powerful spells. Powerful, meaning his lightning spell, Blaze wasn't the first to ask him about that. Harry had been trying to both answer and not answer the questions about the spell ever since Ella Wilkins approached him saying that the spell wasn't in any books in the library. Harry didn't want to tell anyone about Adrian's adventure guide, he was barely a fifth of the way into it and had made notes about half a dozen useful spells. Yes, said Harry not elaborating any further, but I also train here, Mudo Machina. Harry pointed his wand at a chair causing the wood furniture to transform into an aura training dummy. The three Slytherins looked at the dummy curiously. You've been training yourself for dueling? Asked Daphne, I don't think you have to worry about challenges for a while. She glanced at Tracy for a moment before turning away. Yeah Harry, everyone was really scared after that duel, I think Pansy was worried that you were going to challenge her, said Tracy. Harry mentally scoffed, why would he care what that stupid girl said? I think Draco was more excited than scared by the display. Snorted Blaze, he wouldn't shut up about how you were turning out to be the right sort of wizard. Of course, he was, groaned Harry, he won't leave me alone. All he wants to do is have me join his group. I don't want to hang around Crab and Goyle for more than I'm forced to. Millicent hasn't said anything about you, but I could tell she was upset about what happened to Nott. Said Daphne, I heard that she was crushing on him during the year and hasn't left his side since the duel. And Nott? asked Harry, even though he and Nott shared a room, he hadn't actually seen him in a few weeks. Tracy spoke up, I've seen him with those dumb fourth years, Wallenworth's little gang. He's been avoiding everyone in our year except for Millicent and a Hufflepuff, but I don't know who the Hufflepuff is. But everyone thinks he's been trying to learn curses so he can challenge you again, but a lot of Slytherins have been ignoring him after he was beaten so badly. She's right, said Daphne with a nod, I've heard some of the older girls saying that if a half-blood could beat him so badly then he wasn't worth the effort, apparently Wallenworth's gang is full of losers from what the older girls have been saying. A second year half-blood. Terence Crowley I believe, has been saying that most of the Slytherin hierarchy are either embarrassed by not or angry at him for what happened. Despite what Malfoy will have you believe only about four-fifths of Slytherin are pure bloods and the half-bloods aren't exactly the weak pathetic magicals like the bigots believe. Three including you are leaders, while two are prefects. That only leaves fourth and second years with pure blood leaders and four of the six prefects, not to mention that not all pure bloods are followers of the old ways this room being a prime example. Explained Blaze thoughtfully. Harry listened and nodded along all the while thinking about Slytherin House as a whole, he hadn't put much thought into the older years if he were honest and maybe that was a mistake. Second and fourth years were leaded by pure bloods but from what he's seen Ella wasn't a bigot as she has spoken to him amicably in the past few weeks. He hasn't had much communication with second years but after the duel they gave him a few nods and tended to leave him alone. Another potential mistake was to let his power as a leader go unused, he was sure that avoiding everyone hasn't been seen as favorably these past weeks. But Daphne and Tracy still seemed to want to be around him, Blaze was still considered a friend despite his newfound hesitance of using that term. I will have to talk to some of them, said Harry with a nod, or any other first year against not? No one else has a solid stance, most like to remain outside of conflict like this and wait for a winner to be declared said Daphne. Only Millicent is on Nott's side at the moment, said Tracy, also those fourth years but no one really likes them, she added off-handedly. Draco and his group were more interested in you than Nott, added Blaze, but my mother has told me that Lucius Malfoy and Thomas Nott became enemies after the Dark Lord was defeated. So, it may be because his family and Nott's are currently in conflict. Harry nodded. It was nice to have people to answer his questions so readily. 
If he'd known that they would be so helpful he would have invited them to this room sooner. Maybe that is what he should do. From what he'd learned from Dumbledore, even the nicest and lightest person could be manipulative to achieve what they want. Isn't that what Dumbledore did with his fake stone? So maybe he should give these three something and in turn they will continue to offer him information or help with things he can't do on his own. Excellent, started Harry, I think that we should start working on our studies, I've been falling behind in my history work. The others all dragged chairs to the table he was sitting at and took out their work to begin their spontaneous study session. Harry thought about how he should continue, if he were honest, he wanted to become friends with them, he wanted to spend time with them in a group like he's seen others do. But, after the revelation that Knott was lying to him only to get close to him for his father, Harry was less than willing to allow others to get that close until he was sure that they were really friends with him and not just trying to get close for some scheme. So, for now he'd let them stay this close, study buddies and let them think that he was letting them in and that he'd chosen them as his friends. He would still work on his dueling and mind arts alone. He wouldn't tell anyone how far ahead he was or how far along he was in the mind arts. Hogwarts. 9. May 1992 Quidditch, he loved and hated the game. At the beginning of the year when he won his first game it was the center of his thoughts because it gave him a place of belonging after he won Slytherin's first game. Now, in his third game he was more stressed than ever before, even on his way down to the stone he wasn't this nervous. Everyone in Slytherin had made it clear that if he lost them this game being kicked off the team would be the least of his worries. Harry tightened his grip on his nimbus as he looked across the pitch at Cedric Diggory. Of all seekers in the school for his fate as a Slytherin to be decided against, it had to be the best one in the school. Of course, the one thing Harry had to his advantage in the beginning of the year, his broom, didn't matter because as Diggory said at the Christmas feast, he was given a nimbus for the holiday. Flint was glaring at each and every person that was in his sightline, Harry was the subject of it more than anyone else. Diggory caught Harry's eye and sent him a nod, and of course the person who could ruin him was a nice guy who was oblivious of the stakes. Harry reluctantly sent a nod while tightening his grip on his broom even more. I want this to be a clean and safe game, shouted Hooch while flying between the two teams, on the quaffle. Harry gulped and leaned forward on his broom, this was it. Win and everything would work out or loose and likely be cursed by half of the Slytherins losing his title and place on the team and likely other things he wasn't aware of. The quaffle shot into the air and the crowd roared as the game began. Harry wasted no time and focused on his breathing to calm himself. A basic form of the mind arts. Clearing one's thoughts to calm himself and focus solely on his current task. The sounds around him quieted and he flew around the pitch looking for the slightest bit of gold. Harry smiled slightly at the crystal clear picture he was able to see with the glasses he was given by Daphne for Christmas, he would be able to spot the snitch much faster than with the terrible glasses he had during his first match. Harry dipped and dove around the chaotic game as he looked for the snitch all the while keeping Diggory in his line of sight. He was aware that Slytherin was tied with Hufflepuff with 20 points each, it would seem that the teams were more even than Flint had led him to believe, he was told that Diggory was the only threat. The game went on, Harry noticed that Diggory was flying around the pitch in a lazy circle above the ongoing game and not currently flying toward the snitch, so Harry was still in the game. Harry felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up, so he instinctively ducked under a bludger that was about to nail him in the back of the head. It would seem that Flint's punishment of dodging multiple bludgers coming at him simultaneously was actually beneficial to his skill as a Quidditch player and not just a sadistic punishment. Mid-dodge, while Harry was facing down, he caught sight of a golden blur racing across the pitch close to the ground. Instantly moving toward his target Harry once again took several deep breaths to calm himself and to focus on the snitch that was racing toward the Hufflepuff hoops. A roar of the crowd told Harry that Diggory was racing toward him while bludgers were flying at the both of them without pause. Both the Slytherin and Hufflepuff beaters were adamant in taking out the opposing seeker to give their team the win. Unfortunately for Hufflepuff, Harry had spent weeks dodging four bludgers flying at him for hours on end all the while searching for a snitch. And if that weren't enough, loosing wasn't an option, so he was pushing magic into his broom to increase his speed while diving toward the ground to catch the snitch. Diggory was closing in but he was either unwilling or incapable of diving for the snitch at this speed. The snitch was zigzagging across the pitch in an incomprehensible pattern, sometimes it would go back and forth, sometimes up and down or a combination of all four. 
Harry pushed more magic into his broom and felt the wood in his hand hum as he closed in on the golden ball. Harry ducked under another bludger as he came incredibly close to the snitch, pulling up so as not to crash onto the earth Harry leveled out and shot toward the snitch quickly closing distance at his current speed. Harry looked over his shoulder to see Cedric several meters behind him rushing to catch up. Turning back to the snitch Harry leaned forward while extending his arm toward the golden ball. The crowd quieted as his fingers closed around the snitch ending the game. Only the Slytherins in the stand were cheering when he threw his hand into the air showing that he caught the snitch. Harry let out a sigh when he heard Jordan announce that Slytherin won 190-30. That was 10 points over Hufflepuff's overall score for the season meaning that Slytherin had won the House Cup. Well unless Ravenclaw beat Gryffindor by 310 points next week but that was highly unlikely. A few moments later Harry was slammed into by Flint who was screaming incoherently followed closely by the rest of the team who were all dog-piling onto him in celebration. Everyone in the stands politely clapped at the outcome except for Gryffindor and Hufflepuff, both angry at their loss and Slytherin's victory respectively. Party in the common room, shouted Flint after pulling himself from the dogpile. Harry rolled onto his back and let out a sigh of relief, it was over. Snape's stupid punishment ruining his past couple of months and Flint's toward his practices. He had won them the Quidditch Cup and they were on track to win the House Cup. As long as no one in Slytherin loses any significant number of points in the next three weeks. All right Potter? Asked Diggory while looking down at him. Harry sat up and nodded, yeah mate, that was a good game, said Harry. Not really, snorted Cedric, it lasted nine minutes, if it were a good one the score would have gotten over a hundred each at least. Really? asked a shocked Harry, he thought the game had lasted for over an hour? Yeah, nine minutes. Confirmed Cedric, you looked quite desperate during the game. Harry noticed that Cedric wasn't asking a question, so he didn't bother to answer, he didn't want his business spreading through the school nor did he want Slytherin House to think he was crying to a Hufflepuff. Well, I hope everything works out, enjoy that trophy, next year I'll be taking it back. Joked Cedric lightheartedly managing to get a smile out of Harry. You're a far better seeker than I thought you'd be. But don't expect me to lose again if I can help it. I look forward to it. Hogwarts, 29. May 1992 Final Exams, a stressful time of year for every student in Hogwarts. Harry found them to be a great distraction from his time in Hogwarts and the issues he was dealing with. In the past few months his eyes were open to the reality of Slytherin House. A place of posturing and power. Upper years would scheme and stab each other in the back for the prime positions in the power hierarchy while the lower years made allies with the older years to increase their standing. No one, not even the first years, acted how they felt. Prime example being Theodore Knott. The boy who was an open Death Eater supporter and was getting in with his own crowd of upper years lead by Mark Rosier, a sixth year prefect and highest ranking, junior Death Eater, or as Blaze would say, Death Eater in training. Draco Malfoy was trying to lead his own circle and was quickly getting followers from some of the weaker and poorer Slytherins in the first and second years. Harry meanwhile was leading a study group consisting of Blaze, Daphne and Tracy and had taken to spending time with them when not studying on his own. Many took this to mean that he was forming his own group and were asking to join or be a part of it. Draco had made several claims of having extra subjects to study and that he would be a great addition to the group. After the third rejection at the hands of Blaze and Tracy, Malfoy began his own group. Harry was trying to learn to be a leader in Slytherin, but it was difficult and if he were honest nerve-wracking. Older students would watch him, and some would approach him to ask him his thoughts on things or debates going around the house from the upper years. Harry had taken to avoiding all questions or deflecting them until he figured out how to answer correctly so he didn't look stupid or weak in the eyes of the other Slytherins. Then he was trying to continue his friendships with the few people he knew outside of Slytherin. Hermione had taken to spending every waking moment on studying for her finals, likely hoping to beat him in overall scores. Neville was meeting with him for an hour after every other potions class, the heir to the Longbottom family was quickly becoming a competent wizard and was coming into his own as a Gryffindor, unfortunately with that came the suspicion and dislike for Slytherins. Neville was still willing to study together and consider him his friend but wasn't willing to spend more time together or be seen as friends in front of other Slytherins or Gryffindors. Thankfully his two Hufflepuff friends were still willing to talk with him, the loyalty he'd heard that Hufflepuffs valued so highly coming into play. Cedric was always willing to talk with him about Quidditch or his classes. 
while Tonks and he were constantly meeting up to talk about training or dueling while discussing the serious problem. The second issue the finals were distracting Harry from was the ongoing mission led by Andromeda and Dumbledore to get a trial for Sirius Black to find out the truth of the imprisoned Black's guilt or innocence. Dumbledore had been unable to really help as he had been busy with ICW conferences and Wizengamot sessions. Andromeda was being stopped by a lot of political tape headed by Minister Fudge and his backers for whatever reason. He had received a letter that it might be better to confront Fudge during the summer with Dumbledore backing them and after they could get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Madame Bones. Andromeda had only been able to meet with Bones twice in the past couple months and the first time she was ignored for wanting to open up a decade-old case. Despite three months of time passing, Andromeda had only just been able to explain the inconsistencies to Bones getting their foot in the door for a trial to be called for Sirius's case as how high profile it would become Bones was likely wary of going through with it as it could turn out to be political suicide. Or at least that had been what was told to him by Dumbledore when Harry asked him why progress was so slow on the trial. Harry shook his head and read the next question on his defense against the dark arts exam. Name a way as to prevent a witch or wizard from becoming a werewolf after being bitten. Harry wrote about applying crushed aconite directly onto the bite within the hour and the effects of such a method without paying much attention. He had gone over all of his textbooks several times both by himself and with his new group, so these written exams were a walk in the park. The practical for defense was showing competence with the stinging hex and the leg locking curse. Nothing that he couldn't do months before, so he passed without much effort. His most difficult exam was herbology. He had to identify several plants they had gone over during the year and repot and tend to several other plants during the practical. Harry had been less than interested in the subject of herbology so he was sure that he didn't ace the exam, he just couldn't be bothered to put more time than necessary into magical gardening. He was forced to garden for his relatives so he wasn't going to do it at Hogwarts if he could help it. In Transfiguration and Charms Harry had decided to show off. He showed his ability to create an aura training dummy for his practical in transfiguration and the fire summoning charm for charms. Based on the facial expressions of the professors during the exams he was sure that he went beyond a perfect score. The rest of the classes went how he expected. In potions he had to answer questions on ingredients and be able to completely recall the ingredients to the forgetfulness potion then for the practical he was told to brew it. History was an exam similar to the several they were given during the year. Astronomy was a test on constellations and the lore behind them while the practical they were to map out a constellation with only a telescope. Harry sat on one of the couches in the common room with a sigh after his last exam. He was finally done with them, transfiguration being the last one and the longest by far having nearly double the questions of any other. Sunday would be the day that they would leave on the train meaning that tomorrow would be the end of the year feast where Slytherin would be given he house cup, their 24 point lead assuring them the cup. Harry closed his eyes and steadied his breathing, he was getting better and better at entering the empty part of his brain. For the past several weeks he had been filing through all of his memories and sorting them. This only showed how sad his life had been as most of his memories from ages 1 to 11 were filed into the unimportant group. Only the times that Harry had done accidental magic were kept in the important stack as he wanted to look over them closely at a later time. He was nearly halfway through his memories so hopefully this summer he could finish sorting through them and work on the next steps. Another project for the summer was to look into alchemy, he had not forgotten that he was going to be unable to use magic outside of school, so he was going to study basic runes, arithmancy and chemistry to get a basic understanding of the subjects that form the foundation of alchemy. He had already ordered the books and had them stored in his trunk for when he got back to Privet Drive. What are you doing? Harry opened his eyes to see a curious Daphne looking at him. Meditating. Answered Harry. I hate doing that, scoffed Daphne while turning away from him, father made me do it when he was teaching me basic occlumency before school. Harry looked at her surprised, Daphne smirked at the look, not many seriously practice the mind arts but those of us that do know when a person is trying to learn them. We all had to meditate at the beginning, I never went further than the bare basics though so don't ask for help. I wasn't going to, said Harry honestly, I like learning things at my own pace. I've noticed, I have to say that when you were sorted here, I didn't know what to think. She said thoughtfully, I expected some pawns like Draco, but you weren't, but you weren't the typical Slytherin either. You didn't try to make connections with upper years or even with much of our year, why? I, Harry stopped to think about that, he wasn't sure if he were honest, 
he didn't want potential dark families coming for him or to make enemies because he was the boy who lived, he was playing it safe. I didn't want to do anything foolish before I knew who was who. Smart, she conceded with a nod, I agree with that, but I don't like how you've gone about this second term. Between some incident ruining your climb to power, what happened by the way? Then your grudge match with not, I didn't expect you to care about what he said since he's a nobody here. Then after all that you still didn't try to make connections after your standing rose higher than ever before. Daphne looked at him in the eye while waiting for a response. Like I said I didn't want to do anything before I knew enough, he still didn't know anything, he didn't know 90% of the people in Slytherin nor their interests and beliefs. He would be looking into that this summer. I was out of bounds, he answered her smoothly not giving any more than that. The grudge match with not, I wanted to discourage things like that from happening in the future so I showed what I was capable of. That was true now at least, at the moment he was far too angry and hurt to think beyond hurting not. I see, she said without giving away any of her thoughts, then I expect that our group will be more active next year. Of course. Hogwarts, 30. May 1992 The end of term feast, Harry dug into a plate full of steaks and potatoes. This past year had been a whirlwind of change, Last year he was basically an orphan living with horrible relatives with oversized rags going to a terrible school that didn't care about him. Now he knew who he was and had millions to his name and the finest clothes said money could buy. He's a wizard, and if his top of the year marks were any indication, a pretty good one. He was a member of Slytherin House, a house of cunning, ambition, self-preservation, determination, cleverness and fraternity. Looking back at his life with his relatives, he had always been a Slytherin, stealing money from his aunt's pocketbook for food or framing Dudley at school to get into trouble. But not all changes were improvements. His new world that he originally thought was full of wonder and excitement, he now knew was just as corrupt as the non-magical with politicians who care only for money and racism that was on par with the worst of the world. He was confident that his godfather was wrongly convicted of murder and no one tried to or wanted to help him. The magical world was a flawed as it was wonderful, and Harry didn't like that. He didn't like that his mother was reduced to being a housewife when she was regarded as a genius with nine perfect N. E. W. T. S. after graduating Hogwarts while others were given top positions because they had magical families. He didn't like that a mass murdering psychopath was clinging to life and on a mission to kill him and take over the world. He didn't like that he was a weak 11 year old wizard with such huge problems with no one to really help him. Andromeda was trying to help Sirius but wasn't making much headway and half of the wizarding world would likely welcome Voldemort back with open arms rather than help stop him. He spent this year learning about the magical world. He learned the very basics of magic and was turning out to be quite skilled with a wand. He didn't have grand plans to change the world, that would be ridiculous, and no one would care what he had to say, he was an 11 year old wizard not someone like Dumbledore. But he was going to try to change some of his fellow Slytherins, starting with Blaze, Daphne and Tracy, his friends for lack of a better term, the three of them likely had their own plans for this group but he was done being so passive and allowing Draco and Theodore to acquire connections while he sulked and studied by himself. He was still going to do that, but he was going to start acting like a Slytherin, not the 11 year old orphan that he was a year ago. Slytherin table all roared with cheers. Harry looked up to see Professor Flitwick hand the house cup to Snape and that the other three tables were politely clapping. It would appear that he missed Dumbledore's speech and the final point tallies. Harry noticed an eagle flying through the hall dropping letters to a select few students. One landing in the hands of the older boy sitting across from him. I see, it's my turn to lose my mind trying to solve it, the older boy said to himself. Harry looked at the letter closely, is that the owl I've heard about? he asked. The older boy nodded, yeah, but you don't have to worry about it unless you get the number one spot after your third year. Not like I'll be able to solve it, I didn't take runes or arithmancy. Harry nodded, I'm Harry Potter by the way. He doubted the boy didn't know his name, but it was a polite way to ask what his name was. The older boy noticed that and chuckled, Andrew Hearthfell, third year leader, he introduced with a smile. Good to meet you, said Harry, good luck with your ul. I doubt I'll even bother with it but thanks. Harry followed the rest of his house out of the great hall when he noticed that everyone was standing up from the tables. He slowly made his way down to the dungeons as he committed as much of the castle to memory as he could, it would be months before he would come back, and he would miss it. But this summer would be a busy one, 
he had a lot of preparation for his next year. Privet Drive, his home for lack of a better term, was far more enjoyable after his time in Hogwarts. The Dursleys weren't any happier with his continued presence in their home but were pleased that he left the house often enough not to bother them and kept to himself when he was around that they could ignore him. Harry was only seen around them in the mornings when he was eating breakfast, after that he spent the rest of his time in his room or left for Diagon Alley. Like he planned while in Hogwarts, Harry had been reading into chemistry, runes and arithmancy so he could learn a bit about alchemy to satiate his curiosity about the art. From his time looking into the subjects Harry learned one very important fact, they were hard. He knew that it would take him months of study to get to the point where he could even understand the basics to alchemy, but he had months until his second year so for now that was his primary objective. His second object and likely most important was looking into the magical society as a whole, influential names, people in power, families with power and need to know names and events. Harry, of course, started with his own name and their power. Before the war, his family were primarily inventors and businessmen, his grandfather was a potion pioneer and his great-grandfather even more so. His grandfather was responsible for inventing the sleek easy hair potion that was sold all over the magical world. While his great-grandfather was the inventor of dozens of still-in-use potions and the most famous of them was the Skella Grow potion that has saved countless wizards and witches' limbs from irreversible damage. Three or so generations ago his family held a seat on the Wizengamot, but it was sold for gold to help his family during the Grindelwald war effort. Looking back into his family's history he saw that every time a dark witch or wizard rose to power in an area where a potter resided, they were there to fight and help stop them. Allies to the Potter family, officially, were scarce. They were friends with the founding families of the Magical Congress of the United States of America as Abraham Potter was one of the original twelve founders. Harry didn't have any names of the remaining families that helped found Makusa but he was sure that there weren't any potters in America left as Grindelwald's war took the few that were left. As unfortunate as it was that the potters didn't have any official allies, Harry's fame was large enough that many were interested in allying with him. Blaze was the first that came to mind. The Zabinis, while not as politically affluent in Britain as others, they were wealthy enough to have equal standing with the black family fortune which could practically buy any political power that they may want. Along with that was Blaze's mother, Katerina Zabini who was infamous for her many late husbands' mysterious fates. The Greengrass and Davis family, Daphne and Tracy respectively didn't have any notable power outside of respectable estates and known names. Harry wasn't surprised by that as neither families were active in fighting either for or against Voldemort so they likely chose professions that would be away from the war effort. Greengrasses owned a potion shop and the Davises were in the Department of Magical Cooperation. Harry read the book about the so-called Sacred 28 but quickly tossed it aside since half of the families were either fallen from high standing or have died out since the book's publication. It was funny to see that the Potters were excluded despite being a very old pureblood family with ancient and noble status, likely for the authors and the then head of the Potter family being enemies. There were several names that were interesting and noted by Harry, all of students in higher years with families that held positions of power in the ministry but none more so than the Malfoys. Lucius had the ear of the minister himself as being a very important advisor, his large donations to the man were likely a very big factor in Fudge's interest in the Malfoys' suggestions. Harry would be lying if he said that having the ear of the most politically powerful man in Britain's ear wouldn't be useful. Maybe he should be a little more open to Malfoy in his interest, at least on the surface, maybe let him hang around but not let him as close as the other three. This would make Blaze, Daphne and Tracy think that he held them higher while also making Draco think that he was getting somewhere with Harry and more open to Harry's suggestions. He would think on it more but for now he would continue to look into the other leaders of Slytherin. Fourth year, Andrew Hearthfell, top of his year earning him the UL for third year, his family were an up-and-comers in the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. Mother was a barrister that worked for the Wizengamot and his father was a high-ranking order working directly under Amelia Bones. While Hearthfell was a relatively new family name only four generations old his father was a muggle-born bringing the Hearthfell purity down losing their friendship with the Goyle family. Harry wasn't sure if that was a bad thing seeing as the Goyle he was in school with was about as sharp as a napkin. Andrew Hearthfell, during the end of the year feast was quite open to talking with him, so he would see about trying to further their relationship from strangers to possible friends. Being closer to a year leader and likely prefect for next year could help should Harry need to break a few rules later down the road. Learning from his mistakes of last year, 
Harry was more forward thinking, and this was evidence of that. Harry was about to crack open his journal when a pencil flew through the air smacking him in the head. Ah, hey Hedwig, yes I know you don't like your cage, he said to his familiar who was glaring at him from her cage. But until night time you can't leave, I don't like it any more than you, but we could get into trouble with the ministry if a large white magical bird was seen by the muggles. Hedwig glared at him for a bit longer as a few objects near her were levitated and launched at him. And stop throwing things at me, shouted Harry ducking under a shoe. Harry opened his journal and wrote down a few notes on Hedwig. So far since her maturation in the winter he has noticed several budding magical traits. First difference he noted and most prevalent was her incredible intelligence fully capable of understanding human speech. Not uncommon in magical beast. Even owls and other pets eventually learn to understand their owners, but Hedwig learned to understand him far quicker than he expected anyone else to. Next was her incredible speed, she was faster than any owl he'd heard of and during night or especially during a full moon. Her speed was increased so exponentially that she looked like a shooting star in the night sky. During a full moon she was capable of another form of travel, he barely noticed it during the night he went for the stone, but she was able to sort of apparate to him. After another full moon Harry had her try to do it again but she wasn't able to go anywhere she hadn't been before, but she was able to come to him if he called no matter where he was. Evidence in that she could blink to him inside of Hogwarts, whose enchantments and defenses made it impossible for witches or wizards to apparate to or from the castle's grounds. A relatively new trait was her abilities of levitation or telekinesis for lack of a better term. The moon has been referred to by ancient magical civilizations as a goddess of astral magics, or gravity. Things have changed in how most see the moon, but the gravitational effects are still present and Hedwig a lunistia, a bird that is said to represent the moon, has telekinesis as a symbol of control over gravity. She was still young, not even two years old, so Harry was sure that she may mature and further develop her magical abilities. For now, she was using her abilities to annoy him when she wanted something. I'm sorry Head, really, said Harry as he walked over to the small cage to give her some candy, she was partial to gummy worms. Harry looked at the small cage with a smile, it was a recent purchase that was enchanted for larger birds. The cage was small enough to sit on his desk but was large enough on the inside that Hedwig could fly. The enchanter said that it was about the size of a small room to Hedwig. It put him back 27 galleons, but he was sure that Hedwig appreciated it. Harry fell back onto his bed with a sigh, it was still early so he couldn't go to sleep but late enough that leaving would be a waste of time. Looking at his book on his desk he saw some introductory chemistry books, too complex to relax with so he laid back and looked at the roof. The wand sitting in his trunk was calling to him, he desperately wanted to practice magic reading about it was driving him up the wall. A shoe flew up and smacked him in the head, hey. Diagon Alley 4. July 1992 Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor was officially Harry's favorite place in Diagon Alley. Chowing down on a bowl of mint chocolate chip ice cream while reading the Daily Prophet. No big news, a few new updates with Lockhart's latest breakup but Harry didn't care. Today he was supposed to meet Andromeda and Ted for an update on Sirius's case. From the past few months of trying to get through political red tape they have managed to get to the point that Amelia was starting to take them seriously. Or was she was getting to the point that she knew that Andromeda wouldn't stop until she was given a trial. Ah Harry. Said Andromeda as she sat down next to him with a man sitting next to her. This is my husband Ted, Ted this is Harry. First impression was that Ted was a large man, not Vernon large but professional beater large. Standing easily over six feet tall with broad shoulders and solid muscles, he would be an intimidating figure if he didn't have an easy smile on his face. Ted extended a hand toward him and Harry shook it with as much firmness as he could. Vernon Business 101 A handshake could make or break a partnership, too soft and you weren't taken seriously too hard and you come off as a prick trying to show off. But with a man as large and strong as Ted seemed to be, he'd need everything he got to not seem like a limp-armed wimp. Nice handshake Harry, smiled Ted leaning back in his chair. Andy has told me about the case so I have been going through the Council of Magical Laws case files and like we thought he wasn't given a trial. Not unprecedented as at the time Crouch was on a warpath for any actual or potential Death Eaters. Harry nodded, we can use that. The two tonks looked forward curiously, if we spin it that Crouch was crooked, 
then we can make it seem like he was playing up Sirius's guilt to push the spotlight onto him and off of the more serious Death Eaters that got off without a trial. A letter to Rita should do it. How devious of you, said Ted with a smirk. I had heard you were a Slytherin seems this is proof enough. Does that really matter to adults? asked Harry, he doubted most still thought about Hogwarts houses unless they were reminiscing about their time in the castle. Oh yeah, said Ted, everyone in Britain and several surrounding countries go to Hogwarts, so it's a good way to get an idea about someone before meeting them. The older someone gets the less the house they were in really matters though, most older people are as devious as they are nice. Living that long does that. Anyway, interrupted Andromeda getting the conversation back on track. I think you have something, Harry. We really should get some press on this to help grease the wheels so to speak, but we should wait until we actually have a trial that way the claims have more merit. Otherwise, it is another conspiracy that belongs in the quibbler. Quibbler? asked Harry. Nothing really, half of it is the mad ramblings of a man with his head in the clouds while the other half is. Well, I hope it isn't true but they're conspiracies at best. Explained Ted with a shake of his head. So, is there anything I can do to help this case? Asked Harry. I don't like sitting around waiting to hear what happens. Unfortunately, there isn't all that much we can do, even Dumbledore has done all he can. Said Andromeda tiredly, while the headmaster has plenty of respect in the magical world as a whole his word isn't taken as law and his position as chief warlock doesn't give him as much power as most think. At most he can recommend things to people like Amelia to acknowledge this case, which she has, so we've sadly done all we can at this point. Doesn't help that Black's case is going to be looked at by everyone and people in high positions tend to avoid cases like this so that the outcome doesn't affect their reputation in a negative way. The right and wrong of the matter get lost in the politics, at the end of the day it doesn't matter to people like Amelia if Sirius is innocent or not, but if it can be proven and if she can take credit for it. She will want to go for the minister position I'm sure and won't want this hanging over her head. Politicians, even those with good intentions, are still in it for themselves said ted tiredly sounds exhausting groaned harry while rubbing his forehead remind me to stay out of politics will do chuckled ted i suppose this was everything for the case nodded andromeda but we wanted to thank you personally for acknowledging us back into the family ted nodded next to her it has really helped us dora is in the Auror academy and it isn't cheap to get all the gear and her family background helped grease the wheels for acceptance Harry smiled with a nod, of course, she helped me too with some tutoring last year so I'm glad that I ended up helping her out with something. We just wanted to thank you again, Harry, said Andromeda. The two tonks left the table to go about the rest of their business in the alley. Harry sat silently for a moment in thought, it may be time to put his newfound friend's familial standing to work. Reaching into his bag he got to writing, Dear Blaze. Privet Drive 5. July 1992 Late into the night where Wednesday became Thursday Harry was busy working on his summer homework when Hedwig came through his window and landed on his bed passed with a letter. Blaze had written back. Harry, it's good to hear from you, I was wondering if you were going to write. I have spoken with my mother about it and she agreed to you coming for a day later in July when we return from Italy. Your birthday is at the end of July, right? I'm sure you remember that mine is in early August so maybe we can exchange gifts? I'll write when I have a date for us to meet, till then. Blaze Harry folded up the letter and put it into his bag, now he can go back to his interesting little project. Accidentally, purely on accident Harry had used magic earlier today, he was looking for something in his room and sure enough the object flew toward him and hit him right in his head. That got him thinking, sure it was accidental, but it was still magic, and he still used the summoning charm to find his potions textbook. From what he learned from Tracy before first year ended. If you used magic outside of school then within the hour the ministry would send a letter giving your first and only warning. That was four hours ago. Harry had then been pushing his luck with his magic by using it more and more. Something that should be noted in his discovery was that his wand hadn't left his trunk. Granted his spell use was of basic spells such as the levitation charm but it was nice to use magic after weeks of just thinking about. Wandless magic something that was thought of different in every magical community. Europe have been utilizing wands for nearly 2,000 years. While places like Africa and Asia have been using them for less than 200 years and don't even consider wands strictly necessary. In Europe wandless magic was considered very difficult, 
In a way it was since witches and wizards never consciously use their magic without a wand making it harder to feel their magic without the focus of a wand. Africa and Asia begin teaching their children to feel their magic from a young age, even before getting wands making both aspects of magic easier in the long run. The nearly two millennia of using wands for magic and never giving wandless magic real thought made the government not think to put the trace on all magic. Apparently, if Harry was guessing right, all wands were made so that anyone under the age of 17 would alert the ministry. Harry raised his arm and the pencil in front of him rose along with it, he was barely in control with his magic, but this gave him something to practice over the summers. Until he mastered using the levitation charm, he wouldn't try any other magical branches such as transfiguration or defense. The pencil in front of him fell from the air as he lost control of the spell making him sigh. He had a long way to go. Privet Drive 19, July 1992 Boy, we won't be back till late. This house better stay the way it is shouted Vernon from downstairs preparing to leave with Petunia and Dudley already in the car. Harry rolled his eyes from his room, what did they think he was going to do? He was planning on leaving for the day as well. From what he heard from Daphne, his most frequent correspondent via letters, their Hogwarts letters were coming with their list for supplies. Harry didn't really need a reason to want to go to Diagon Alley, but he was going to meet up with Daphne after lunch, she was helping out at her parents' shop for the summer so he'd meet her there and go shopping in the alley. She made several hints of wanting to meet up during the summer in her letters and Harry was running out of excuses. He used the sick aunt or uncle excuse nearly four times, she must think that his relatives were terminally ill. Last night he had finally finished all his summer homework, the project for potions was quite taxing and nearly made Harry start brewing to get a better idea of the potion that the textbook was referring to. Transfiguration was just McGonagall asking for in-depth theoretical equations around organic to inorganic transfiguration that they would be doing in class for second year. About an hour later an owl swooped through the open window in his room and dropped a letter on his desk. Thanks, said Harry to the owl but the small brown owl hooted at him and extended its leg toward him. Realizing what the bird wanted Harry rifled around in his trunk, I only have a galleon so. The owl chomped onto the gold coin and took off through the window. I better get the next dozen letters for free, shouted Harry at the retreating bird. Harry began tearing open the letter, he needed to get the standard book of spells, grade 2, and several books by a Gilderoy Lockhart who Harry was guessing was either the next defense professor or was the professor's idol. Harry hoped it was the former since he would doubt the competence of anyone who liked Gilderoy's books, having read one, Harry felt they were more fiction than non. Unfortunately, they were marked as mandatory so he would have to buy them not matter how much he didn't want to. But with the book list he decided to make his way to the alley, whipping out his wand when he walked down the driveway. A moment later a large triple-decker bus cracked into existence in front of him and the familiar face of Shunpike looked down at him in all his mouth-breathing glory, Harry tossed him a galleon and took a seat silently. Diagon Alley, no matter when Harry came was always the same, packed with witches and wizards all doing their shopping. Daphne told him in a letter that their shop was on the northern end of the alley next to a second-hand shop. Harry started heading that way to get Daphne so they can get started, he only really needed the books and he wanted to make a stop by the pet store that he bought Hedwig. Greengrass Apothecary, a dark green shop with a large glass window allowing customers to see some of their items before entering the shop. The bell above the door rang as he entered which caused his blonde housemaid to perk up from behind the counter. Potter. Daphne cried happily with a wave. Mom I'm going shopping with Harry I'll be back later. Harry heard an okay from the back parts of the shop before Daphne dragged him out of the shop and back out into the alley. So where do you want to go first? Asked Harry once they were out walking down the crowded alley. Daphne tilted her head in thought, I've been wanting to buy a new coat for winter, last year at school I wasn't ready with the one I brought. She shivered slightly at the thought. Meanwhile, last winter Harry spent 90% of his time practicing magic in his private room. He may as well get a new coat since he was sure that he was getting a bit too big for his current one. To Timothy's tailor shop, they have the best stuff, declared Harry, it was also of higher quality than Madame Malkin's, where everyone shops it and he didn't want to be the same as everyone else. Daphne looked at him with a curious expression, is that where you get your clothes? Yeah. High quality clothes and different than everyone else since everyone goes to Malkin's, he said as they neared the tailor shop. 
Walking into the shop an older man with a suit was reading the Daily Prophet, he noticed them and folded the paper up. Welcome, how may I help the two of you? Daphne ran her fingers over the fabrics, I will be needing a heavy winter coat. I need a coat as well and some new shirts, said Harry realizing that he may as well get the clothes he needed for school anyway. After getting clothes and the schoolbooks on their lists, Harry and Daphne went to get some food. So how has your summer been going? Been thinking about how you're going to spend this year? Asked Daphne. Harry mentally sighed, this was likely what Daphne had been dying to ask all day. Lucky for her he had been thinking about it, nothing crazy like how he was going to manipulate his way to the top of the world. He was only thinking about the kind of people he needed to get close to in order to help the cause of getting serious a trial. Malfoy would be a big help and the Hufflepuff girl, Susan, who was related to Amelia Bones was another. In Slytherin he wanted to extend his reach to Draco, from Draco his three lackeys would likely follow but Harry didn't want to be around them, so it was more of a tact on plus rather than a bonus. Theodore was a problem in that he had openly come out as his enemy and a young Death Eater meaning that he was going to have to watch him to find out how much danger he was actually in in his house. Keep my position as leader, be a bit more open to Draco and keep as many eyes on Theodore as I can. A few others but that is the Slytherin side of it. Daphne nodded, I've been thinking about Draco myself. He is a big-headed ponce but is a good person to know, he isn't shy with his money or family's power. Tracy is actually friends with Pansy so we already know someone in his circle. Outwardly Harry nodded along with her words, but his mind focused more on one of the words she used. We, such a simple word, thought Harry. Daphne may not have noticed it, but she seemed to subconsciously acknowledge that she was a full member of his group. Harry didn't even seriously consider this a group yet and he always thought of it as an I and the others rather than we. Daphne was a very serious and committed person when she fully committed to something it would seem. Blaze was the same and he was sure that Tracy was too. As strange as it was, as the so-called leader of this group he was the least committed, he would do better. Good, it will help us in the long run if more than one of us is attached to his group. Nodded Harry making sure to refer to them as a unified group like she did. Daphne nodded and smiled, good, other than that we need to keep up our studies. Other than our family names our class standing is a large factor in our standing in Slytherin. I would like for all of us to be in the top 10 for the year. A tall order, there are some brilliant witches and wizards in our year. But if we work together it shouldn't be too hard. Harry finished his food, I have one more place to go, I want to ask the man who sold me Hedwig a few questions. I need to get some food for Stella, Daphne said as she followed him to the animal shop. Harry just nodded and made his way to the shop that sold him Hedwig. He had been curious since he learned that she was an ivory owl rather than an owl, even more so when she matured into a lunistia. Where did the owner come across Hedwig? How did Hedwig come into his ownership? The owner of the animal shop looked at him in shock after he voiced these questions. What do you mean she was an ivory owl? He shouted with wide eyes, I remember selling her to you, she was just a rare snow owl. Harry blinked a few times with Daphne next to him staring at the owner with a raised eyebrow. No, she matured into a lunistia in the winter, I was wondering where you found her. The owner sat down and rubbed his forehead, I could have gotten thousands for her and I sold her to you for six galleons. He looked at Harry with a downtrodden expression, I bought her off an owl breeder, he said that she just showed up one day and never left. He was the one that told me that she was a rare snow owl breed. Harry sighed, I don't see how an owl breeder confused an ivory owl for a snow owl. He wanted to know if perhaps Hedwig had family out there, so he wanted to find out where she was from, but this was turning into a bust. The owner snorted, clearly you don't know much about owls, especially ones from magical breeders, Mr. Potter. The shop owner gestured to the owl section of the shop with a wide variety of birds sitting atop perches. A snow owl that had black spots and another with golden tipped wings, eagle owls that had more protruding beaks and sharper features. Owls come in all shapes and sizes, that bird of yours I remember quite well, she never took to anyone and she was just as social as the others, meaning that she just watched the customers rather than fly over to them like the other birds we have. So, it was just happenstance that Hedwig and I crossed paths, said Harry. Daphne tilted her head in thought, if we're using Hedwig as a base, I think it would be safe to assume that you might have sold many rare beasts without realizing it. Image a phoenix or a dragon egg being mistakenly sold as something else. 
Dragon eggs were notorious for only having one distinguishing feature from any other reptile egg the heat they naturally give off. While young phoenixes don't have many of their magical attributes until after their first burning day meaning they were just rare, beautiful birds until their rebirth as true phoenixes. The owner looked up in horror before whipping his head back and forth around the shop. I have to inspect every beast I own at the moment. I'll never lose out on a serious payday again. Not the best reasons, thought Harry before shrugging. Leaving the shop Harry let out another sigh of annoyance. He received a pat on the back from Daphne, it's alright, Hedwig's pretty smart so if she wanted to return somewhere, I'm sure she would have. Yeah, I know but I'm really curious about where Ivoryaum and Lunistia inhabit. Dragons and phoenixes are easier to locate since their preferred habitats are documented. Then we'll make it a project to find out more about her when we get back to school, Daphne said reassuringly. You're right, nodded Harry, I think I'm going to head back home. Daphne gave him a quick hug before turning back toward her family's shop. Harry looked at the animal shop one more time before rolling his eyes and heading toward the nearest exit of the alley. He beat his relatives back home, big advantage to the night bus was its incredible speed, so he made his way up to his room so he could get back to looking into his alchemy prep work. Getting to the door to his room he heard shuffling and narrowed his eyes, despite not being able to use his wand he was getting a bit better at wandless magic, so he focused his magic before bursting into his room ready to take down anything. He didn't expect a small three foot tall creature with long pointed ears, leathery skin and a dirty rag for clothes jumping up and down on his bed. Large green eyes stared at him with wonder and awe, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. The squeaky voice of the creature occupying his bed sounded out. Moving forward Harry narrowed his eyes at the creature, you're a house elf, correct? The question seemed to have upset the would-be elf as it began tearing up. Oh yes, yes indeed, it said graciously, Dobby is a house elf, he is most honored that Mr. Harry Potter knew that, most pleased. Harry blinked a few times at the elf in confusion still not knowing why Dobby was here, unfortunately the elf continued to prattle on. We've heard of your greatness but never has Dobby been treated so kindly. Why are you here, Dobby? asked Harry flatly, beginning to get impatient with the elf. Dobby hung his head and whimpered, it's tough for Dobby to say, sir. Dobby doesn't know where to begin. Start at the beginning, said Harry with a flat tone. Dobby shook his head and without a warning launched himself at the desk and began to bang his head into the leg of the desk. Bad Dobby. Bad Dobby. Harry was ashamed to admit that he watched in shock as the house elf hurt itself before coming to his senses to separate the elf from the desk. What are you doing Dobby? growled Harry, making sure to push Dobby back after he tried to cross the room to resume his self-harm. Hedwig flapped her wings and cawed angrily at them for disturbing her nap. Dobby had to punish himself for wasting Sir's time, said Dobby looking woozy from the head injury. Harry blinked and tried to come to terms with the ridiculousness of this conversation, taking a breath he continued on. Please Dobby, why are you here? Dobby shivered and plopped down off the bed, terrible things are going to happen, sir. Masters have been very, very angry. Dobby's masters have been getting rid of many things and Dobby worries about the safety of Hogwarts because of his master's scheming and terrible plot. Harry sat in his chair, can you tell me who your masters are? Dobby frantically shook his head negatively. Dobby can't, sir. Harry Potter must be careful at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, Dobby's masters plots terrible things. I'll keep a lookout, I promise, Harry said honestly, after the fiasco with the stone he was always going to be on alert when things seemed strange. You will be unsafe this year. Master's plot will be terrible to any and everyone at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Whimpered Dobby, Dobby doesn't want Mr. Harry Potter to attend this year, it is too unsafe. Harry closed his eyes and sighed tiredly, I can't do that Dobby, but I can promise that I will look after myself this year. Thank you for the concern Dobby, I really appreciate it, but I can take care of myself. Again, Dobby shook his head. Dobby apologizes, sir but Mr. Harry Potter doesn't understand. Dobby pulled on his ears painfully. Dobby's master, is, Hogwarts isn't safe. Harry realized that Dobby wasn't telling him because he wanted to but because he physically couldn't. House elves must be magically forced to obey their master's commands no matter what they were, so if his master told him that he could speak of the details of the plot, Dobby literally couldn't. 
You can't tell me what your master is planning or who they are. Said Harry getting a frantic nod from the elf. Now whatever is happening is going to make Hogwarts unsafe, but there are things at the school that can protect everyone. Dobby looked up at him but and Harry continued before he could talk. Hogwarts has over a hundred house elves all working for the castle to help the school operate and most importantly is Dumbledore. He is more than capable of protecting the school from an angry I can only guess Death Eater. Dobby nodded but still looked worried. Harry withheld a smirk, Dobby was a genuine creature, so he didn't realize that he had given Harry an important piece of information. There weren't, despite many's belief, many Death Eater parents that have children in Hogwarts. Meaning that Harry had a much smaller suspect list. I promise that I will go to the headmaster with what you told me and make sure that he knows what you told me. And Harry was telling the truth about that, he had no interest in being the person that jumped into action without thinking again, he learned his lesson last year. Boy, we're back, came the familiar roar of his uncle and the heavy stomps of the two elephants re entering the house. Okay, Dobby, you need to leave now, Harry said with a sigh, less worried about his relatives seeing him and more about the headache of them screaming at Heim after the sea Dobby. Dobby must hurry back to his master. Please be careful Harry Potter sir, with a pop the elf was gone. Harry rubbed his forehead while stewing over what Dobby told him. First was that Dobby had an angry Death Eater master. That couldn't be fun but that was the least worrisome at the moment. There was a plot to do something to or at Hogwarts by a disgruntled Death Eater. Harry had no idea what the Death Eater would think to do but he could narrow down a few possibilities outcomes. First was that pure bloods would be safe so muggle-borns and likely half-bloods would be targeted. Then there was the possibility that Dumbledore was the target, Dumbledore was Voldemort's greatest enemy and the only person the man ever feared, or Harry himself seeing as how he was credited with the man's downfall. So it also could be himself that was being targeted by the Death Eater. So for the next year, added on to the fact that he was going to try and make a bigger name for himself in Slytherin, he was going to have to keep an eye or two over his shoulder. Great. Privet Drive 28. July 1992 Harry, mother has agreed to you coming and staying with us in our villa for the next couple of days. We will be getting my school books this afternoon so meet us in Diagon Alley to come back with us after. All of the arrangements have been taken care of so you just need to come back with us. It's really warm in Rome so pack for the sun. Mother wished to tell you that she is very much looking forward to meet you. Blaze. Harry grinned down at the letter and wrote a quick note then handed it to the majestic white and black falcon who bid down on the paper before soaring off out of his window. He and Blaze had agreed to spend their birthdays together since they were so close, his being July 31st and Blaze's August 2nd. He owed the Zabinis for getting him a copy of Magics of the Mind for Christmas, even if he later got a better version from the Black Vault it was still a great and thoughtful gift. In exchange he got Blaze's birthday gift a few weeks ago in preparation. In his weeks of looking onto the noteworthy families in Hogwarts and Magical Britain as a whole he also looked into Blaze's family. The Zabinis weren't famous for many things, mostly their wealth and long line of pureblood witches and wizards, Blaze being the latest in a long line of Italian magicals. Harry discovered that Blaze's ancestor was a powerful war mage in the war against the Dark Lord Baldric during the 1700s. Alongside his wand Blaze's ancestor wielded a rapier not jewel encrusted or even made of precious magical metals. A simple and well forged rapier and Harry bought the closest thing he could find then had the Zabini crest engraved on the hilt. The Zabini crest was a swooping falcon similar to the one that brought him a message, it wasn't rare or even an expensive gift compared to the book he was gifted at Christmas but hopefully in this instant thought mattered more than expense, he had a hundred year old red wine in his trunk in case Blaze's mother looked unimpressed. Harry packed his belongings, put his wand into his pants pocket and pulled his trunk behind him being careful to make as much noise as possible as it rolled down the stairs. Boy! Stop with that infernal noise, roared his uncle from the den. His long-necked aunt peeked around the hallway to see what he was doing and sneered at him. Harry gave her a smile and approached the kitchen to address his family, he thought of a wonderful way to mess with them. Hello, Aunt Petunia. He greeted her amicably make her nose scrunch in distaste. I think your cooking smells fine Aunt Petunia, he said after seeing the face she made. He turned towards his uncle and cousin but he could feel her contempt and glare being directed at the back of his head. It gave him a warm feeling in his stomach to know that she was upset. Cousin, uncle. He nodded to both of them. 
Dudley glared at him and looked like he was going to start yelling while his uncle, somehow the smarter of the three here narrowed his eyes into slits but had no further reaction. Harry had to push past the resentment and hatred he felt towards his uncle to accept that Vernon was a vice president of a large corporation and didn't climb that high without instincts. He just hated that for all the man's smarts he was such an asshole, he could have learned a lot from him if he weren't. I will be leaving for a few days to spend time with a friend of mine in their villa for my birthday. He made sure to mention that it was a villa, the looks of jealousy on his cousin's face was so delicious it spurned him on further. Unfortunately I will be missing the plans you all made for me, I came to apologize and hope that next year we can spend more time together on my birthday. We didn't make plans for you, screamed Dudley his fire red face showing that he had reached his limit. Harry smiled once again showing no reaction to his cousin's words, oh you don't have to keep it a secret Dudley, I'm just sorry I'm missing it. Aunt Petunia, Uncle Vernon I will be back on August 4th. Vernon, in a rare show of restraint didn't let a muscle twitch and Harry pushed down the annoyance at the lack of reaction but it didn't matter, his aunt and cousin more than made up for it. Since the word villa came out of his mouth his aunt looked as if she had been poisoned with envy. Two out of three was fine, so Harry gave everyone a smile and left the house to make his way to Diagon Alley to meet with Blaze. Diagon Alley 28 July 1992 Diagon Alley was even more packed than usual as many families were doing their Hogwarts shopping, Flourish and Blotts was overcrowded with all the people who needed to buy all the Lockhart books. Instead of going to a shop or looking for Blaze, Harry just sat at a table at Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor and chowed down on a wonderful ice cream Sunday brunch while waited for Blaze. Pulling out Adrian's adventure guide, Harry began Chapter 6, Wards. Harry's knowledge of wards went as far as to know that they were like area defensive magic. There were wards that allowed the one keyed into them to know exactly who was in the area within the wards, others gave the user knowledge of the intent of those who entered. Warding, like other magics, could go as far as the caster's intent and knowledge allowed. Adrian, the author and renowned adventurer of the late 1800s had been a student of a master warder out of Asia and incorporated many wards during his globe-trotting journeys some to defend his campsite and he used his expertise in wards to break wards around places he explored. The first ward in the book was a defensive area ward, Sint Vera Quidum Moneo, a spell that alerted the caster of anyone that entered the area that the spell encompassed. It was one of the simpler wards that Harry had seen only requiring a 15 runic circle and 6 wand movements. In the adventure guide, Adrian altered the runic formula to be able to notify him if anyone entered the ward with negative intentions, Harry would look over the altered formula but he still needed to get a firm grasp over runes before trying anything. Speaking of runes, he had already began reading the textbook and supplementary reading material, he was nearly a third of the way through the first year of ancient runes, unfortunately it wasn't until the second half of the first year did they get around to drawing a basic runic formula. His summer had taken a turn away from alchemy, he was still reading ahead in his textbooks. Done with his third year in Transfiguration, Charms, Defense and Potions and he was moving into Arithmancy and Runes. He planned to look into the subjects that were the foundations to alchemy but he couldn't find any magical books about the subject. As bored as he was this summer he didn't want to plow through textbooks without knowing if they were necessary or not. So with his hours of boredom he read ahead in his course books and practiced wandless magic, but other than levitating and summoning things in his sightline, which was an improvement to a few weeks ago although nine years olds in Africa were capable of that so it wasn't anything to write home about, so he hadn't made too much progress in wandless magic. He was getting better at feeling his magic without his wand as a focus so at least the hard part was over. I swear, Ravenclaw would have been a better fit for you, Potter Harry could hear the smirk in his friend's voice. Blaze, in his extremely high-end clothing was smirking at him with a bag from Flourish and Blots. The month away from Hogwarts hadn't changed Blaze much, he was still a bit taller than him and had the same laid-back stance that he always did. Next to Blaze was, in Harry's honest opinion, the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. She was a tall woman closing in on six feet with her heels. Glossy black hair framed her face with chocolate brown eyes that looked through him, they held both interest and amusement. She had high cheekbones and sharp features showing her aristocratic bloodline. Her clothes, Harry was sure, cost more than most families spent on vacations. This is my mother, Katerina Zabini, said Blaze formally introducing his infamous mother to him. Harry, remembering all the rules about etiquette, 
stood and gently took her hand then just barely touched his lips to the back of her hand and let it go. A pleasure, Lady Zabini, he said as calmly as he could trying to make it seem like this wasn't the first time he did that. Her lips twitched, if I hadn't been one of the people to help you with your lordly etiquette, I would have been quite impressed with your natural instinct to our customs. She said with a melodic voice that got his barely, yet active, hormones to start going into overdrive. Ah, right, he had forgotten that she was the one to help him with his etiquette. We have a port key scheduled for noon, so we must make our way to an acceptable jumping off point, she said tapping Blaze and gesturing for him to follow. Grabbing his trunk he threw a couple sickles on the table and followed after the Zabinis. Villa del Zabini 28. July 1992 Rolling hills without another house in sight, a large pool and manicured lawn with a family of horses running through the fields. The villa, if it could be called anything other than a castle was only two stories high but stretched to cover an enormous amount of the hilltop. Pick up your jaw, Potter. Laughed Blaze. Your family held homes like this before they were liquidated during the Grindelwald War. A noble family the Potters, I've met a couple in my younger years. Katerina added lightly, she snapped her fingers and a tray with wines appeared on the counter next to them at the entrance of the villa. Blaze, show Harry his room, dinner is at eight, she said before gliding away towards another room. Harry wondered what the women would do in the seven hours between now and then, it was a large house there had to be something. Come on Harry, you're too pale let's get to the pool. So what have you been doing this summer? asked Harry laying back in the chair feeling the sun in a completely different manner than ever before. Blaze shrugged, got the school work for the summer out of the way the first week then spent the rest of the time relaxing and traveling with mother. She doesn't like to stay in the same place for too long. I exchanged a few letters with Daphne and Tracy as well, apparently they were spending some time together too. You heard anything from anyone outside of our group? Harry shook his head, not really. I didn't get close to anyone outside of the group really. I heard from a second year that the ministry is coming down on old families, apparently there have been raids for dark artifacts. A lot of families are scrambling to get rid of anything they don't want seen. Arthur Weasley is the proponent of the movement if you can believe it. Really, Harry said sitting up in his lounge chair, has anyone been taken down from this? Mother said that the Malfoys were scrambling a few weeks ago since news broke about the raids, she couldn't keep the smile off of her face for a few days, said Blaze with an amused smirk. Harry smirked as well, here's hoping they get caught with something. Have you been working on anything? asked Blaze. Nothing really, shrugged Harry, I've been going through the course books and practicing wandless magic. He reached out and pulled an orange off a nearby table, it flew off the table and right into his awaying hand. Blaze looked at him with raised eyebrows, not bad, I never thought to try wandless before. My father was quite skilled without a wand, or so I was told. Harry's eyes cut over to Blaze without making it obvious, or tried to, Blaze rolled his eyes at the look. He died when I was young, mother said it was from the dragon he was trying to tame. Harry blinked a few times and tried to think about what that could have meant, surely Blaze's dad didn't die try to actually tame a dragon? They were notorious for their inability to be trained or tamed by anyone without a literal gift for interacting with the beasts. Newt Scamander, renowned as the greatest magical zoologist in recent history could only work with dragons in his younger years, but he never managed to befriend one. The man had a Noondu as a pet, so he was familiar with dangerous XXXXX beasts with tempers. Blaze took sip from his water, he wasn't the brightest man in the world, I'll admit. But he did what he wanted when he wanted, mother loves to tell me about him. He was an Auror in Rome but loved to take time to explore the world and grew to love Ukrainian iron bellies and wanted to work with them as often and he could. He would take trips to the Romanian Dragon Reserve to work with them, like I said mother told me, she thinks it was the dragon that did him in. Harry didn't know what to say, he never knew his parents and other than the nightmare of that night eleven years ago he never even really seen them outside of pictures. In that way he could sympathize with the loss of a parent. Wait, said Harry suddenly, what do you mean that she thinks that's what happened? Blaze sighed, the Romanians told us that the fire burned him away, there wasn't a body. Sorry, winced Harry, realizing how insensitive the question was. Not a big deal, the way I said it made it seem like he just left. Shrugged Blaze, I've made peace with it, I was three when he died. Harry leaned back in the chair and let out a breath, 
he was in the Italian countryside relaxing by a pool so he should only be thinking about how for the first time in his life he wasn't going to be a pasty Brit. Dinner with the Zabinis was an interesting affair, he was dressed in slacks, a dress shirt and a blazer. Blaze as usual was dressed well and Katerina, somehow, looked even more amazing in her evening wear. Tell me Harry, she spoke breaking the silence so suddenly Harry nearly flinched, are you interested in anything outside of Hogwarts? Harry sipped down his glass of wine making sure to keep a slight cringe off of his face, the Zabinis drank wine with dinner and offered Harry a glass out of politeness and despite never having alcohol before he accepted, he wasn't about to look like a wuss in front of his friend's beautiful mother, or his friend either. I'm interested in dueling, I've looked into tournaments, he tried to see if he could enter one this summer but he was still too young for the U-17 regional tournament, the minimum age was 13. If he won that tournament he would be eligible for the Euro U-17 which was the highest level he could duel at while still in school. Katerina sipped her wine and hummed pleasantly, a difficult but prestigious field, I've heard winners have more opportunities later in life, champion duelist looks very good on a resume. Harry is also on the Quidditch team, said Blaze getting a look from his mother, our chasers weren't looking great out there last season, Harry was the only reason we won the house cup. He was also the reason we almost lost it he added in an afterthought. I see, so that was why you wanted the Nimbus? Very well, you've always been a skilled flyer my love. Blaze smiled happily and leaned back in his chair, Harry hoped that if Blaze made the team he would lessen the pressure the team put him under next year. It was hard being the most important player, school Quidditch wasn't balanced with the snitch worth 150 points as the chasers weren't skilled enough to get the scores up quick enough. In the pros, during the first 10 minutes the score could break 100 points on both sides easily, the nearly impossible to catch snitch was just used to end a game. In Hogwarts it was pretty much an instant win if it was caught before an hour of play. Hopefully you can take Pusey off the team, he's the weakest link. Blaze tilted his head to the side, I was hoping to knock Flint off, the troll's biggest benefit is that he's big enough to toss around the other players. Harry narrowed his eyes at his pasta in thought, he'd need to do something that would get Snape mad enough that he'd forbid him from the team, Miles Bletchley would take over as captain if it went to the second most experienced member. Better than Flint, all we have to do is get him off of the team before tryouts. Blaze wasn't letting it go, Harry assumed it was more than just not liking the moron. Okay, that should be easy, shrugged Harry, he's pretty unsubtle in his attraction to seventh year girls. A pushy stupid idiot like him shouldn't be too hard to take care of. Do try not to plot the downfall of too many people at dinner boys. Tutted Katerina who looked more amused than upset. Villa del Zabini 31. July 1992 While today was his actual birthday, both he and Blaze agreed to celebrate both of their birthdays today and spend the next three days doing what they wanted with their remaining time in Rome. Katerina had planned for them to have a huge breakfast and then take them into Rome for shopping. The magical district was famous for their historic shops and Harry wanted to see a magical culture that was different from Britain. Harry put on his clothes and grabbed the box with Blaze's gift that he hoped went over well, then made his way down to the dining room. He still had the wine wrapped and ready in his trunk, just in case. The breakfast spread he was met with would make every Hogwarts student envious, while it was portioned for three people the quality and presentation was incredible. Golden eating utensils fine china and the food was set in an intricate layout that was as impressive as it was unnecessary. A useless frivolity that only the wealthy bothered to partake in, but it looked nice so Harry didn't comment. Fruits and vegetables, eggs and meats, a variety of juices all prepared by the two house elves on the property. He reached into the swan made of eggs and started piling food onto his likely ancient and priceless plate. Katerina was already eating while Blaze was walking down with a box of his own. They exchanged a nod and gave each other the gifts. Blaze managed to tear through the box faster than Harry expected and was examining the rapier with an experienced eye. Harry expected a polite thank you or a blank look showing no actually interest in the gift, but this was a pleasant surprise, he felt happy knowing that he wouldn't have to part with the 70 galleon wine he bought as a backup. It's high quality, good steel and even has my family's crest, said Blaze waving it around with practiced ease. You've used a sword before? asked Harry while watching the movements. Blaze nodded and set down the sword, I've had fencing lessons since I was eight, it's pretty fun and helps learn proper movement and footwork for dueling. If you didn't know why did you get it? 
Well one of you ancestors used one and he was a famous war mage, I couldn't think of anything else to get you. I doubt I can do the same thing for you that I do for Daphne and Tracy, I just got them some jewelry. Answered Harry with a shrug, glad you like it though, I tried to make it as close to the one in the picture as I could. Antony Zabini, Katerina said happily, he was the pride of the family, one of the strongest wizards in Italian history and a fierce duelist with or without a wand. Now open your gift Harry. Opening the box he was met with a book. Battle magic's no author likely meaning that it was made up of several witches and wizards knowledge. Harry smiled as he ran his hands over the hard cover and set it down on the table. Thank you, he said to Blaze and then sent a grateful look to Katerina, I really appreciate it. Blaze nodded to him as he ate, while Katerina set down her golden utensils. Of course Harry, I didn't want to get you something you had or didn't want so I looked into our library for something that would pertain to your interests. That isn't as rare or coveted as your Christmas present but it is a must read for any aspiring duelist. I really appreciate it. Repeated Harry while resisting the urge to look through the book as he ate. Via del Corso 28. July 1992 The entrance to the Roman Magical District or Galleria de Magia, was off of Via del Corso which was one of the busiest areas in all of Rome, home to many shops, restaurants, palaces and several monuments. While Harry had eyed many of the muggle shops that looked interesting, he decided that he would have to visit another time because his excitement for the magical shops was too much to put off. Much like in London, the entrance to the Galleria was in an alley but unlike in London there weren't any bricks to move or a pub to walk through. Instead, they walked through the alley and through the far wall much like at Platform 9 and 3 quarters. The Galleria de Magia was unlike anything Harry had ever seen. A wide courtyard with several shops lining the walls with booths and hundreds of witches and wizards browsing or haggling with shop owners. While this place was likely older than Diagon Alley, it seemed better kept and nicer. The floor was high class tiles that were shiny in the sunlight, and the shops weren't crooked and creaky wooden buildings but more modern outlet mall style. Harry could spot the culture differences in clothing alone compared to Britain. In Rome, witches and wizards clearly dressed with a more modern look, while some still had robes, it was far less common, far different than the way pure bloods in Britain dressed. Coats and jackets were as far as the similarities between magical and muggle went. Above the ground level was mezzanine that had a wide variety of restaurants and cafes. The handrails off the mezzanine looked to be hand-carved marble with a glossy shine to it. Walking more into the Galleria Harry spotted that at the epicenter of the shopping center was a huge hand-carved statue of a heavily bearded wizard. Not Dumbledore but more Zeus in appearance, large muscles and a sword sheathed at his side with a book in his right hand. That's Basari the Wall, said Blaze as he stood next to him while looking at the large statue. He was alive in the 1400s, a dark time for Italy as several dark factions had rose and conquered the surrounding countries. Refugees fled here and he was single-handedly responsible for not only keeping Rome and Italy as a whole unconquered, but managed to kill several dark lords that tried to conquer Italy. Harry snapped his head to Blaze, I don't remember his name in history class, you'd think he'd be mentioned if he was such a prominent figure. He was against the pure blood agenda wanted equality between all witches and wizards much like Dumbledore, but he was more successful than Dumbledore in the end and he lived 500 years ago when people were even more uptight. Explained Blaze while gesturing to the witches and wizards all walking around the Galleria with happy expressions. Wealth is the only thing that separates people in Italy, most long-standing families have accumulated a fair amount of wealth while muggle-borns have to start fresh in the magical world. Harry looked back up to the statue of Vasari with more respect, to accomplish something so substantial in dark times like that was incredible. He made a mental note to look into the full history of Vasari to learn more about the man. Looking at the book in the statue's hand more closely he noticed a symbol, do you know what the symbol on his book means? He asked. The symbol looked like a triangle with jagged gaps from the top down the center bisecting it and halfway down each side to the center of the bottom. Blaze shrugged, not sure maybe something the sculpture put as a signature. Incorrect, my love, said Katerina as she stepped up next to them, that is the symbol of the War Mages, a guild that operates throughout the world at the behest of the ICW when incidents get too out of hand for the local government to handle. I've never heard of guilds, said Harry, he spent most of last year learning what he could about the magical world but it seemed he missed a lot of important things. Many branches of magic have a guild, some are more prestigious and exclusive than others, such as alchemy, potions and transfiguration. 
To be recognized on a global scale as a master of a branch then recognition from the corresponding guild is necessary. Katerina explained to both boys who looked at her with rapt attention. But enough of that, no school during the summer or on vacation, Katerina said with a wave of her hand, let's browse and see if we can find anything worth buying. Harry and the Zabinis browsed through the Galleria for several hours, ate at one of the finest restaurants in the city. Harry had seen several interesting items for sale, potions kits that had ingredients that he'd never even heard of, magical animals local only to the country, and trinkets old or new being peddled by shop owners. Unfortunately, Harry didn't find anything that he wanted to buy, he already had plenty of things in his vaults that he hadn't even looked through and didn't have a materialistic personality so pretty trinkets weren't of interest to him. Blaze and Katerina on the other hand were very interested as both walked away with several bags of clothes and accessories. Villa del Zabini 28. July 1992 Harry was sat at the desk in his temporary room at the villa absently stroking Hedwig's feathers while flipping through the pages of his newest book, Battle Magics. His birthday went quite well, learning about the culture in Rome and exploring the magical community with Blaze and Katerina. He was still unsure as to what Katerina wanted with him, from her reputation he would have thought that she would be like a viper poised to strike but she seemed to be a very calm and mellow person. While he didn't know her angle, he learned his lesson last year and wouldn't take anything at face value. Someone as notorious as Katerina would have mastered the art of manipulation and long cons, so he wouldn't drop his guard after only a few nice days and a couple gifts few gifts. He was taken out of his thoughts when Hedwig perked up and flew up to her perch to get a better angel to glare out the window of his room. Harry stood to look out the window where he saw a streak of silver approaching his window at moderate speeds. As it got closer Harry could make out the shape of the approaching object a bit better. It was a large bird made entirely of silver, it could have been conjured or transfigured but that wouldn't account for the speed at which it traveled. The bird landed outside of his window and stared at him trying to tell him something. Shrugging to himself Harry opened the door to allow the silver bird into his room. The bird didn't make any sounds other than the clinks of metal on his desk. A runic circle unlike any he'd ever seen appeared on the center of the bird's chest and began to glow several colors, after a few moments the bird started to morph and change until it was an envelope on his desk. Harry blinked a few times trying to understand what he just saw. A silver bird flew into his room and transfigured itself into a letter with his name written on the front in the most elegant cursive he'd ever seen. He took out his wand, and thanks to being outside of Britain and away from underage magic laws, he was able to send a test probe of magic at the envelope hoping to set off whatever curse the letter had attached to it. Seeing no reaction Harry picked up the letter, thankfully nothing happened after touching it so he opened it. Dear Mr. Potter, let me begin this letter by offering my sincerest thanks to your efforts earlier this year in your attempt to protect my stone. If you haven't guessed it yet, my name is Nicholas Flamel, long-time wizard and friend to your headmaster, young Albus. Yes, I do refer to him as young to me, everyone is. He told me the tale of you heroics, braving the traps to protect my stone from that foolish Voldemort. Also, of your many aspirations as a young and talented wizard, I find myself both curious and interested in you Mr. Potter. And not just because of your famous exploit eleven years ago either. You have shown an interest into alchemy, and at the risk of sounding too arrogant, I myself am quite skilled in the art among many others. I should tell you that what you witnessed a few moments ago with your letter's arrival was accomplished with every aspect that goes into alchemy. I first wrote this letter, then will transmute it into silver, engraved a delayed runic circle that would transfigure the bird back into the letter after it comes into contact with another's magical presence. For a novice, yes my dear boy you are in fact a novice, in transfiguration, runes and arithmancy, you would no doubt not understand the process. So I will refrain from just handing you a tome of alchemic knowledge, even at a beginning level. But, I will offer you this, I open my ears to you, I will alter my many wards and keep my eyes peeled for your beautiful bird on the horizon. Any questions you might have, regarding anything, I will give my utmost ability to answer. This is, unfortunately, not an offer of apprenticeship, nor a gateway to such. Young Albus was my last, but I will humbly accept the role as pen pal to the famous Harry Potter. A very happy birthday to you as well. Nicholas Harry set down the note with a shocked expression, before reading through the letter once more. Yup, he thought, that was a letter from Nicholas Flamel offering to be his pen pal and to assist him with questions regarding magic. The sheer thought of having the ears to one of the greatest minds in history, 
someone who was alive from a lot of it, was so amazing that he began to write his response. He started off by expressing how thankful he was for the letter and written friendship. Then he asked how he should continue his subject learning to prepare for alchemy, such as recommended topics or book. Then he got slightly off topic and with thoughts of his time in Rome today asked what Nicholas knew about Vasari the Wall. Blaze made him seem quite important in history and Nicholas should have been alive around that time to know what actually happened. He was about to fill a second page with questions but decided to keep it to a single page for his first letter to Nicholas, he didn't want to seem too eager. With his trip to Rome and prolonged time away from his relatives and amazing gifts, this was the best birthday he's ever had. Thanks for watching see you soon with last part till then bye bye.